Just the Maid, by Chelsea Hale. Chapter 1. Cindy. I love the view of the ocean at night, when the sun dips below the horizon and streaks of color explode across the sky. And from my vantage point on the eleventh floor of my building I can see the pier lit up, and its reflection dancing on the darkening water. Okay. It's not my building per se. Just the one I clean. But now that I secured the job for the new company that just moved into this building, I have three more floors to clean. Not only does that consolidate my schedule from building hopping, it also means I have this view for five nights a week now, instead of two. And the view from floors 9 through 11 are far superior to the third floor. I stay at the window a little longer until the sky and the ocean blend together in a deep indigo, a ritual I've held any time I have a view of the ocean at sunset. I take a few deep breaths. Miss you, Dad, I whisper, and with a final glance at the darkening world outside, I turn my back on the glass and start the vacuum. The low humming sets my stage as I pop in my AirPods. All the noise instantly fades around me, even the vacuum. This is my favorite time of day. I'm alone with my music. I start my playlist, a selection of my favorite Broadway hits that I race against. When I first started cleaning office buildings in college, I learned quickly that a few hours of grunge work and scrubbing toilets goes faster when I'm dancing with a vacuum and singing my heart, out to office furniture and ficuses. And thankfully on a Friday night, no one is around to see me and my latest choreographed production I'm putting on for the inanimate objects. The vacuum doubles as my dance partner and my microphone as I create perfectly even lines along the industrial carpet in time, to the music. The romantic chorus swells as I dance around the vacuum, spinning myself toward it and then out again. I belt out the remaining lines of the song, full of emotion and fling my jazz hands into the air for dramatic effect. It's a performance worthy of a stage with actual people in the audience. If I could only get past the nerve-wracking fear of rejection during auditions. I take a bow, then hold my hands toward the vacuum for the rest of the praise and spin with the intent to continue vacuuming to the next song, for our encore. Instead my waving hands bump into something. Something that wasn't there only moments ago. I turn to see what I've run into and gasp. A tall man is gazing around at a pile of papers that I've just knocked out of his hands. They all come sailing to the floor, and I'm mortified. I'm so sorry, I stammer as I pop my headphones out of my ear and turn off the vacuum. I drop to my knees and help him gather up what looks like a whole ream of paper on the floor. I didn't know anyone else was here. I have this strict policy when I'm cleaning, I don't clean when other people are around. I like to be inconspicuous, and now I've blown it. The tight fit of his shirt shows off his defined arms as he begins stacking the papers haphazardly. Obviously, he says with eyes that are deep blue like the ocean. I'm sorry, I interrupted your performance. He says the last word with a hint of amusement in his voice. It was just a little vacuuming. I cough, pushing the papers together. I can feel the heat rising up my neck. I take in the pile of papers, trying to make sense of them. Is there an order to this? He scratches his chin, frowning at the paper in his hand. I try not to stare at his square jaw, or the way his dark hair falls across his forehead as he makes a neat stack. There was. I guess page numbers would have been a good idea. My eyes widen. There are no page numbers on all of these? I pick up the last paper, the corner of it bent. I try to straighten it out but it doesn't work. Now I feel even worse. I can help you sort them. Ugh. He smiles at me and our fingers brush against each other as he accepts the stack of paper I'm holding. My breath catches in my chest. Between the slight contact we've made and his smile, I'm nearly hoping he'll accept my offer. Except that I just made a fool of myself in front of him. Don't worry about it. You can just go back to dancing. He gives me a sly smile, one that threatens to make my knees go weak, except that I'm still feeling the embarrassment from the unintentional mishap. It's just vacuuming, I say. I will definitely not be dancing again on this floor. Sorry again for bumping into you. He waves his hand in the air. It's not a big deal. It might not be a big deal to him, but it's a big deal to me. This new contract represents a much-needed step for me. 
It's not my day job, but working at my dream company during the day still doesn't pay the bills. I definitely don't want to lose this job. It's so convenient to have all my cleaning jobs housed in the same building now. But one bad review, one employee telling his boss that the cleaning lady is a dance nut who makes bigger messes than she cleans up, could really ruin my situation. Plus, the view of the ocean is stunning from this floor. I don't want to lose that either. I follow him, resolve to leave a positive impression to erase the negative one. If there's anything I can do to make it up to you, just let me know. I'm happy to help you sort them or whatever you need. Thanks. He heads toward an office and puts the papers on a desk. I don't pay attention to him after that because my focus is all on how I can get out of here as fast as possible. Except I glance around corners first, just so I don't run into another wall of muscles. But no one else is here, and I thankfully, don't see him or run into him again. After a few more hallways of silence where I don't put on music or dance, I realize that this is not going to work. Normally I like to finish up at night, but today I'm making an exception. I can technically clean on Saturday mornings. It pushes back some of my plans, but as long as it's finished by open of business on Monday, I'll be fine. Cleaning without music is making my thoughts swirl around my literal run-in with Mr. Blue Eyes. He's definitely been the center of my thoughts since bumping into him. Not that it normally takes much focus to vacuum in straight lines down a hallway, but cleaning up a ream of paper is distracting. Not to mention the accompanying man I ran into. That smile, those eyes, those muscles. It's a triple threat combination. Without another thought, I wrap the vacuum cord up. Coming back in the morning will be a much better choice. I'll be back in my groove again when Blue Eyes is gone. I take the elevator down to the lower level and store my cleaning supplies in my cleaning closet. With a swipe of my key card, I head directly to the parking garage. I call my best friend Hannah on the way home. The call goes to voicemail, and I assume she's out on a date. Normally I just text her, but I can't do that while I'm driving. When her voicemail beeps, I start talking. Hey, Hannah. You'll never believe what just happened to me. It was kind of like that time when we were in college and we were having a party with the fraternity, and I thought the party started at 7, not 6. I ramble for a few more minutes, then hang up the call. Soon I'm home at my quaint apartment where I pretend that I can hear the waves at night, like I could when I was a kid. It's only my ocean app, but tonight I turn it up, hoping that it will drown out all my embarrassment about running into blue eyes tonight. It does not. And the memory of his eyes keeps me awake for much longer than I want to admit. Chapter 2 Alex The faint sound of a vacuum lulls me from my sleep. I smile as the gentle whirring noise brings me back to last night. I rub my eyes as I pull myself off the couch in my office. Crashing at the office was bound to happen eventually, but I didn't realize it would happen the first week I moved into the space. Running into the beautiful cleaning woman last night has been the only thing I've thought about. I keep replaying the scene over in my mind, the way the blonde woman in pink scrubs danced and spun like she was having the time of her life with a vacuum for a partner. She'd taken a bow and I wish I'd been able to see the entire routine from the beginning. No doubt she'd been dancing to music that had been playing so loudly in her ears that she didn't hear me approach. I'd only wanted to ask her what music had motivated her, but then her jazz hand hit me. It wasn't hard, it had only startled me, and then the papers fell to the ground like snow. The moment has played over in my head over a dozen times. I'd been tongue-tied and unable to say anything intelligent after that. Then I spent the next two hours thinking up what I should have said to her, what would have been clever. The events of the entire evening and my inability to focus afterward has made it extremely hard to concentrate on the pitch I wanted to make this afternoon. I look at the papers stacked on my desk, no order. Just a pile that will end up in the recycling bin. Getting work done when my employees are here is difficult. I'm pulled into meetings that last too long, and they're not relevant to me. I don't want to kill the momentum in the room, and I'm trying to let my company grow organically. And that means any extra things I want to do on the business have to be taken care of after hours. 
I would go home to do it, but growing up I never felt like my dad's work home balance was very balanced, especially when he brought work home. I've made it my goal to only do work while I'm at work. Not that I have a family that it impacts. I've spent most of my waking, and let's be honest, non-waking hours, building this business. It's taken six years, but it's finally feeling like there's progress. If things go well in the next few months, I'm hoping to take an actual breather from my overscheduled schedule. But right now is not the time to think about it. A distant humming sound pricks my ears. My pulse picks up speed at the anticipation of seeing the cute woman I only sort of met last night. But more than likely it's just the sounds of the city coming to life. I stare out my corner office windows and gaze at the beauty of the ocean at sunrise. It makes me want to go surfing or scuba diving. I'd even take snorkeling right now. Anything to be out in the ocean. I rub my neck that's starting to ache from sleeping on the couch without a pillow. Soon I'll be able to enjoy my weekends with regular scuba diving, like I used to. But right now, I've got to get prepared for my pitch today. I know my business inside and out, but custom yachts are not a cookie-cutter model. Each client is different and so each yacht is going to be different. This client coming into town has high standards, and I intend to exceed all of his expectations when it comes to luxury, quality, and comfort. I take the stairs down to the 10th floor, where our break room is. I need an espresso, something to wake me up and keep me focused before I head down to the marina. The espresso machine hums to life, and I make myself a cup. With caffeine in hand, I rummage through the company fridge. We've been in this building for less than a week, and I'm still getting used to the place. I make a mental note to have my assistant stock the break room with all the usual options, but for now I grab a protein bar and head to our design center. I print out a new portfolio with customized contracts, offers, and descriptions. We have printers on each of the floors, but the design department's machines are the best. I drink some of my espresso while I wait for the print job to finish. I shouldn't be happy about having to reprint the whole thing, but I smile as I think about the woman who scattered my presentation with jazz hands. It was a funny fiasco. The gentle humming of the machine dies down, and this time instead of carrying the loose-leaf papers, I grab a portfolio from the design cabinet. I organize the documents, sliding them into their respective sleeves, before heading back up the stairs. I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Ready for the client meeting, that is. Not her. The cleaning woman with a dancing flare is back, and my breath is momentarily taken away. I can only see her profile. Yesterday I only saw her shocked face, but today she is smiling. Her honey-colored hair is pulled back into a high ponytail, but a few strands are loose, framing her face. And she's in my office. I approach like I would any wild animal, with a little more caution than I did yesterday. Truly, I didn't mean to scare her yesterday. I had thought I had talked loud enough for her to hear me coming while she was vacuuming. She has a duster in her hand, but she's not moving, just looking at my wall and I know what has captured her attention. Good morning, I say, but she doesn't hear me. Likely she has her music in her ears again. When I'm almost to the door she turns and startles. A small squeal escapes her lips. She leans back, knocking a plant over and drops her duster. She quickly pops out her airpods and drops to her knees to help right the plant. Oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry. It's not a problem, I say, putting my espresso and the portfolio on the desk. I drop to my knees to help her. She scoops up the dirt that is on the floor and puts it back into the plant, and I do the same. I am not usually this clumsy. She pushes an errant strand of hair behind her ears, but it won't stay put. After three attempts, she stops trying. I can tell she's flustered and somehow that makes the whole situation funny. Good business model, I say, trying to lighten the mood. First, make a mess, then clean it up. You'll have perpetual work that way. Her cheeks color, 
Her light green eyes widen. I, I didn't expect to see you again. This close to her I can tell that the dark ring around her eyes is more gray than green. She's beautiful. You didn't expect to see me again. I haven't been fired since last night. I still work here. I smile, still trying to lighten the mood. But why are you back on a Saturday? She looks more than a little distressed about it. Actually, I never left. She surveys me. That explains why your wardrobe hasn't changed since I last saw you. I raise my eyebrows. She remembered what I was wearing last night. Looks like you're in the same boat, I say. This is my uniform, she says, looking down at the bright pink scrubs. I nod. Of course. Normally, I wouldn't think of scrubs when I think of flattering clothing, but the pink top and bottom hug her curves in all the right places, and create a very flattering look for her. I'm so sorry again about your papers. I feel so bad. She rushes all her words, and I resist the urge to laugh. I gesture up the portfolio on my desk. It's taken care of, I say. Don't even worry about it. After getting as much dirt back into the pot as I can manage, I stand and hold my hand out to the woman to help her up. She looks between my hand and my face. It feels like I'm waiting like that forever, but finally she grabs her duster from the floor and slides her hand into mine. Her grip is tense, like she's uncomfortable, but even through the dirt I can feel how soft her fingers are. The thought momentarily distracts me from what I was doing. I help her to her feet, but I don't let her hand go right away. I'm Alex, by the way. She swallows. Cindy. I give her the smile I use to win over my clients, hoping to put her at ease, turning our hand-holding into a handshake. It's nice to officially meet you, Cindy, since I never caught your name when we bumped into each other last night. She glances around the room and nods. Of course this is your office. I swear I actually work when I'm cleaning. And I'm not paid by the hour, only the job, so even if it takes me all day, I don't get paid anymore. I will vacuum up the rest of this dirt right away. I nod, like what she's saying makes sense, but I have no idea why she's telling me this. It was an accident. No harm done. A pretty blush spreads across her cheeks. I love this picture, she says gesturing to the largest photo in my office. The underwater panorama is large and impressive. I take a minute to look at it through new eyes, as if I was seeing it the way Cindy sees it now, and not the millionth time of looking at it from my chair. Thanks, I say. On days when I'm stuck indoors, it's nice to remember my favorite times in the ocean. Those turtles were my favorite. It's illegal to touch them, but these guys were so curious I was swimming away from them pretty fast. You took this picture, she asks, turning her full attention to the art on the wall, and I can hear the admiration in her voice. I feel the tension between us dissipate just a little. I smile with pride. Just off the Great Barrier Reef. It was amazing. That's how I've imagined it looking, she says, almost wistfully. Someday I'll see it in person. She clears her throat and looks down at the duster in her hand. I've got to get back to work. I'll come back and vacuum that spot after you're gone so I don't disturb you. She leaves almost immediately and heads into the next office. Wait, I say, following her out of my office. Since we're here again together, I was wondering if you'd like to go get some coffee. Didn't you just get yourself a coffee? She asks, looking back toward my office. I glance to my desk. I should have thrown the cup away downstairs. Just an espresso. She laughs. I'm good. Thanks for the offer. I have a long day of cleaning. All the more reason to have some energy. I had some before I came. Thanks though. I better get back to work. Chapter 3 Cindy I work at turbo speed, as I keep my eyes peeled for blue eyes. 
Um, Alex. I don't begrudge people who work weekends, after all, I work them too. I just don't like sharing the space with them. Especially after the embarrassing run-in last night knocking his papers about. Not to mention making a mess in his office with the plant just now. A sinking feeling hits my gut that maybe he stayed up all night organizing the papers, but I push the thought away. It's over and done, and the sooner I'm finished cleaning the faster I can get him out of my head. Sure, he had this devastatingly gorgeous look about him. Even with his bedhead and slightly wrinkled shirt, his kissable five o'clock shadow and smoldering blue eyes were enough to make my knees go weak. Not that I noticed, much. I'm just the maid here. I have a job to do, and that's all I need to be thinking about. In record time I finish all the floors for the day. I even found a quick moment when Alex was out of his office to vacuum up the dirt I spilled. I push the elevator button and wait for the lovely little ding that signals the elevator doors will be opening soon. I step into the elevator, rolling in my vacuum. The elevator stops on the floor just below. I scoot my vacuum in farther so it's not blocking the way and freeze. Alex smiles at me. I keep running into you. There's no use avoiding the awkwardness, so I try to embrace it. After all we're in an elevator together for nine floors. At least this time I didn't whack you with my jazz hands. He busts up laughing and shakes his head. Do you normally dance in the elevators too? I bite my lip. I really shouldn't be talking to him. I like flying under the radar of other employees when I'm cleaning, but that hasn't happened with Alex. Instead of hiding, I seize the moment. I've got a whole routine for the elevator. Lots of tapping and soft shoe. He laughs again, and I'm really beginning to like that rich sound. Soft shoe and tapping? I nod. Oh yes. And it ends with a jump. A jump? You know, jumping in the elevator, like kids do? I smile at him, but he just looks at me. I don't know what you're talking about. His face is completely blank. While I ponder how his childhood must have been deprived to not know the joys of jumping in an elevator, I decide the best way to explain it is to show him. Watch and learn. As the elevator descends to the bottom floor, I feel the familiar moment of my stomach taking flight inside of me. I do a little hop. The sensation of the elevator still falling while I move up almost simulates an attraction at a theme park. I fall farther than I jumped because the elevator is still moving downward. I turn to Alex and give a little bow. See, a jump. It wasn't the Olympic high jump, he says. Well, you don't start out with the bar that high when you're first learning how to elevator jump. I smile. This is the most random conversation. I'll keep that in mind, he says. Now, about that favor that you owe me. Which favor? I blink. The elevator opens and I head to my cleaning closet, open it up and stow my stuff. He follows me and leans against the wall. You said you'd help me if there was anything you could do for me. I nod. I did say that. Of course it was in reference to organizing the papers I knocked everywhere. Did you mean it? Those mesmerizing eyes of his are holding a secret. I blow out a breath. Within reason. Come have coffee with me. I told you I already had some this morning. Breakfast then? It's nearly noon. His face looks panicked for a minute, and he looks down at his watch. I didn't realize it was so late. You've got somewhere to be? I lock the cleaning closet and head out toward the parking garage. A meeting with a client today. That's what you were preparing for? The papers I knocked everywhere? Now I do feel a little guiltier that he had to redo something right before his meeting. It wasn't a big deal. I reprinted it, he says nonchalantly. Wasting trees. I recycled the paper. It was the best I could do. Good luck on your meeting, I say, not sure if I'm disappointed or not about the coffee or the breakfast. Rain check on coffee, he asks. I shrug. I'm sure I'll see you around. But as I say the words, the mortification of wrecking another one of his meetings in the future takes hold. I don't have plans to run into him again. Like ever.
I get into my car and drive off. In the rearview mirror I see him lift his hand to wave at me, and then my stomach does that little elevator jump thing and I'm smiling. Maybe seeing him again wouldn't be so bad. The smile doesn't leave me. I'm still grinning all the way home, where I quickly change and head out to the MEWCS Center, the Marine Environmental and Wildlife Conservation Support Center, on White Sand Beach. It's the most beautiful area in all Southern California. It's my day to give the hour-long tour on conservation and helping the ocean to thrive. The tours rotate every week of the month, with different topics. I love teaching others about the ocean. It's a home away from home. I skin my badge that hangs on a lanyard. I greet a family who is vacationing and a group of Girl Scouts. The tour goes by quickly, and the Scouts ask so many questions. I'm helping them earn badges, and so I answer all of them. At the end of the tour, I give each member a coloring book packet to help them remember what we talked about today and to learn more about the ocean. Hannah is standing at the entrance of the MEWCS Center when I say, Goodbye, to my tour. Hey, I say. I wasn't expecting you. Hannah gives me a hug and a few air kisses. What else am I supposed to do when my bestie leaves me a message on my phone late at night and then doesn't answer any text or phone call, for the next day? I was starting to worry. You said it was bad. She raises her eyebrows as if inspecting me for cuts or bruises or something. She's always been protective of me like that, and I really appreciate her friendship. No, it wasn't bad, just really embarrassing, but it's fine. I grin as I think about Alex. Embarrassing, but you're happy about it? She eyes me, and I can see the wheels in her head spinning into overdrive. What's going on? You are never this smiley when you're done with a tour group. I try to stop grinning. I try hard. And I fail miserably. No, I'm not happy about it. And yes, last night was crazy embarrassing. But I don't know, something about this morning has made it better. You're making no sense. Come on, we're going to the captain's hat and you're going to tell me everything. She leads me by the elbow as if I'm suffering from heat exhaustion and she's trying to lead me out of the sun. There's really not much to tell. She smirks. Sure there isn't. But we're still going for lunch. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Hannah and I are in the outdoor seating of the captain's hat. It's at the end of my favorite pier. It's a vintage, pirate-themed restaurant. Though the statues of the pirates at the front of the restaurant are borderline cheesy, the restaurant is more upscale than one would guess by the reviews online. The wind blows just enough to bring the saltiness into the air. The sun bakes down on us, but there is an umbrella that mostly shades us and our table. Hannah wastes no time ordering right when the server comes to ask about drinks. She's efficient like that. Okay, spill it. I need actual details, Hannah says, as she leans back in her chair. Like I said, it was just an embarrassing moment, but today it's fine. Well mostly fine. I mean, I felt like I held it together in front of Alex this morning sans the plant incident. And he was pretty chill about it. Hannah sighs, exasperation written all over her face. She reaches into her purse on the chair next to her and retrieves her cell phone. After a few taps and swipes, she holds the phone up for me to listen to the voicemail I sent her. Hey, Hannah. You'll never believe what just happened to me. It was kind of like that time when we were in college and we were having a party with the fraternity, and I thought the party started at 7, not 6. Hannah puts down her phone on the table and leans forward. I have the evidence right here. And you not telling me only means that there's more to tell me than you think there is. So spill it. Because that time you alluded to was at the exact time when John ran into you while you were still getting ready for the party. And that was epic. We don't need to repeat the story, I say, my face heating from the memory. If you're comparing it to the time that you were still in your towel and you broke John's nose, then don't make me repeat the rest of the story so the whole restaurant will hear it. Just tell me what happened. Okay, so it wasn't as bad as that time, I admit, though honestly, the way I'd been feeling last night, it had totally felt like that. Except I didn't break Alex's nose. 
There was no blood spurting anywhere. And I was in clothes, albeit work clothes. I'm waiting, Hannah says as she taps her nails on the round table. I take a drink of my water and look out to the ocean one more time. Okay. So I'm cleaning the building on the pier at night, right? She rolls her eyes dramatically. Right. It's what you do every week. You really make it hard for me to set you up with anyone, you know that, right? Hannah dates a lot and I've turned down her offers to double date more times than I can count this year. I wave her complaint away. I know, but when I get the promotion at MEWCS Center, I'll be able to afford life without the second job. Until then, I trail off my sentence, my gaze focusing on the ocean. She waves her hand in the air. I know your grandiose plans, and your desire to pay your dues, yada, yada, but we're getting way off topic. So for the final time, spill. Long and short of it is, I was vacuuming and I accidentally ran into one of the new employees at the Vista Point building. I cringe. It was so embarrassing. Hannah looks at me with her dark green eyes and frowns. That was the thing you called me about? Yep. She squints at me. No. No way. That can't be the whole story. There must be something more. He was hot, wasn't he? I wasn't really paying attention to that fact, I say, raising my chin in the air. He had this huge stack of papers, and I totally knocked them all out of his hand. The floor was covered. He didn't have any page numbers on them. Seriously, I was so mortified. Hannah smiles. Now we're getting somewhere. So, papers everywhere, and you, what, again? Ran into him with your vacuum? No, I was vacuuming, and I happened to run into him. I can feel my cheeks heat at the admission. Hannah covers her mouth. I'm seeing where it's getting embarrassing for you now. You were totally rocking out with your vacuum, weren't you? It's the only thing that makes any sense. I totally remember the way you'd dance around the sorority house, with the broom, the mop, and the vacuum. I nod. Basically. My jazz hand hit him in the face. Thankfully no blood though. Hannah snorts. Great first impression on your new client. He's not my client. I work for the company who owns the floor now. I wave the detail away. That would have been even more embarrassing. Hannah shrugs. So, he caught you dancing and you hit him. That's not so bad. I couldn't handle the moment so I left early and didn't finish the job. I went back this morning and he was also there. He had to redo the entire presentation documents. I still feel bad about it. Hannah laughs. I'm sorry, but it just sounds so funny. There you are performing on Broadway in the middle of the office. And you hit him right on cue and then the papers float around both of you like a snowstorm. It's hilarious. I apologized again this morning. Well I'm sure he's over it, right? No hard feelings? I nod. I think so. He asked me out for coffee this morning. Hannah squeals. See? I knew there was more to the story. Where did you go? Please tell me he was more creative than Starbucks. We didn't go, because I was working, and he already had espresso on his desk. Besides, I'm supposed to be inconspicuous when I'm cleaning, not looking for dates. But he asked you out. You could have made it work. She tosses her long dark brown braid over her shoulder. I sigh. Hannah is always so good at making sense of situations after I've made a mess of them. You're right. I could have made it work. So, he's not good looking? He is good looking, I admit that much, but I'm not telling Hannah that I thought about his eyes for way too long last night. I keep that detail to myself. Hannah looks as if she's going to burst. Then what's the problem? Before I can answer Hannah's question, the server comes with our food. He refills our waters, and then he's off again, helping another table. I take a bite of my Anchors Away chicken sandwich and savor the taste of the pesto sauce. So what's the problem? Hannah asks again before she takes a bite of her captain's burger. I don't even know the guy. 
Hannah gives an exaggerated sigh. And how do you get to know people, Cindy? Not by running away when they catch you taking a dance break. She shakes her head and holds up her finger. She doesn't want me to answer her question, I know it. No, you get to know someone by talking to them and going out to coffee with them. It was bad timing, I say, but my excuse just falls flat out of my mouth. Her jaw drops. She puts a hand to her ear. Do you hear that, Cindy? That is the sound of opportunity knocking, and you didn't answer. You ran out the back door and moved across town, all while there's a cute guy just wondering if he can make your morning better by buying you a coffee. Seriously? I cover my face. You're right. See, this is why I called you. No. Oh no. You called me because you were embarrassed. You didn't call me to tell me you blew a chance with a cute guy who, need I point out, asked you out after you made a mess of his paperwork, not before. So, what do I do? I ask, hoping she'll impart her Hannah wisdom on me. She leans back in her chair, surveying me with a critical eye. Do? There's nothing to do. You barely know his name. You know nothing about him, which I assume means you didn't give him your number? Hannah takes a drink and I shake my head in answer. She sighs. So what you do is use this as a learning lesson. The next time opportunity knocks, at least answer the door. You think he wanted to go out with me? This is me. I'm pretty much clueless when it comes to guys. I'm going to assume that your question is rhetorical, because in my mind when someone asks for something it's usually because they want something, not because they don't want something. So I listen for a knock at the door. And don't run away next time. Chapter 4 Alex On Monday, I stare at the turtles in my office during the middle of my meeting. Cindy's face appears in my mind so clearly, complete with the curl that brushed the side of her face. What do you say, boss? The room is looking at me, and I redirect my attention to my marketing vice president. I think we're on the right track, I say, trying to pull myself back into the conversation. Cade raises an eyebrow at me, but nods. I think we have enough to get started on, he says and stands. The rest of the room follows suit. I thank everyone for coming to the meeting, and we schedule another session for later in the week. Cade hangs back, shaking hands with the different executive members who leave my office. When everyone has exited, he closes my office door and doesn't say anything until he sits back down in front of my desk. Rough weekend? The Donnelly account not go as you plan? I grin. Actually, the account went great. Mr. Donnelly wants a custom yacht. He called me this morning to let me know that he was so excited after meeting with me on Saturday for three hours, that he talked me up to everyone while he was golfing on Sunday. We have four new potential clients. Cade blinks. Wow. That's great. And do you want to handle those accounts yourself? I shake my head. No. I have no personal connection to them. Mr. Donnelly is a family friend, and so I told him I'd take care of him, but for his colleagues, I'm fine with giving all the referrals to the sales department. Sounds like a productive weekend then, he says. I glance up at the turtles swimming in the picture. Yeah, it was a mostly productive weekend. After all, I solidified the account, what else do I need? There's that look though. Why was it only, mostly, productive? Cade and I are good friends. He is part owner in the company, but he didn't want the stress of being completely in charge. The marketing suits him. He always picks up on the details and nuances. It's nothing. I asked someone out, kind of. I glance at the plant on the floor that was knocked over on Saturday by a beautiful woman. It's not worse for the wear, but the memory of Cindy lingers. You asked someone out? Back in the dating game then? Cade eyes me. He knows my history. I shrug. Not really back in the game per se, but maybe trying a jump shot. And? Cade looks interested. 
Total air ball. Where did you go? Kate asks. I lean back in my chair. We didn't. She turned me down. Kate nods. That explains your completely distracted behavior during our meeting just now much better than thinking you were focused on the Donnelly account. You know you were all over the map on your answers today. I wasn't going to correct you in front of everyone else, but you were totally out of it. Thanks. How did you meet her, he asks. She bumped into me actually. I tell him the story, and by the time I finish he's laughing. He wipes a pretend tear from his eye. Wow. So, she turned you down for coffee, and you're still torn up about it two days later? You think that's strange? We had a connection. I stare at the turtles again, swimming together and remember the way she admired it. She'd smiled at it with a genuine interest. A connection where she whacked you. She turned you down. Thanks for the reminder. But this is good. This means maybe you're ready to date again. I wave my hand in the air. I'm not looking for anything right now. It was probably stupid to have asked her out. You're just rusty. It's been a couple of years, he says. I'm about to protest, but he holds up his hands. I'm just saying, you're not used to rejection. Come to think of it, I can't remember you ever having to deal with rejection before. Again, not really helping. I should have kept it to myself. Why did I tell Kate about my weekend? Kate slaps me on the back good-naturedly. Welcome to the real world, Alex. We all have to face rejection or disappointment at some point. Seriously, I think I'll just keep focusing on the business, I say. It's been my cop-out for the last two and a half years, and it's kept me focused on building my business. We've had so much growth that the small floor we had before in a different office building had been cramped. Now we have three full floors, and plenty of space to meet potential clients. It helps that the marina where we rent space for our model yachts is only a couple of blocks away. You'll focus on the business just fine, even if you do decide to start dating again. You think? I've spent so much time at work, practically living most of my life at work as I've brought this little fledgling of a business idea into the success it is today that it feels like the only way to live. I've pushed aside memories of trying to balance a dating life with my work life. And with my history, it's better I've forgotten how to do it. At some point, life gets a little lonely without someone to share it with. Just something to think about, Kate says, turning toward the door. That's easy for you to say, you found the love of your life. It's still true, whether you found the right person or not. I've got a meeting to get to with the sales team. If you email me over the referrals, I'll see that they are handed off to the teams that can direct all their attention to these new potential clients. Thanks, Cade. He smiles. It's my job. For the advice too, I say. He nods, like he knew all along that's what I was thanking him for and leaves my office. For the next several hours while I'm at work, I formulate my plan. Cade is right. I probably need better balance in my life. There is something missing. I'm not saying right now that it's Cindy. But she did spark my interest. And I keep thinking about her. I stay late to finish up some work. I like the feeling of being ahead when I come into work in the mornings and staying after hours helps me accomplish that. I glance at the out-of-the-way cleaning closet on the lower level on my way to the parking garage. The door is closed, as it should be when no one is around. I'm tempted to try the door to see if there is a cleaning schedule posted inside, but I don't. Around the parking garage I see only a handful of other cars. All of them are in reserved spaces, and none of them look like Cindy's. I drive home and once I'm inside, I take a slow look around the place. It's the perfect house for entertaining, but the only big gatherings I've done in the last year are company-related. Cade is right. It's feeling empty around here. I'm not used to calling it a night so early from work, 
but I won't do work in my house. I wander, order takeout, and settle into watching a documentary about the ocean. At least with the TV on and the volume turned up, it doesn't feel as quiet as before. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. As the sun sets, I pace my office. It's been a week since I first met Cindy. I was going to leave about an hour ago, but here I am back in my office, praying I made the right decision. Cade had invited me to go out with some friends he wanted to introduce me to. I told him yes, but when I saw Cindy's car in the parking garage, I knew I'd have to come up with some excuse. I told Cade I had to finish an account. He raised his eyebrows in disbelief, but he didn't say anything about it as I walked back into the building from the parking garage. I have work to do, but I've done most of it, and the rest of it I can't concentrate on. I sit back at my desk and shuffle the papers around. Pulling up the Donnelly account, I start using our software to build out everything from the seat material to the trim. The project looks good and soon I'm so lost in fine-tuning the options, I don't even hear the faint hum of the vacuum right away. I glance through my office wall completely made of glass and see the faint glow of the vacuum down the hall. My pulse increases, and I feel like I did when I was about to do my very first deep dive, nervous and excited, but mostly nervous. Anticipation fills me, and I'm still not sure why. After all I've only seen her twice, and we didn't even say that much to each other. I'm about to get up from my desk, but she's dancing again, this time spinning around the vacuum. She's singing an old Broadway tune from Guys and Dolls, maybe? She's belting out the words but some of them are muffled by the vacuum's competing hum. I laugh at the way she's enjoying her job. I know nothing about her, but I can tell that she loves what she does, that she puts her whole heart into the moment. All the lights are on in the entire floor. She works from one end of the offices until she reaches mine. Hi. I look up from my tablet, which suddenly feels slippery in my hands. Her jaw drops when she notices me behind my desk. She immediately turns off the vacuum and pops out her headphones. It's you again. It is. I still work here, I say. Yes, but why do you work so late on a weekend? Everyone should be gone. I was hoping to see your full dance routine this time, I say, attempting to joke with her. She rolls her eyes. I can't afford to reveal my full Broadway number. I'm supposed to be invisible here. Broadway tunes and dancing with cleaning appliances doesn't exactly scream invisible. She laughs and tucks her hair behind her ear. You're right, but I usually don't have an audience. Like ever. The other floors I clean are deserted when I'm here. And I've cleaned floor 6 forever. They all leave by 4 o'clock on Fridays. I had a little more work to catch up on, I say. Your boss must be a tough one to please. Everyone else in this company is gone. He's not too tough to please, but every morning when I look at him in the mirror, I guess my expectations of myself tend to get the better of me. She looks around the office as if seeing it for the first time. Then she covers her face with her hands. You're the boss. Of course you're the boss. Guilty. And on that note, I'd better get back to work. I can come back to your office later to vacuum it once you're gone. I stand up, not wanting to throw off her groove. You can vacuum it now, it's fine. She nods and vacuums the area without any singing or dancing. When she's finished, she smiles at me and steps just out of my office door. The room is all yours. I'll take care of the dusting later. I want to protest. It doesn't bother me if she's in my office while I'm there, but instead I say, what about that cup of coffee? She turns off the vacuum, a hand placed on her curvy hip coffee at this late hour? She holds up her wristwatch toward me. I'd be up all night. Aren't you going to be up most of the night anyway? Yes, but I don't want to stay awake once I'm finished cleaning. How about a decaf? I try again, 
Cade's words echoing in my ears. I'm supposed to be invisible, remember? You're not supposed to know I'm here. You're just supposed to enjoy your clean office on Monday morning like the rest of the employees who work on floors I clean over the weekends. Come on, you owe me for spilling my papers. The least you can do is have a cup of coffee with me. It's low that I'm calling in a date as a favor, but if I don't try now, when will I ever get another chance? I don't date people from the buildings I clean, she says, then smiles in a way that makes me wonder if she's serious. I raise my eyebrows. Is that a professional rule or a personal one? She laughs. Totally personal. It's easier to clean messy offices if I don't have a face attached to them. Thankfully, the biggest mess I've had in my office was the result of a beautiful blonde knocking over a plant. Touché. A smile plays across her beautiful pink lips. You're not going to quit, are you? I give her a winning smile, the kind I use to seal the deal. I'm not the quitting type, I say confidently. A quick cup, but I really can't leave tonight. I have an early morning and need to finish cleaning by midnight. Espresso in the break room it is then, I say, feeling like I've won something, even if we're only going to the break room. Chapter 5 Cindy I follow Alex into the break room. It feels strange to enter this space without a vacuum and cleaning supplies in tow. It's almost like I'm breaking the rules. The room feels more like a living area than a typical break room. There are couches and end tables in addition to the modern tables and chairs set up for eating. With a touch of a button Alex turns on the lights. Large screens on the wall come to life with promotional advertisements of luxury yachts. Alex opens a pristine white cabinet and pulls out two espresso cups. In a few minutes the dark, steaming liquid fills our cups, and he gestures for me to pick a seat. I pick a dark wood chair at a counter height table. He sits down in the chair next to me. I take in the enormous room. It feels bigger than my entire apartment. Not that my apartment is huge, by any stretch of the imagination. I take a sip of the hot espresso. The concentrated drink has a rich, chocolate taste with a nutty undertone. It's good, and I can sense that I will be feeling the effects of the energy boost within the next 20 minutes. This is good. I've never had espresso quite like this before, I say, savoring another sip. I've done some work in South America. We import this directly from Peru. They have a secret recipe. I once joked with a co-worker that if custom yachts didn't take off as a business, we should invest in exporting the beans. The espresso is always a crowd pleaser. It looks like you're doing well for yourself here? He nodded. We do well. I point to a set of four framed art pieces arranged in a gallery style. Did you take those pictures too? Vibrant photos of turtles, a whale, dolphin, and a reef with colorful fish fill each frame, displaying the beauty and majesty of the ocean. They have a similar feel to the large turtle one in his office. He nods. Three of them I can take credit for. The other one was taken by my marketing guy, Cade. They're impressive, I say. So you are a diver then? Alex raises his eyebrows. I am. You must have some really nice equipment. Those shots are hard to get. It sounds like you know what you're talking about. Do you dive too, he asks. Since I was a teenager. I used to go all the time with my dad. He pointed to two of the pictures. Those pictures were taken in Hawaii. Off Little Luna Point? I ask. Bravo. I shrug. It's really the best place to go scuba diving in all the islands. The water is so clear there. We saw a lot of dolphin pods that day, he says, pointing to one of his pictures. Last winter, I went to the Great Barrier Reef. It's where I saw those turtles. I force a smile. I should have known the conversation would turn this way. I've always wanted to see the Great Barrier Reef in person. It was one of those things my dad and I always talked about doing. You should do it. It's probably my favorite place to dive. 
maybe someday, I plaster a smile on my face, and before it falters I put the espresso cup to my lips once again to enjoy the savory and sweet drink. My heart hitches a little up into my throat. My love of scuba diving always carries with it the pain that I will never experience it again with my dad. Sure, since his death I've gone with friends, I had to cope somehow. But all the big trips, the big plans we'd made together, they've been put on hold. Permanently. Where have you been lately with your dad? I bet he'd love Australia too. My heart squeezes. He passed away a few years ago. Alex's eyes soften. I'm so sorry, Cindy. I look down at my drink. You're right about Australia though. My dad loved being there. It was one of his favorite places. I push through the awkwardness of the moment, not wanting to dwell on the past, and smile at Alex. I look around for something to pull us into a different conversation. I admire the models of different ships placed around the break room. So, why yachts? He takes my question like a lifeline. I love the ocean. It's my home away from home. When the opportunity came up, I couldn't think of something else that would be better. So I jumped in with both feet and haven't looked back. Tranquilla Yachts has helped me create a customized home away from home feel for my clients. I've traveled around the world collecting the components to make sure that each one feels unique. That sounds exciting. It's been my passion. And it keeps me living close to the ocean, even when I'm not out on it. He takes a sip of his espresso, and when he closes his eyes to savor the taste, I take in his whole person. Though he is the owner of the company, he's down to earth, and I like that about him. He looks casual and relaxed wearing his light gray polo shirt. He opens his eyes and smiles at me when he catches me staring at him. I clear my throat. How long have you been in business? I started the company eight years ago, and the last three years it's really started ramping up. I gesture to one of the small models, not wanting to be caught staring at him again. And do you scuba dive off of these boats? He smiles. You can scuba dive off any boat, but these aren't as fast as other ones if I'm chasing a pod of dolphin or a whale. You're chasing whales? Sometimes. It would be hard to take these amazing pictures without a little bit of a chase. He gestures to the wall with the pictures. I laugh, imagining Alex steering his large yacht and then jumping into a speedboat to catch up to whales. Adrenaline junkie? More like I want amazing photos. Before I'm ready to say, goodbye, to Alex, my espresso cup is empty. I stand up and head to the sink. I make quick work of washing and drying my cup, then return it to the cupboard. Alex watches me for a moment. I forget you know where everything goes. I grab his cup and repeat the process. I can do this, he says, trying to take his cup back from me. You're not on duty right now. Sorry. Habit. Just part of the job. I smile and put his cup away. Running a paper towel under the faucet, I wipe the counter off, leaving it free of fingerprints. Thanks for the espresso. It was a nice break but I'd better get back to work. Even though this little break was a far cry from a date, I think Hannah will be proud of me for not running out the back door, as she'd put it last week. Alex smiles at me, his blue eyes captivating. Could we get together on purpose next time, instead of running into each other by chance? I take a deep breath, and a little thrill goes through my stomach. What did you have in mind? I know Hannah will be rolling her eyes when I tell her that I answered his question with a question, but I can't just yell, yes, I'd love to get together again. It's not me. How about lunch next week? Okay. I can do any day except Monday and Wednesday. I work during my lunch breaks on those days. How about Tuesday? I can make Tuesday work. Tingles shoot through my body at the thought of seeing Alex again. What time? How about I get your number and we can work out the details? I give him my number, and he enters it into his phone. There, he says, and he immediately texts me this is Alex along with a small scuba diver emoji. This is Cindy. I write back with a smiling emoji. He turns out the lights on the break room. I'll text you about Tuesday. 
I look forward to it. A warmth fills me as I head back to my vacuum. Alex goes into his office. I don't see him again while I'm vacuuming, but as I finish up the last hallway on the 11th floor, I receive a text. I pause my music, another thrill going through me as I read the message on the screen. Let me know when you're leaving, and I'll walk you out to your car. It's really not necessary. I've been cleaning this building for years, and I've always felt safe getting to my car at night. I know it's not. But I'd still like to walk you down. Another wave of butterflies spread through my stomach at his thoughtfulness. Okay. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. I head to Hannah's after my hour down by the tide pools. Saturdays get busy at the pier, and I make my way along the winding boardwalk path that has a layer of sand on top of it. The tourist shop Hannah runs is only a 10-minute walk from the MEWCS center. A trickle of bells announces my entry into the shabby chic beach shop. Hannah has everything a tourist could want in here, and the whole thing is done up with driftwood, gorgeous nets, and seashells. Hannah finishes helping a customer at the counter and then turns her attention to me, a wide grin on her face. Do you have news? I nod. I won't be able to hide it from her long. She's so good at dragging information out of me. Hang on, let me help these last customers and then I can take a lunch break. I wander down the aisles full of ocean treasures, shells, rocks, and sand art. I pick up a piece of driftwood that makes the base of a sign that says, make waves of on it. Hannah does a lot of the designs herself, and I am always amazed at how creative she can be. In the mood for lunch? Or should we just get dessert? Hannah asks. She turns the sign on the door from open to be back soon. I already ate before work. Hannah smiles. Dessert it is. Gelato? Perfect choice. We walk a short distance to the gelato shop. It's busy, but when the tan guy at the counter sees Hannah, he waves her forward. Hannah tucks her hair behind her ear and bites her lip before skipping the line and going directly to the cash register. Hey, Hannah. I have your order ready for you. He pulls out a large scoop of gelato and puts the bright pink scoop into a waffle cone. Thanks, she says, in a breathy tone that makes it sound like she's just run a marathon. The guy lowers his voice to Hannah. What will your friend want? I'll have a lemon gelato, please, I say quietly, though I'm unsure why we're whispering. The guy looks at Hannah's phone for a moment and then writes a message there, on the house. Then to the rest of the shop, he says, when you order on the app, you skip the line. Several people in the shop pull out their phones. The guy winks at Hannah and then says, see you later. In a loud voice, Hannah says, this is the best gelato in town. The only place I ever come. I follow Hannah out of the store, completely shocked by what just happened. My best friend is clearly keeping secrets from me. What was that? Hannah blinks. What was what? I point my spoon at her. You know exactly what. You have a thing for the ice cream guy. First of all, it's gelato, not ice cream. And second, I do not. I snort. Okay. Denial. Blake and I are just friends. Sure you are. I drag out the phrase as I wiggle my eyebrows. Hannah rolls her eyes. Seriously. We are. We've both just come to an understanding that as shop owners we don't want to wait in line because it affects our personal businesses. So, he always gives me mine as soon as I get into the shop. And I always let him know I have his package ready when he wants to buy something at my store. And how often is he buying something from you? Hannah shrugs. He's gotten a few things. He advertises for me, and I always make sure to send people his way too. It's called being polite. Besides it's good business for both of us. He gave you gelato on the house. Hannah grins. He usually does. But I tip him on the app because seriously this strawberry peach gelato is the best, so it all works out in the end. I savor my lemon gelato eating each bite slowly as I ponder about Hannah and Blake as we make our way through the sand toward the waves. The tangy treat begins to melt in the sun, and I scoop off a larger spoonful to keep it from dripping. 
I eat the bite, but as soon as the cold hits the roof of my mouth, the cold headache burns all the way up to my forehead. I scrunch my eyes closed, then laugh after the feeling fades. Hannah clears her throat. Okay. So you said you had details to share. Let's hear it. I'm still in shock at what I've just witnessed. Wow. My news totally pales in comparison to you and Blake. No, it doesn't because there is no news between me and Blake. If you say so, I say. Moving on. Tell me your news. I swirl my spoon in the melting gelato trying to act nonchalant. I just wanted to tell you in person that when opportunity knocked, I didn't completely run away this time. I grin. Hannah throws her empty hand up and fist pumps the air. Yes. My girl can be taught. Don't get too excited, it's just lunch. Hannah grins. It's not just lunch, it's improvement. She wipes a pretend tear from her eye with dramatic flair. I'm just so proud. I roll my eyes. Okay, okay. You don't have to overdo it. I need more details. That's really all there is. Fine, but I expect a full report on how your date goes next week. Sure. I'll let you know everything I order. Hannah's eyes widen, and she stops walking. If you literally report to me everything you eat, before giving me details about your date, I'm going to make sure you're Tasha's dinner buddy at our next sorority reunion. That's low, Hannah, I say. Well don't make me do it. Give me actual details, with no food involved. Fair enough, I say. You're really in charge of the seating arrangements this time? Brenda backed out a few days ago, so I can tweak it however I want. She's already made the rest of the arrangements though, so all I have to do is the seating and the announcements at the beginning. You're coming, right? I nod. I like seeing everyone, well most everyone. It's a good chance to catch up, and it's only once a year for a few hours. That's the spirit, Hannah says brightly. And who knows, maybe Tasha has forgotten about the time you embarrassed her in front of all her fans. I wasn't trying to be Harvest Ball Queen, I say. In fact, it was embarrassing for both of us. I was paired up with her date. The whole thing was awkward. I never bring it up. Hopefully she's over it by now. Hopefully. Hannah nods. We take a seat on a bench as we finish the last of our gelato and watch the waves as they crash against the rocks and the sand. Do you have more details about your dad's foundation? The gala is planned for the end of the month. All of the specifics will be announced then. It's been almost a year of his old company working on this foundation. They just let me know a couple of weeks ago they want me to give a speech about my dad. I blow out a breath. I haven't thought too much about it until now. You'll do great, Hannah says. Thanks. It's a little nerve-wracking to be in front of all those people, but it's for a good cause, and I'm glad that his memory gets the recognition it deserves, even if it's taken so long. My stomach tightens. My whole world fell apart when my dad died, and this foundation doesn't feel like closure. It just feels like one more reminder that life didn't turn out the way I'd planned. Hannah's arm comes around my shoulders protectively. You've got this. You're good at giving speeches, even if you get worked up before. You know I'm always cheering you on. I return Hannah's hug. Thank you. I'm grateful she wants to be there for me. I know I'm going to spend time on my speech, and experience has taught me that when it's over I can appreciate the opportunity, but right now, I need to put the whole idea of that night out of my mind. My mind is drawn back to Alex. I want to tell Hannah something, but there's really nothing else to tell. So instead I say, I need more details on you and Blake. There's really nothing to tell, she says, but her smile says otherwise. Chapter 6 Alex Every time the bell rings announcing a new patron into the restaurant, I look up. Cindy hasn't arrived yet, though we agreed to meet almost 30 minutes ago. I stare at my phone in between watching the door, debating whether I should text her. I know there's chemistry between us, at least there is on my end. And Cindy smiled when we made plans to go to lunch together, 
which was a much better choice for an actual first date than just having coffee in my break room. Two more customers come in, and neither of them is Cindy. I pull up my texting app, but at the last second I chicken out texting her, and instead text Kate about work. I thought you were on a lunch date. His reply comes almost immediately. She's running late. At least, I hope that she's only running late. We can chat about work when you get back to the office. I'm not sure why, but I picture Cade laughing at me. I blow out a breath, surprised I'm getting this worked up. It's just lunch. With someone I've just met. I don't have to make this weird. I'm so sorry I'm late, Cindy says as she hurries toward me. She's wearing a navy shirt and khaki capris. Her bright blue sandals match the sunglasses that she pushes up onto her head. This is the first time I've seen her in something that isn't her bright pink scrubs and her tennis shoes. But she's beautiful no matter what she's wearing. I stand as she approaches and give her a smile. I'm glad you made it. Relief fills my entire body, and now I'm wondering why I was worried about her standing me up. My tour group decided to ask all sorts of questions after the official tour ended, and we have a policy to be available for that, but I almost never get the number of questions this group generated. I was going to text you on my way, and then I was in such a hurry I left my phone in my locker. Now I'm feeling glad that I didn't pepper her with text messages while I was waiting. It wouldn't have helped anyway, and I would have felt ghosted. I smile at her. It happens to the best of us. I gesture to the other seat at the table, and she sits down. I join her and raise my hand to get the waiter's attention. When the waiter comes by Cindy orders a strawberry lemonade. So you are giving a tour group at the MEWCS center? She blinks at me. How did you know that? Your shirt gave it away, I say. She looks down at the embroidered emblem on her navy polo shirt. And I was in such a hurry, I didn't even change into date clothes, she says, giving me a sardonic smile. I think you look great, I say. And she does. Her honey-colored hair has some wave to it today, and hits just below her shoulders. Although her hair is pulled back, a few loose strands still frame her face. Her eyes are bright, the dark gray ring around her light green eyes, capture my attention. She brushes her hair away from her face, tucking it behind her ear. Thanks, she says. You look good too. She blushes as she says the words. I grin. I have had an effect on her, and I like that. Thanks. So, you were giving a tour? I already know this, but I leave the question open for her to talk about it. She nods. Yes. I give tours three days a week. It's one of the more interactive parts of my job. I really love talking to people about the ocean and the environment. Today was a tour of the tide pools. This is your job. I thought you cleaned buildings. She arches an eyebrow. Well, I do that too, but I don't vacuum and dance as my day job. I laugh, grateful for the humor between us. You could have fooled me. How would I even do that during the day? Nobody should know about my hidden talents of choreographed vacuum moves. Cleaning during the day would defeat that purpose. Unless you were at a place where people worked nights instead of days, I say. Fair enough. But I can't think of any places like that, can you? I shrug. A nightclub? That was one I hadn't thought of. But no. Cleaning is just something I do on the side. It pays the bills until I can get the promotion I'm hoping for. The waiter comes back to our table. I order the shrimp tacos, and Cindy orders the fish tacos. I'm intrigued by this woman in front of me. We talk about the restaurant and general get to know you questions until the waiter comes back with our food. Everything looks delicious, Cindy says, taking a bite of her fish tacos. I savor a bite of my shrimp tacos and agree. What does your job look like at the MEWCS Center? 
I take a drink of my Coke. Right now, a lot of what I do involves helping educate the public. In the fall and spring, we have a lot of school tours. In the summer, I get a lot of travelers and youth groups. Mux also partners with local outreach groups and organize service projects. But, when I'm not doing tours, I do a lot of lab work, testing water samples. It's the necessary grunt work while I earn my stripes to move up in the company. The tours are fun, but I really want to go and study marine wildlife up close. I had no idea. So the scuba diving thing is more than a hobby then? Still just a hobby. I've gone out on a few dives for work. But nothing big yet. Nothing like what you captured in your photos. I was just at the right place at the right time, I say, trying to downplay them. Those kinds of things don't happen by chance though. Maybe they were all photoshopped, I say, smiling. Her eyes widen. I don't believe it. If you were that good at Photoshop, you'd be in graphic design, not yachts. I pretend to be offended. How do you know I'm not good at Photoshop? Maybe I do all the company's graphic designs. Maybe it's my passion. Her lips twitch, and I can tell she's not buying it. Is it your passion? She asks, trying to keep a straight face. I can't hide my smile. Not even close. My friend Cade is really the person that does all of that. Though I'm decently good at using our computer software to create new designs on boats and adding trim. Then your non-photoshopped pictures from your scuba diving trips are still very impressive. A line between her eyebrows appears, her features changing slightly for a moment. What is it? I ask. Is the dish too spicy? The restaurant is known for spice, and while the extra heat can be nice, sometimes it's hard to enjoy the flavor when your whole mouth is burning. I like spicy food. She waves a hand in the air. I was just thinking my dad used to take amazing pictures in the ocean. I was always too nervous to use his camera underwater, because it was so heavy, but now I kind of wish I had learned and taken a few shots myself. This isn't the first time she's mentioned her dad, and I'm not quite sure what to say. I'm sorry for your loss. She nods and smiles. Thanks. I always think of him when I think of the ocean, or anything to do with the ocean. I'm sure one of the reasons I love the ocean is because he did. What did he do? I don't want to pry too deep, I know how rough talking about sensitive topics can be, but I'm hoping she opens up a little more about her family life. Dad was a marine biologist. You could say he had salt water running in his veins for how much he was in the ocean. I think he was more at home when he was on a boat or in the ocean than when he was on land. She swallows hard and takes a few more bites of food without speaking. Our conversation stalls only for a few moments, and then we're talking about favorite places in Southern California, college, and favorite movies. We're laughing and talking and before our conversation is done, the waiter checks on us, asking if we want dessert. I lift my eyebrows in question at Cindy. We've spent over an hour at this restaurant, and while I'm having the time of my life talking with her, I let her answer if she wants to stay. I've heard the souffle is good here, she says. We'll have two of those, I say to the waiter. He nods, takes our finished plates from our table, and leaves. Do you have a scuba diving trip planned soon? Cindy asks. I nod. I'm going to Hawaii next month. It's actually for work, but I'm hoping to get in at least one day of scuba diving. It's nice that you can travel to tropical destinations in the name of work, she says. That was always my goal growing up, to work in an industry that allowed me to travel. It helps that my luxury yachts are something people want in Hawaii, especially for island hopping. I get that, she says. There's something about traveling. You must do some traveling for marine biology. A little. Right now, I'm still paying my dues in the industry, remember? But hopefully soon, she says, that faraway look back in her eyes for a moment before she shakes her head. 
Our desserts come and we fall back into easy conversation. I'm not ready to say goodbye at the end of our dessert. How much time do you have? I ask when we leave the restaurant. Cindy glances at her watch. Not very long. My next tour is in 30 minutes, and it will take me 20 to get back to work. I nod at the news, though I'm disappointed. I want to spend more time with Cindy. Where did you park? I'll walk you to your car. Oh, you don't have to do. I want to, I say, taking her hand in mine. Lead the way. Chapter 7 Cindy The rest of the day is a complete blur for me. Thankfully, I can drive to work on autopilot. The tours I give for the rest of the afternoon fly by. Every time I think of Alex holding my hand, I grin. Warm tingles spread through me, and I feel like I'm floating, like I'm weightless. I finish the last tour, then grab a quick bite to eat. Tonight, I'm cleaning the Vista Point building, but I'm not on Alex's floor. I wiggle my teeth between my lips, wondering if he will be working late tonight. I let out a happy sigh. I won't know because I can't access his floor on a random night. My badge would be flagged. I don't even know what his car looks like. I should find that out. I make my way to the sixth floor. The time flies by. I'm dancing and singing to all my favorite Broadway tunes with more gusto and energy than usual. A thrill goes through me that today was such a great day. My phone buzzes in my pocket. I pull it out and see Alex's name on my screen. I wish lunch breaks were longer. I smile, typing back a reply. Such a pain when work gets in the way of life. My feelings exactly. What are you doing tonight? A few dance routines. I add a few dancing emojis and then add a vacuum next to it. You're working tonight? I haven't seen you here. Which floor are you on? My heart does a little flip and my breath catches. Was he really looking for me? We spent a long lunch together, and he's still looking for me. I'm not the only one affected. I'm feeling all sorts of happy bubbles in my stomach. I'm on the sixth floor. I see the three dots appear and disappear a couple of times, but a text doesn't come through. I'm slightly disappointed as I pocket my phone again. I have to finish my work. I can't just stand here staring at my phone waiting for a reply. I turn up my music and go back to dancing with the vacuum. I barely get through one song before the music stops, and my phone announces that I have a call from Alex. I pull the phone out of my pocket to answer the call. The door is locked, Alex says when I answer. Which door? I ask. I didn't bring a key card for your floors today. I meant the sixth floor, he says. I turn to see him waving through the glass doors into the offices where I am. I unlock the door. What are you doing here? I wanted to see you, he says. His hair is slightly mussed, but in a styled way. This afternoon during lunch he was in slacks and a collared shirt, but now he's in dark jeans and a blue t-shirt that matches the exact shade of his eyes. He can rock both looks, but I like the way his almost too small shirt clings to the muscles underneath. I've seen his biceps before, but now there is a hint of his very defined broad chest and shoulders. I'm working, I say, but happiness wraps all around me. Need a coffee break? I have espresso. He grins at me. I can't tell if it's my company you like, or if you're just really addicted to your caffeine. I give him a saucy smile. He laughs. Maybe it's both. I wish I could. It's one thing to take a break when I'm next to your break room, but I can't leave the floor I'm on. With your floors I have three days to get all of the work done, but here I only get one evening to finish the entire floor. He blows out a breath turning his baby blues on me, and I swear if he asks me again I will probably break my resolve. Sleep is overrated anyway, right? I could bring it down here. I press my lips together in a line, feeling my resolve slip. Yes, but where would we drink it? Next to the elevators? Because I technically can't let you into these offices. I have a very strict code of conduct. And I couldn't break it. 
not even for Mr. Blue Eyes. When do you clean floors 9 through 11 again, he asks, mirth dancing in his eyes. Not until the weekend, I say, hoping I see him before the weekend. I don't admit that fact aloud. This thing between me and Alex is exciting, but it's so new, I'm not sure how to navigate it. Alex sighs. That's too long. How about lunch tomorrow? Lunch again? I'm not complaining. He raises an eyebrow. You do like eating every day, right? I do. And I like eating it more when I'm in his company. My mind keeps reeling to the possibility of getting caught talking to him through the office doors. I chew on my lip. Lunch sounds great. When do you finish working tonight, he asks. Well, I was supposed to be done at 11, but this guy keeps showing up and distracting me. I bump his shoulder slightly with my own to show I'm teasing. You mean like a super handsome guy? His eyes sparkle, and I'm so close to forgetting the rest of my cleaning for the night. More like a super used to getting his own way but it's adorable, kind of guy. I'll take that, but I swear I'm not normally so stalkerish. I just bring out that vibe in you, huh? You must, he says, giving me a crooked boyish smile that makes my knees go a little weak. I'm flattered? You should be. I don't hunt down every beautiful cleaning lady that throws herself at me. You know that many? I place a hand on my hip and raise an eyebrow. You'd be surprised. I laugh. I suppose lunch with such a guy tomorrow would be fabulous. As long as I can get in all of my work by tomorrow. So far, it's not looking promising. He smiles at me. Don't let me keep you. I'll see you tomorrow. Good night, cleaning lady. Good night, super handsome distraction. Text me when you're leaving. If it's not too late, I say. It won't be too late, he says, then waves before getting on the elevator. I press my lips together, but I can't stop the grin that spreads across my face. Tingles bounce around me, and I'm floating. Time speeds by. I don't even need the dancing or the singing to make my job go faster. I keep thinking that if I finish soon, I will text Alex, and maybe we'll talk more tonight. In my head the entire thing sounds like a junior high crush. I'm getting excited because the boy I like showed up at my work, even though it's technically the same place where he works too. It shouldn't be this big of a deal. But as Hannah and even all my sorority sisters can attest to, I'm not great when it comes to dating. Sure, I go on dates. Occasionally. But these days, almost every waking hour is consumed with some type of work. But with Alex on my mind, I'm spending a lot less time thinking about work, even while I'm still working. The moment I step out of the elevator and put my vacuum away, I text Alex. I'm leaving. It's late, and I don't expect a reply. Three bubbles appear almost immediately, and a fluttering fills my stomach. Has he really waited up for me to say goodnight? No, you're not. Yes, I am. You're not driving away yet. Of course not. I wouldn't be texting if I was already driving. I walk out of the building into the parking garage. My car is not the only one in the parking lot. There's a steel gray car next to mine, and Alex is leaning up against the passenger door. I quicken my pace, surprised to see him still here when it's well after midnight. What are you still doing here? I ask. I figured you'd be done soon. You waited for me? I told him I'd likely be done at 11, but I'd underestimated the time by over 90 minutes. He takes a step toward me. Of course. I wanted to make sure that you got to your car safely. That's, sweet of you, I say, tucking my hair behind my ear self-consciously. I unlock the car with the fob, and he reaches for the door handle before I have the chance, opening my door for me. I swallow. Thanks. Those tingles are back all over my arms, shooting up to the spot on my neck just behind my ear. <laughs> A gentleman. It's my pleasure, he says. I smile at that. Who uses phrases like, it's my pleasure? No one, except Alex. I'm sorry you stayed late for me. Don't be. I'm not, he says. 
Are you working late on Friday? I nod. What a coincidence. I'm working late that night too. I laugh. I imagine your boss will make you work late, especially when you're taking such long lunches. Sounds like a win from both perspectives, he says. He looks as if he wants to say more, but instead he gestures to the car and says, your carriage awaits. I get into my car and look back up at him, his blue eyes making my knees go weak. It's a good thing I'm already sitting. He calls me before I leave the parking lot, and we talk the entire way home. He gives the excuse that he wants to make sure I get home safely, since it's so late, but I've driven home later than this before. At this time of night there are only a few cars on the road, and traffic is non-existent. It's not until I'm about to fall asleep in my bed that we finally hang up the phone. I'm still grinning, and my cheeks are starting to hurt because of it. I couldn't be happier. Chapter 8 Cindy I don't think I've ever seen you this happy to walk into this hotel before, Hannah says to me as we make our way through the hotel's lobby. We head toward the familiar Magnolia conference room that we've used for a few of our sorority reunions. I'm happy to be here, I say, though I'm thinking of Alex and not where I'm at right now. I've seen him every day for the last week. We've done so many different things on our lunch breaks, and he's been working late at the office every single night I've worked. We walk down the hallway leading toward the conference room wing of the hotel. The jewel-toned floral carpet is so thick beneath my sandals, I feel like I'm walking on a soft cloud. Chandeliers sparkle above us. With mirrors strategically displayed on walls reflecting light down the hallway, the wide hallway feels bright and cheery. There's a bounce in my step, an excitement for being here. Hannah looks at me skeptically. Yeah, I'm not really buying it. What's going on? I just grin. Nothing is going to get me down. I feel on top of the world, and nothing and nobody is going to change that right now. Maybe Tasha will take my request to feature the otters on her Instagram seriously this time. Hannah looks at me like I've just grown three heads. You're not actually going to ask her again, are you? I shrug. Why not? She's got a big following, and the MEWCS Center could use the publicity. Why not? Because she rakes people over the coals for favors like that. That's why not. I know Tasha and I are not the best of friends, but she is still a sorority sister. And our sorority motto is, stay connected and help each other. Hannah rolls her eyes. I know you think that, and you always give people the benefit of the doubt. But this is Tasha we're talking about. I'm pretty sure she still holds something against both of us. I wave away the comment. I'm sticking to the idea that Tasha is going to help me. I tried to get her to feature my shop. Hannah stops in the middle of the hallway and makes a face. It's not worth it. I keep smiling. You're probably right, but that's not going to get me down tonight. Hannah grabs onto my shoulders, stopping me from walking any further. Okay, seriously what is with you? Then her eyes widen. Wait, it's that guy, isn't it? I give her a slight nod, and she squeals loudly. Oh I knew it, I just knew it. You had stars in your eyes last week. But how come you didn't give me a heads up? I chew on my lip. I wasn't purposefully trying not to give you details. We've just been spending so much time together, and when we're not together, we've been calling or texting. Hannah tugs on my hands. Cindy. You've got to give me details. You can't just say you've been spending all this time with him and then not tell me about it. I lift my shoulder in a little shrug. It's not a big deal. We go out to lunch, or walk along the boardwalk, and when I'm cleaning the floors where his company doesn't work, he waits for me by my car, just to open my door for me. I smile at that revelation. He is thoughtful and considerate, and butterflies explode in my stomach just thinking about him. I didn't think Hannah could open her eyes any wider, but I was wrong. Girl, you've got yourself a keeper. But now the only question I have for you. When are we doubling? I laugh. He really is a keeper. Hannah squeals, grabs my hands, and jumps up and down like we're in college talking about boys. Come on, girls. The party is about to start, 
Melissa interrupts our jumping and squealing in the hallway. She puts her arms around both of our shoulders and walks between me and Hannah as we make our entrance into the Magnolia conference room, with a little more grace than our regression to teenage Twitter patient. Our sorority reunions are always themed and the planning and execution of each reunion belongs to a different committee each time. It's something the Instagirls came up with. There's five of them from our sorority, all influencers now. Everything they do is over the top. It can get a little much sometimes, but I have to admit, they know how to make things fun. I don't think I fully appreciated that in college. I was the classic bookworm, studying way more than socializing. I'm trying to have a better balance in my life now, and these reunions, while they still have their challenges with a few of my sisters, are a good way to keep in touch. Megan is already at the mic, thanking everyone for coming. She announces the program like we're having an official meeting. We all say the sorority pledge and soon the waiters bring out the food which we ordered ahead of time. The Instagirls don't like the idea of buffets, so food is decided in advance, which is why a seating chart is always essential. As luck would have it, Tasha and Tiffany are at our table. I had a feeling that would happen. The rotations are fairly predictable. Tasha and Tiffany talk to each other, while Hannah and I do the same. I know I want to ask Tasha about her featuring the conservation ideas I have, but at the beginning of the night is not the best time to bring it up. I was so confident before we walked into this room. But now, I'm remembering all the times I've felt like an outsider, not really belonging, but desperately wishing I was included. I have friends, I do. But a rush of all those old memories come back, and I wonder why I was so excited to come here tonight. My phone dings with a text message notification. I quickly put my phone on silent, and then check my messages. I can't hide my grin when I see the message from Alex. When is your break tonight? I'll have espresso waiting. I don't start until late tonight. I have a sorority reunion tonight, remember? I thought your sorority get-together was during lunch. Just the prepping for it. A real lion's den then? I snort laugh at that, then cover my mouth. Something like that. I'll catch up with you later then. Have fun. I'll do my best. Then you'll have a great time. Thanks. Can't wait to see you. I am basically melting over his sweetness, but I managed to type out one last text message. Same here. He's really so great for you, Hannah whispers. I grin. Thanks. It's been so nice. I look up from my phone to see Tasha and Tiffany staring at me from across the table. I smile and put my phone away. Someone has it bad, Tiffany says. What? I ask. You are making eyes at your phone, Tasha says. Her voice is commanding and authoritative. It's a guy, isn't it? A protective part of me doesn't want to say anything. Hannah knows about Alex, but it's too new for me to share anything that might be brought up at our next reunion. And thanks to a few sponsorships from one of the Instagirls, we have two more coming up this summer, for one of her features. Just trying to coordinate a few things, I say. At the same time, Hannah says, it's her boyfriend. My eyes widen as I turn to Hannah. I give her a death stare but it's clear she's trying to get a step up over Tasha and Tiffany, and Alex is the way she's doing that. Just great. Tasha's eyes raise. Oh, has our little Cindy finally grown up? A boyfriend sounds serious. Her bright pink manicured nails drum the table. Do tell us everything. Tiffany nods next to her. Suddenly, I'm feeling very shy. After all, bringing me espresso on a night shift cleaning break doesn't sound that romantic when you stack it next to an influencer's life. We're still figuring things out between us, I say, wishing Hannah had kept her mouth shut. Tasha smirks, nodding like she knew that was the case. That sounds about right. Hannah seems to sense my discomfort in the whole situation. What she means is she doesn't want to brag about how good things are for her right now, considering that you just announced that you broke up with your boyfriend. I blink at Hannah. How did she know that about Tasha? Tasha straightens, her eyes narrowing. Technically it's been a couple of months, but I already had all of my posts scheduled, 
so I didn't officially announce it when it happened. She clears her throat. But we weren't talking about me. We were talking about Cindy. So where did you meet him? Work, I say. It's technically true, though we don't work at the same company. An office romance. How, quaint. Does he volunteer at the conservation center too? Her voice drips with the pleasantries, but I can sense her sarcasm. Before I can respond and explain that I actually work there, not just volunteer, Hannah starts talking, seeming to take being the role of my bodyguard seriously today. He's actually in charge of Tranquilla Yachts. Cindy goes to lunch with him every day. They've made it their thing to eat at all the restaurants on the pier. Tasha's eyes widen. Well. Isn't that a turn of events? Our little Cindy has something to contribute. Her grin stretches wide, reminding me of a cat waiting to pounce. You'll have to connect us to him and maybe we can have one of our reunions on a yacht. That would bring in some major sponsors, I'm sure, and be good for his business too. A win-win situation. Despite what Hannah has just told our table, my connection to Alex is not so strong that I can just commit to these kinds of things. I have no idea how Alex would take this. Maybe, I'm not really sure I can answer for him about this. I thought you said he was high up in the company, Tasha said, drawing out her words. He's the CEO. It's Alexander Prince, Hannah says. You're definitely moving up in the world, Tasha says. I want to kick Hannah under the table. Is she drunk? I didn't want to give out his name, especially not to Tasha. It's not like that, I say. Why don't you tell us how life in the virtual world? I mean, as an influencer is going for you, Hannah says to Tasha, clearly trying to change the conversation to Tasha's favorite subject, herself. Tasha's smile doesn't seem as full as it was before, but it could just be the disco lighting. It's a rough job with sponsors constantly knocking down my doors. I've been so busy with all sorts of things. Sounds fun, I say. Hopefully you'll have room for a feature on the MEWCS Center soon? She waves a dismissive hand in the air. I told you I can't always do favors. I'm getting paid a lot of money to sponsor things. I can't do charity work all the time. Hannah crosses her arms. Just how much does one post really cost you? It takes you 30 seconds to write something and click a post book. Tasha laughs. I know you think it's easy, but it takes a lot of work. She turns her full attention to me, her face brightening into a smile that looks too happy to be genuine. How about you work on your boyfriend and his yachts, and I'll see what I can do about posting about your little fundraisers. I can ask him, but I can't make any promises on his behalf, I say, feeling that warning from Hannah earlier. Why did I even care about Tasha mentioning it? Yes, it would help out the effort the MEWCS Center is trying to make, but it's not like it's going to help me get my promotion any sooner. I shouldn't care. But there were so many late nights where, against my better judgment, I helped Tasha with her homework, and by help, I mean practically do it while she filed her nails. I thought I was being a good friend. And she constantly was telling me that if there was anything she could ever do in the future to help me, to let her know. I guess I thought she was sincere about those promises. And part of me wants to hope she'll remember those moments. But so far, I must admit Hannah is right. And I'm not sure why it's taken me so long to see it. Well, see what he says, and then we can discuss things, Tasha says with that too perfect white smile of hers. Tiffany smiles and the gesture always seems more genuine. Like she isn't trying to force her face into an unnatural position. I can put it on my feed. It's not as big as Tasha's, but I don't mind spreading the word about it. I have a decent local following. Tasha glares at Tiffany, but Tiffany doesn't seem to notice. Tiffany has posted for me a couple of times before, and I'm always so grateful. Thanks, Tiff. That would be great. After dinner, we mingle a little more, several groups clumping together. Tiffany brings over the other three women who run major Instagram pages, and says, Cindy, these sisters have decided to also feature you and the MEWCS Center. They're all talking at once, telling me all the things they need from me, and asking me a dozen questions. 
one asks about the foundation that's going to be officially announced at the end of the month, and says they'd love to do a feature around that too. All in all, I feel the support of my sisters, and I'm grateful for it, even if I can't win Tasha's approval. The evening goes later than expected, and though I'm having a good time, I know I need to leave soon. I was supposed to work tonight, and now it looks like that won't happen, so I need to be up early so I can get in a few hours of cleaning before I take the Saturday afternoon shift at the MEWCS Center. Despite my original hesitation to coming to my sorority reunion, I was able to get the support of four amazing women who are all going to push some of our upcoming summer events at the center, and I couldn't be happier about that. I text Alex that I won't be able to make it in tonight, hoping he was able to at least be productive while he waited for me not to show. He responds back that he understands, and he is going to be out with customers tomorrow. My heart sinks a little that I missed the opportunity to see him today and tomorrow. But it will be okay. Monday is only a couple of days away. Chapter 9 Alex I meet with clients on Saturday morning. It's a beautiful day, and the harbor is bustling with people. A few prospective buyers want a tour of the yacht and then we head out on the ocean for a few hours. It's an excursion we provide as a company. I don't always make an appearance for them, but today I felt in the mood to be on the water. We take the yacht up to cruising speed, showing off the acceleration and ease of maneuvering. My sales team does an amazing job with customers, and I just provide a little extra information. Once the tour is complete, we head back to the marina. The couple who are looking for their own ship and one for their son meet with Cade to go over the final details. I don't want to hover. It's not my style, and I find deals go smoother when there are less employees than there are customers. It's something about not intimidating them. I meander along the marina, and before long I'm down on a beach not too far from the MEWCS center. I see a group ahead of me gathered around the tide pools, and my heart leaps when I see Cindy's signature ponytail, keeping her curled hair away from her face. She's wearing her work uniform for the MEWCS center, a navy polo, khaki capris, and her bright blue sunglasses. Even from here I admire her figure. She talks with someone, then throws her head back and laughs. I can hear her laugh from here and the sound is music to my ears. As I approach, we make eye contact, and she stops talking to the group. She comes toward me, a worried expression on her lips. What's up? Remember, I can't do lunch today, she says. I know. I'm just, what was I going to say? I glance toward the group. I was just here to join your tour group. Sorry I'm late. She purses her lips. You're here for a tour? Yes. I'm all confidence. I want to spend time with her. You want to learn about how to conserve the ocean by using recycled paper and write an essay on it. Yes. I say a little uncertainly. She holds in her grin, but I know she wants to laugh at me. Well, that's too bad. That tour started a couple of hours ago, and Harry was leading it. I'm just giving a tide pool tour while the tide is low. I'll let Harry know you'll be at his next lecture though. She smiles and then turns back to her group when a woman asks her a question about identifying barnacles. I take a few steps closer to the group. If it was a private tour, she would have told me, wouldn't she? When I stand next to an older couple, Cindy acknowledges me and introduces me to the rest of the group, rattling off their names. Cindy answers questions and helps others locate mussels and barnacles in the tide pools. This goes on for a good 20 minutes. Having fun yet? She asks me. Yes. She puts a hand on her hip and gives me a saucy grin. That wasn't very convincing. There doesn't seem to be a great variety, I say, looking at the different tide pools. That's because you haven't been to the other classes yet. There are a lot of cool things down there. I'll show you. Cindy uses the end of a long stick to disturb the water just a little in one of the tide pools. Everyone watches. I see movement all over now. 
Creatures hidden in plain sight are now so easy to see I can't believe I missed them before. It's like the first time I was able to make a 3D picture appear in one of those optical illusion books as a kid. I had stared at each page for hours, and all I had seen were dots of color. And then, all of a sudden, the picture popped out at me. What had been just varying shades of blues and grays altogether had turned into a large blue whale with a baby whale next to it. Then I couldn't unsee it. It was always there. Look at that, I say, pointing to a starfish now uncovered from the sand. She's smiling at my discovery. You've spent time in the Great Barrier Reef, and the first thing you get excited about here is a starfish in a tide pool? I guess when you put it that way, it isn't that great, I say. She shakes her head. No. I love that. The ocean brings in so many different things. I want people to be excited over what they see. Then she informs everyone that the group will meet again at low tide next week. She gives the approximate time of next week, and I make a mental note to be here early. Most of the tour is dispersing along the rocks. Some still hang around, and Cindy takes time with each one of them, answering questions and laughing about something that happened before I arrived. She glances my way a few times, and each time she smiles at me, then focuses back on her tour. I'm not trying to make her nervous while she has a job to do, but it's nice to know I can affect her a little. I pretend to find something interesting in a small tide pool next to us and crouch down to examine the empty water. I know it's not empty, Cindy made that clear in her demonstration with the stick. An older couple come up to us and the woman pats Cindy's hand. Your dad would be proud of the way you're helping here, the woman says. Cindy's eyes brim with tears as the woman pulls her into a hug. I focus back on the tide pool, not wanting to intrude on this moment. The woman's voice is too soft for me to pick up everything she's saying to Cindy, but it's clear this woman isn't a casual member of the tour group. And who is your friend, the woman asks in a voice that I can hear perfectly well. Oh, this is Alex she says without any other explanation. I dust my hands off and stand. Alex, this is Dora and Emmett. They worked with my dad. Her voice breaks on the last note. I extend my hands to both of them. So nice to meet you, I say. Dora beams at me. Well, Cindy. It looks like this boyfriend of yours is much better than the last one. Oh, he's not. We're not, Cindy's cheeks are red, and she's cute when she's flustered. Dora doesn't seem to notice, and I hold back a laugh. I was just telling Emmett the other day, we needed to make sure you had a date to the gala. Didn't I, Emmett? I don't remember. You always say she needs a date, Emmett says. You have to remember, dear, Dora says, now patting her husband's arm. When was it? It was just the other day. Yes, I remember. We were with the Harcourts, talking about our dearest Cindy. We were talking about the guest list for the gala, Emmett interjected. We were talking about Cindy. The guest list just sparked the conversation, Dora corrected. The Harcourts think they have a neighbor who has a grandson who might not be engaged to that horrible woman anymore. And I wasn't sure he would make a good match for our Cindy but the Harcourts agreed with us that our Cindy must have a date to the gala. And we've noticed so far, your name has two tickets down and no name for that second ticket. Dora smiles at me. But now that we've met Alex, maybe we don't have to go with the Spencer's grandson after all. There isn't a rule that says I have to fill in the name on the guest list, Cindy says. That's why it's a plus one ticket. She looks at me apologetically. Dora shakes her head. Cindy, have you asked him to come with you? She purses her lips. I hadn't broached the subject yet. So, you're planning on coming alone? Dora asks, looking between me and Cindy. Cindy looks to me, trying to read me. I want to say something, let her know I want to come, that I'm willing to save her from this moment, but I wait to see what she wants. She smiles. 
I was planning on asking him to the gala. But now he's going to think the only reason I'm asking him is because you're insisting on it. Dora's eyes widen. Oh. Oh. Well. I, of course, don't want to spoil that. Alex, forget this entire conversation and be completely surprised when you get an invitation to the most exclusive gala of the summer. I lean toward Dora conspiratorially. You've got it. I turn back to Cindy expectantly. Are you going to ask me to the gala? She pushes against my shoulder slightly. With an audience? No. Dora pulls on her husband's arm. Come on, Emmett. Our work here is finished. No need to meddle where no meddling is needed. We'll see you next week, Cindy. I'll be here, she says. So will I, I say. The comment earns me a grin from Dora and wide eyes from Cindy. You don't have to come back, she says. Dora makes is her personal quest to meddle as often as she can. I can see that, I say. Oh, you haven't seen anything yet. This was her mild, subtle way of matchmaking. This was her being subtle. I laugh. I don't think there's a subtle bone in her body. Oh, it can be much more intrusive. You'll see. Want to tell me about it over lunch? Lunch, she repeats. That meal people have in the middle of the day, somewhere between breakfast and dinner. Okay, she says. Let's do lunch. You don't have anywhere to be. I'm a little surprised it was so easy to convince her. I should be okay for a little while. How about we ride bikes on the boardwalk on the way? I know she's working tonight, but I'll take whatever time I can with her. That sounds like a great idea. Chapter 10 Cindy I need to apologize, I say to Alex. We're seated outside on the pier, waiting for the Mexican food we've ordered. Alex's blue eyes lock on mine. I don't think you do. Dora can be kind of, presumptuous. She's like a great aunt in my life. Almost like a second mom. He smiles. You don't have to apologize, for you or her. I thought she was very sweet. She is definitely sweet, but she's also really pushy. Alex leans forward on the table. So, when is this gala we're going to? I haven't asked you to any gala, I say, being coy. Yes, but you said you were going to, he says. I never said that to you, I said that to Dora. I was next to you, Cindy. It counts. I bite my lip. I do want him to come with me. But the reality is, I'm also scared to ask him. This is the first time in a long time I've liked someone this much, and I don't want it to be weird between us. I don't normally ask guys out on dates, but that's not my biggest hang-up. I care for Alex but inviting him into that circle is, hard. I've only shared a few things about my dad, and this gala is about my dad and the new foundation. It's a beautiful gift after the absolute awfulness of how he died, but the emotions make me vulnerable. I'm usually so brave. Dad always said sharks can smell the fear before they can smell the blood. But bringing someone to the gala brings them into that water, into my entire past and my hurt. And I realize so often how much that pain is still with me every day. Cindy? His voice is quiet, his eyes searching my face, missing nothing. I won't come with you if you don't want me there. The wind is taken from my sails. Can this man read me? I don't want him to get the wrong idea. My hesitation has nothing to do with how I feel about him. It's only about how to cope with mixing these two pieces of me. I would like you to come, but no pressure. Don't feel like you have to be there because Dora basically pushed it on you. If I don't come with you, she's going to get her friend's grandson to be your date, and that's not an idea I like. I laugh. I'm sure he's not that bad. He raises both eyebrows at me. Well hopefully I can jump up at least a few points on the scale from a not that bad. I shrug but inside my heart is doing a cartwheel. It's in a couple of weeks. I give him the exact date. He smiles. 
I'm looking forward to it. I swallow. Thanks. I'll give you all the details later. It's not a big deal. I wave my hand in the air as if this isn't an important gala, as if I do these kinds of things all the time. I'm going to need to process all of this and get Hannah's help. We get our food and I start eating my burrito immediately. Our conversation turns to the view and to the ocean. I'm in the middle of chewing a rather large bite of food, in an effort to avoid going back to the gala conversation, when I hear my name and the clacking of heels down the pier. Cindy. Cindy. Oh, there you are. What a small world to run into you like this. I look up, and I swear if I wasn't chewing right now, my jaw would drop to the table like a codfish on a hook. Tasha. In all my years of knowing her, she's never once sought me out, or even acknowledged me without some sort of ulterior motive. I'm instantly on my guard. The rest of the restaurant is facing us, so I put on a smile that stretches my cheeks and hurts my temples. It's the only way I'll keep from scowling. It's the same smile I put on with my stepmom, every time I see her. Tasha, what a surprise to see you here. Isn't it a coincidence to run into you here? I was just in the neighborhood. She can somehow walk perfectly on a boardwalk with three-inch wedges and comes right up to our table. Her purple wedges match her purple tube top that manages to both show off her stomach and her cleavage at the same time. She pulls a chair from an empty table next to us and sits down between me and Alex. My eyes widen. Is Tasha really going to crash my date? Alex and I don't have the reading each other's minds down yet, but I'm trying to convey all the things about Tasha, and how sorry I am that this is happening right now. What are you doing here? I know for a fact she doesn't eat Mexican food. Ever. Well I've been walking along the beach all morning and was about to leave when I saw you and your boyfriend coming to this restaurant. I knew I had to come and say hi and introduce myself. I open my mouth to explain to Alex that I didn't set this up or the conversation with Dora, but Tasha cuts me off. She turns to Alex and puts out her freshly lacquered nails that have so many designs on each of her claws, I couldn't pick just one color to describe them. I'm Tasha from It Reels Tasha Life. She bats her eyelashes at Alex. Alex looks to me and mouths, what does that mean? I smile helplessly. I will explain everything after Tasha leaves, but right now I won't be able to say anything. Tasha continues to shake his hand. It's so nice to finally meet you. I'm sure Cindy has told you all about me. Uh. Alex looks to me for some sort of sign. I've only mentioned Hannah. Tasha looks to me and then back to Alex. Oh, I apologize. That's so awkward. Cindy and I are besties. She puts her arm around my shoulder, and it feels like she's going to leave marks with the nails. We go way back. Cindy promised she'd mention me. Cindy was raving about you and your yachts at our sorority night. She went on and on about how much she loves being on those very fancy boats of yours. Cindy came up with the idea that I should feature you and your beautiful boats by taking one out for the weekend. I have a really busy schedule, but I have some time that just opened up for next weekend. How about it? I open my mouth to speak, but no words come out. I'm in some serious shock at the way Tasha has maneuvered this conversation. I'm more embarrassed than when I knocked into Alex the first day I met him. Alex blinks. How about what? Her laugh sounds like it could break glass. How about you give me a tour of the newest boat you just launched, and I'll make it a success on social media. I'm very good with social media. I take care of all the likes and comments. I could make your business a success. Tasha scoots her chair closer to Alex, leaning in like they are the best of friends, and I'm the one crashing a date. It's enough to make me want to throw my food at her. I don't. Mostly because I'm not going to waste the food on her. The food doesn't deserve it. Alex smiles, but his eyes aren't sparkling the way they are when they look at me, and I straighten in my chair. He's not falling for her wiles, and I'm happy about that. I have a whole marketing department that handles my online presence. She pouts. Cindy said we could at least do our next sorority party aboard one of your boats. Will that work? 
I'm going to be running the next one, and I would love for a personal tour before we book one. She presses her shoulders closer to him and bats her eyes like she has a blinking disorder. Alex looks to me, and I try to shake my head. I had nothing to do with this. He clears his throat. I am sure I can arrange something for you. Well aren't you just so helpful, she says in a seductive voice. I have a booked schedule myself, but one of my associates can give you a tour of the yacht in the marina. We don't take people out for overnight tours on the yacht. She pouts a little more, but when it doesn't seem to be effective, she pulls out her phone. I'll be in touch. Selfie, she says, and before Alex is aware she's taken a picture of both of them together. Alex pulls away from her. Hey, Tasha, what day will you feature the Save the Otters in your posts? I ask. Okay, I know it's low. I'm not naive anymore. I know she has no plans to help. She'll run from my request, which will be great, because I'd like to get back to my date. Tasha turns to me, her eyes flashing. I'm not sure when I'm going to get your little Save the Dolphins in my posts. I'm pretty booked for months right now. At that, Alex says, you know, since you and Cindy are such good friends, I feel like that takes precedence over my yachts. Why don't you take the spot you were going to have my boats in, and put in the Save the Otters campaign? Alex is smiling at her like he's trying to be helpful, and I'm so happy in this moment. I can almost hear Hannah's voice in my head saying, take that, Tasha. Tasha glares, momentarily at a loss for words. Her smile stretches, and through gritted teeth she says, why didn't I think of that? What a great idea. So next week then? Alex asks. Tasha nods very slowly. I guess I have that one opening next week. That's great. Thanks, Tasha. I pick up my glass and take a drink of my agua fresca. I know you're so busy, but thank you for stopping by, Alex says. Tasha reluctantly stands, but as she puts on her sunglasses her attitude is back. I'm very busy. In fact, I've stayed way too long here already. I have places to be. She hobbles down the pier in her high-platform wedges, and when she's out of sight I finally take a deep breath. She's a bestie of yours? Alex asks. It looks like he's holding in a laugh. I barely hold in my snort. Yeah, no. She's a sorority sister, but there's not much a sisterly in our relationship. I swear I didn't offer your yacht or anything. I know you didn't, he says, his voice full of confidence. How do you know? I'm genuinely curious. Because she said you were raving about being on my yacht. So? So, you've never actually seen it. Unless you had Kay take you out on an excursion I never heard of. He waggles his eyebrows back and forth. I snort laugh. Nope. Cade didn't give me a tour. Then she lied. I nod. And if she lied about knowing you'd been on my yacht, nothing she said was accurate. She didn't lie about everything. She is a big influencer. She has a lot of followers and a lot of sway on people. Maybe it would be great for your brand, I trail off, realizing maybe he did just miss an opportunity to get his name out there. Alex laughs and then shakes his head. I don't do business with people like her. But, maybe it would be a good. Cindy, even if I wasn't turned off by her approach in all of this, I still wouldn't take this opportunity. You wouldn't? No, I wouldn't. Her influence does not extend to my clients. My clients don't buy my yachts because someone on social media told them to. Most of my clients are a referral by word of mouth. The rest of them are looking at websites for comparisons or are coming directly to the marina. My company doesn't have to work with influencers to reach our target market. I just don't want my personal opinions about people to cloud your ability to make good business decisions. He covers my hand with his. You don't need to worry about that at all. Now tell me something. Were you ever good friends with her? I shake my head. Pretty sure she only tolerates me when she wants something. Hopefully she's over all the things she blames me for, but sometimes I wonder. What did you do? Spill her nail polish? I laugh at the image, then shake my head. 
I was voted in as homecoming queen while she was live streaming the event. It wasn't really my fault, but it made it look like her boyfriend dumped her to go out with me. At the time, she had 2.3 million followers, so it wasn't a quiet announcement. Her boyfriend and I never really went out. I helped him with his statistics assignments twice, and he bought me pizza because we were studying late. It was completely harmless, but no one else saw it that way. In retrospect, it's kind of ironic, because she's the one who asked me to help her boyfriend with his homework in the first place. I'm sorry. That doesn't seem fair. I laugh. Life is never fair though, is it? Mine hasn't been. He's quiet for a long moment. Your dad. I nod, wishing I could express to Alex that it's more than that. It was the biggest thing in my life that wasn't fair, and it's given me a host of other things that are also unfair. He seems to sense the moment has changed. He quickly pays the check, and he takes my hand as we walk to the sand. You've mentioned your dad a lot, but what about your mom? He squeezes my hand, giving me support. She died when I was really young. I have no real memories of her. So it was just you and your dad? I nod. Until he married Vicky. Sounds like there's a story there. Where would I even begin? There's too much and it's not really worth going into. It's complicated. The afternoon sun beats down on us. The beach feels overly crowded today, so we walk up the beach for a while. As we head toward the beautiful cliffs, there are less people. The wet sand is cool and squishy in between my toes, and we walk in the shallow water as the waves move back and forth in our path. What about you? I ask. What was family life like for you? He shrugs. There's not much to tell, he says. It was a pretty average family life. Sounds like there's a story there, I say, repeating his words. And it sounds like I'm not the only one who was avoiding the family topics. I grew up in a family business mentality. Let's just say the business usually took priority over the family. That sounds hard, I say. He nods. I basically rocked the metaphorical boat when I started my own company. I just wanted to do something myself, you know? I nod. I can respect that. We walk in silence for a little bit. I like the way my hand fits into his. I feel safe and heard. Soon the beautiful rock formations block our path, and we turn around, making our way back to where we started. What are you thinking about, he asks me. Sometime when I'm near the ocean, I don't have a lot of thoughts in my head. I'm just soaking in the sound of the waves. I sometimes think I can hear my dad's voice when I'm out here. I look at him and then laugh uncomfortably. That probably sounds strange. He shakes his head. Not strange at all. My dad and I used to walk along the beach together. The sound of the waves was always in the background. Sometimes when the waves were really loud, I had a hard time hearing him. Then the waves would stop roaring, and I would hear him again. I don't think I ever told him that I couldn't hear him sometimes. I look out at the sea, blinking into the wind. Now, I'm kind of glad I never told him I couldn't hear him because it's like he's still talking to me, but the waves are just drowning him out. He squeezes our entwined hands as we walk past children building sandcastles. Your dad sounds amazing, Alex says. He really was. I clear my throat, wanting to be open with him, but still struggling to get the words out. The Galadora was talking about, well, a portion of the evening is dedicated to honoring my dad. I wave my hand in the air. I don't want to make this a big deal. He's getting recognized, and I am giving the speech about him. His eyes widen. You didn't tell me you were speaking at the gala. Now I'm definitely coming. Do you know what you're going to say? My heart races. I don't want to be nervous about it. I'm not going to finish writing the speech yet. It's too much to think about. He nods, being a supportive strength to me as he squeezes my fingers between his again. I take it the gala is an evening event, he says. Yep. Dinner and dancing. That sort of thing. And at least one speech during the evening, he says, bumping his shoulder into mine playfully. I bite my lip. 
At least one speech, yes. So it's possible for you to get off work in the evenings? For some occasions. His face breaks into a grin. Great. Because I need a full day of yours. For what? You've showed me the tide pools and the beaches you love. I have something I want to show you. You're not going to tell me what it is? It's just where I would go and think when I was a kid. And it takes all day to get there? Sometimes. When can we go? I'm thinking of all my work and when I can finish it on other days. Does it have to be a weekend? With the gala coming up I'm not sure if I could miss another weekend. Even now, going to lunch and spending time with him is going to push my work later tonight. I know I should care more about the schedule, but when I'm with Alex, I don't notice the time. He shakes his head. Whenever works for you, I will clear my schedule. Then Monday is my easiest day next week. I could make Wednesday work too, but I just can't wait two extra days to see him again. It's a date on Monday then, he says. Pack a swimsuit and sunscreen. I'll take care of the rest. Chapter 11 Cindy Ah ha gig. I pull the phone away from my ear as Hannah's frustrated sound pierces my ear. It's okay, I say. It wasn't a big deal. I'm cleaning late, and though it would be nice to see Alex, I'm on a different floor tonight. And I have to stay focused because my buffer room tomorrow is already taken. Not a big deal. Not a big deal. Cindy. Tasha is literally snuggling up against your boyfriend in her too tight mini skirt at the restaurant while you're on a date with him. How is that not a big deal? I dust a table, bending down to make sure the dust is eradicated from the surface. He's not my boyfriend, I say, though the word instantly does something to my stomach. Though Alex and I have gotten close, we haven't defined our time together with the specific words boyfriend and girlfriend. But the idea of it sends tingles through my neck and arms. Sure, call it what you want to. But why was Tasha even there? She made some excuse that she just happened to run into us, but it was so weird. She was by herself, and you know that never happens. Well from the post on her social media, she's telling everyone that she's going on one of Alex's yachts for a month. I snort. Well, I'm sure if she wants to rent one, she could do that. But Alex told her he wouldn't be able to give her the tour. Smart guy. She might post about the MEWCS center though, so that's a positive, I say. Now it's Hannah's turn to snort. I admire your positivity, Cindy, I really do. But Tasha is not your friend. She doesn't have your best interest in mind. We may not have been besties, but... Yeah, yeah. I know what you're going to say, that you two are sorority sisters, and there's a motto. I know the motto, Cindy. I recited it every week, just like you. All I'm saying is, maybe it's time to let go of the idea that Tasha is going to help you. There are still plenty of other friends who genuinely care about you and want your projects to succeed. Just let her go and cut her off. I snort. Actually, what I was going to say is she just might this time. I take the dust rag I've been using and throw it into the bucket labeled, used rags. Tomorrow I'll launder all of them. Sometimes that's how I feel, like a used rag. I roll my neck to try and shake out the tension. Now is not the time for self-discovery. Now is the time for cleaning the bathrooms. Has a miracle happened? Hannah's voice is skeptical at best. Let's just say Alex can be very persuasive. I laugh and then tell her the whole story. I like Alex even more now, Hannah says. Me too, I admit. Well, if he can get Tasha to post for you, I will be very impressed. You know I'm right about Tasha, and about Alex, right? And seriously, if she doesn't follow through, you can cut her out of your life. I put up the small yellow sign in front of the women's restroom that says, Closed, Cleaning in Process, and enter with several cleaning bottles tucked under my arm. You know I'm not really going to be able to cut Tasha out, right? Why not? We're not in sorority anymore. She doesn't live across the hall from you. You don't have to see her every day. You don't owe her anything. 
I can't be mean to people, I say. You know that's not my style. But you can give yourself a boundary. You don't have to try so hard. You were always doing things for Tasha. Always. You'd clean her room and make her food. She didn't turn me in that night I broke curfew. I could have been kicked out if it wasn't for her. Besides, cleaning a room was easy for me and not for her. You didn't break curfew like the rest of us did. You legit lost your key in the grass and had to look for it. You came in two minutes late, not two hours late. You don't have to do penance for that anymore. She's not someone you have to still do things for. I'm not doing anything for her right now, I say. Just don't fall for her wanting to be friends so you'll clean her house again. It was one time before a party, I say, feeling my defenses rise. You come and help me when I'm stressed. I wanted her to be able to count on me. I spray cleaning solution on the mirror with more force than necessary and wipe the spots away. I come help you because we're friends. And the keyword here is help. I help you, and you are still working too. It should be reciprocal. If I remember right, Tasha sat on the couch staring at her phone while you cleaned for her. She had post deadlines. I can't help it that she does most of her work from her phone. Still, Cindy. You can see this is a pattern, right? And you don't have to put up with it. I spray the mirror again, and this time when I wipe the solution away and polish the surface, I take a good hard look at myself. I'm easily walked over. I know it. But I hate to admit it. Maybe you're right, I say, taking in the information and internalizing it. Maybe. I am right. And her crashing your date with Alex proves it. She's all about her. She didn't get a picture with you in it. She wanted to steal your guy and make you jealous. She did a pretty pathetic job if that was her plan, I say, laughing as I clean the final mirror. Well, let's make sure we keep it that way. I'll try to be better with boundaries with her. It's just hard because sometimes she really does act interested in the MEWCS center. It's like she just needs me to remind her that it's something she likes too. Hannah snorts again. Cindy, she will like and post and say things that bring her money. She cares about the sponsors, and what she can get out of it. If she's interested in something altruistic, she's got another motive. I don't believe that's always the case, I say. I may have been used by Tasha in the past, but I don't think she really knows what she's doing. I think she's maybe just used to being shallow. I know I can't change that, so I have to accept it. That's what you say about Vicky too. You don't have to take this kind of treatment from her either. I only see Vicky once a month. It's different than it used to be, I say. I'm actually going there tomorrow. Is Alex coming with you? Are you kidding? I definitely don't want to scare him off by introducing him to my mom. Stepmom, Hannah corrects. Stepmom, I repeat. I know she's my stepmom, but using the word step e when I was a teenager felt awkward to describe her as a stepmom. When I talk to her, I don't call her stepmom, or mom for that matter. She goes by Vicky. Want me to come with you? For moral support? Hannah asks. I'm happy to give her a piece of my mind. Hannah is sweet to offer, but the last time she came with me, she spoke too boldly, and Vicky was not happy. For several subsequent visits, she badmouthed Hannah and got after me for the kind of company I keep. She actually used the word company instead of friends. Thanks, but I'll be fine. The lunch is only scheduled for an hour. Vicky is very punctual about her appointments. And you don't think it's weird that a stepmom schedules time with her only child like that? Once a month for a Sunday lunch? I sigh. Yeah. It's a little unorthodox, but that's Vicky. If I can't change it, I can change how I approach it. Well call me after and let me know how it goes. If I don't hear from you, I'll send out a search party for you. I'll be fine. It's not that bad. I laugh. Gotta let you go. I'm about to clean six toilets, and I know how much you want to hear the constant flushing sound in your ear. Hard pass on that, Hannah says. Call me tomorrow. 
and I'm watching Tasha's posts like a hawk for you. You're the best, I say before hanging up and turning my attention to cleaning the porcelain thrones and the rest of the bathroom. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. I press the button at Vicky's gate. It takes her several minutes before she buzzes me in, making me wonder if I'm here on the wrong day. I park my car and walk up to the front door. The house is massive, much bigger than the one I grew up in. Vicky was a stand-in model for a TV show years ago, before she met my dad. She continued doing odd jobs in the modeling and acting realm sporadically when I was a teen. She was always pretending she was a big star, but I never saw the movies she claimed to be in. Then she randomly filled in for a major actress who'd broken her leg and couldn't finish a shoot a couple years ago. Nobody knew it was Vicky who was standing in for her, because the CGI is crazy good. But it saved the star's career, and the movie producer gave Vicky a ridiculous amount of money for supposedly keeping quiet about the whole thing. Vicky let it slip more than once that she was a star and that she was besties with the actress who now has her number on speed dial. The movie came out two years ago, and the day after it premiered she closed on her mansion. It came with a pool and a security system. She claimed that the paparazzi wouldn't leave her alone, but I'd seen her more than once try and get in those paparazzi shots when said actresses were the main focal point. She answers the door wearing her swimsuit and a pool wrap. She pushes her designer sunglasses to the top of her head and surveys me. Is it that time of the month already? I thought we just did this. I let my face smile, though I'm pained. It's never a convenient time when I come. I can come another day, I say. She opens the door. Might as well do it now, she says. I have a very busy schedule that can't be changed. I'm working on a movie all month long. I follow her in through the massive entryway. Did you have a good swim? I ask, trying to keep my voice light and cheery. She makes a guttural noise, like I've asked her if she drowns puppies. I don't have a pool so I can swim in it. I have a pool so I can lounge next to it. Hannah's words from yesterday come back to me, and I wonder why I try so hard. Then I see the picture of my dad and Vicky hanging on the wall. It was a wedding photo that I'm not in. There were others of me with them on that day of course, but the one that hangs prominently in Vicky's house is the one of just the two of them. I look at my dad's face, his happy smile and remember all the happy times I had with him. He loved me. And he also loved Vicky. And that's why I come. Because I'm sure my dad would want that. And I want him to be happy, even though I'm sure my actions don't change his emotions in heaven. And yet, it still feels like a connection point. She rings a bell, and out of nowhere pops her chef. I seriously wonder if they've practiced this for dramatic effect. It's not an intercom or an announcement or a phone call. She literally rings a silver bell, and he appeared. Sergey, I'm sorry I didn't tell you earlier, but Cindy is here for lunch today. Please prepare an extra plate for her. Don't trouble yourself with anything too fancy, it's not as if we have actual guests over. Sergey smiles at me with such warmth, I wonder how he likes working for Vicky. Not to worry, Mrs. Ellison. I had it on my calendar already. Would you like to eat indoors or out on the patio? Thanks, Sergey, I say, grateful that he makes seeing Vicky a little less painful. Out on the patio. I've just had the house cleaned. I press my lips together. It's not like I'm a messy toddler, she didn't even know me as a toddler. It's fine. I'd rather eat outside anyway. The house feels overbearing, but the landscaping by the pool is actually nice. Vicky walks out the door and sits in her chair where an umbrella shades her. I take a seat across from her, enjoying the sun. Sunscreen is part of my morning routine, and I pull out a sun hat from my bag to keep my scalp from burning. So what movie are you working on? I ask, trying to sound interested. She smiles, loving the attention. Oh, I can't say. It's all very hush-hush. So hush-hush. The fact that I even admitted to being in a movie that premieres next October is already too much information. I may have damaged my NDA by saying too much. I wouldn't want you to break your NDA, I say. 
Who'd have thought that I would get my big break so soon after all of that mess? All of that mess? She waves her hand in the air. You know what I mean. Yes, I do. She means when my dad died tragically and suddenly. I know she's probably still grieving, so I let the insensitive comment slide. It's clear she's been hurting too. I can be stronger than the pain for both of us, even if she sometimes says unfeeling things. Sergey brings out drinks. A tall, frosted glass for Vicky with olives and limes on the side. I can't imagine what combination she is drinking. Sergey brings me his famous raspberry lemonade. Thanks, Sergey, I say, hoping he knows I mean it. Is there anything else I can get you, Miss Ellison? Sergey looks in my direction. Before I can answer for myself, Vicky waves her hand in the air. That's all, Sergey. We'll take the food when you have it ready. He nods once at Vicky. Of course, Mrs. Ellison. I will bring them right out. He disappears back into the house. He comes back only a few minutes later after I've only had a few swallows of the delicious drink that makes my mouth pucker. My plate is full of cheeses, fruit, and crackers. I know this is the appetizer. Sergey is prompt, and Vicky has a schedule. He'll bring out the sandwiches in exactly 12 minutes. Vicky picks at a grape on her plate and pops it in her mouth. Did you remodel the bathroom? I ask, grasping for a topic. Vicky nods. The week after you were here last. I'd love to see it. It hasn't been cleaned this week. My cleaner went to visit her sick sister in the Midwest. I'm not going to remind Vicky what I do for a living, but I've seen gross bathrooms before, and it doesn't faze me. I don't mind a little dirt. Vicky's eyes bug out of her head. She removes her sunglasses to eye me so I get the full picture. Absolutely not. You will not see it in less than perfection. Remind me the week before you come next time, and I'll make sure it's clean. I nod and eat the crackers and cheese. As if sensing my discomfort, Sergey comes back refilling drinks and also bringing sandwiches three minutes early. I mouth thank you to him, not wanting him to get on Vicky's bad side because I'm talking with him. Vicky comments on her pool, the food, and her need for a massage and pedicure. None of the topics really require any kind of response from me, but I try to engage in the one-sided conversation she's having anyway. Finally there's a lull, and though I've mentioned it before, I decide to broach the subject of the gala one more time. Dad's getting an award and there's going to be a foundation in his name with scholarships for aspiring marine biologists. Your dad is dead. He's not getting an award. Her voice is cold and hard, just like it is every time I bring up my dad. I mean, he's not the one physically receiving it, but it's great that he is being recognized and remembered in such a special way. Vicky leans her head back, rubbing her temples. When your father passed away everything was taken from us. Everything. I was living in virtual poverty after the way the lawsuit went down. I wasn't trying to bring up bad memories, I say. We were both hurt the day my dad died in the accident. It was horrific, and Vicky isn't the only one still bitter about it. I'm bitter too. But when Vicky's bitter, I don't get to feel that emotion too, because it's only her bitterness that counts for anything. The thing is, we both have scars from that day. Somehow, I thought that it had bonded us together. But it didn't even come close to that. Then don't speak of it. It's a hard enough reminder to have you here. I don't want to talk about your father. I disagree with her every time she says that. But I bite my tongue instead of saying what's on my mind. I think talking would have been good for both of us. And yet, how often do I talk about my dad? I usually keep it to myself. The people who know about what happened, understand me. And then ones that don't know what happened surrounding my dad's death, won't understand unless I spill everything. And I haven't been willing to do that in a long time. I take a deep breath, focusing on my sandwich instead of speaking. I blink a little more rapidly than normal trying to make sure no tears escape. Vicky is not one for outward emotion, and I won't get any sympathy from her if I start crying. I swallow my food and my tears in one motion. You're still invited to come to the gala, if you want to. I force a smile. 
it might be fun. And it's still an honor for him to be recognized for his work. If movie stars aren't there, it's hardly my type of place. I nod. It isn't her type of place. She's not one to focus her energies on things like conservation and preserving the ocean. The closest she gets to the ocean is ordering calamari. Her phone rings, and she takes the call. She starts chatting away with the person on the other end of the line. I finish my sandwich and glance at my watch. I've been here for only 45 minutes, but my food is finished, and she's been on the phone for 5 minutes. It's fine. I'm fine. In some ways, the phone call is a blessing. I stand, and when I do she covers the phone with her hand. Are you leaving so soon? Can't you stay longer? Vicky asks in a voice that's so drippingly sweet, I know it's for the benefit of whoever is on the phone that she didn't put on mute. I should get going, but it was nice to see you. Thanks for lunch. Well, do stop by again next month and we can catch up again. I'll let you see yourself out. She puts her hand up to wave to me. I wave back and pick up my plates. She's not finished with her food, but thankfully she doesn't protest that I clear my own dishes. I'm about to open the door when Sergei opens it from the inside. Thanks, I say to him. You do not have to clear your own plates, Miss Ellison, Sergei says, trying to take the stack from my hand as I make my way to the kitchen. I know I don't. And you don't have to call me Miss Ellison, Sergei. I smile at him. He raises his eyebrows, his head nodding toward the pool. I do have to call you Miss Ellison, Miss Ellison. Not when Vicky isn't around. It's Cindy. And thanks for the lunch. It was delicious. Is there something special I can make you for next month? You'll be here at the same time? Same day and time. And anything you make is great. I don't have any requests. Sergei taps the side of his head with one finger. I'll be thinking of something delicious. You're wonderful, Sergei. I don't know how you do this every day. He shrugs. She's not so bad to work for. The pay is good. I'm glad she pays you well. It's good to see you, Miss A. Cindy, he says, and shows me out of the house. Chapter 12 Cindy Alex and I have been texting all weekend, but when his car pulls up to my house to pick me up on Monday morning, it feels like it's been weeks since I've seen him. His dark blue polo shirt is casual, along with his bleached white golfing shorts. Good morning. He greets me with a hug at my door, then takes my bag in one hand and holds my hand with the other. Good morning, or possibly still good night, I say, gesturing to the sky. The first rays of the morning light are still at least an hour away. I know I won't need it long, but I zip up my light hoodie over my green shirt. I'm wearing capris, but with the cool air, I almost wish I had yoga pants on. You're right, maybe a little early, but it already feels as if we might not make it in time. You're up for an adventure, right, Cindy? I love the way he says my name. And even if I wasn't up for an adventure, I'd be willing to do almost anything with him. I'm ready for it, I say. Though other than asking him a million questions of things I needed to bring yesterday, I wasn't able to get a good sense of anything. Swimsuit and sunscreen, yes. That only meant that we weren't likely going to be in an indoor pool. So that didn't narrow it down. Everything else was a, if you want to bring it, go for it, kind of attitude. If I didn't bring it, and I needed it, he said he'd be prepared. And I'm trusting him that he knows what he's doing. We make our way to the marina and he takes me past several luxurious sailboats. I admire each one when I notice his company's logo on each of them. You designed some impressive yachts. He turns to me, a slightly concerned look on his face. The yachts are impressive, and if you want, we can take one of those out, but I had something else in mind. I smile widely. I have no expectations. And I'm not trying to make some sort of influencer post about them. We can both laugh at how ridiculous Tasha's approach to the whole thing was now. He nods. Sometimes I prefer sailing to the yacht. And then he stops in front of the most majestic sailboat I've ever seen. 
There are a few other people on board, moving things around, checking ropes, and I realize this is a much bigger production than I realized. We're going sailing? If that works for you. I nod, feeling like a bobblehead doll. I've been at the beach almost every day for as long as I can remember, but since my dad died, it's been a lot harder to actually get out on the water. Welcome to the Mino. She's my personal sailboat. You named her Mino? I laugh at the ironic name. She's a huge vessel. He smiles. Compared to others, she's small for her class. But don't let her size fool you. She's a powerful beauty on the water. We load our bags, and Alex talks to a few of the crew. Alex scans the horizon. With any luck we'll still be able to make it out before the water is crowded. There's a perfect cove over on the other side of Catalina. It's my favorite place to go. The Mino has a crew in matching uniforms. They work efficiently, and soon we are leaving the marina. The ocean looks like glass as the sun hits it for the first time. We're already in the middle of the water as the golden sunshine sparkles on the translucent waves. I feel the rocking of the boat only for a moment. Then my sea legs take over, and I'm transported to all the other times I've done this. It feels natural. Normal. Alex and I help the crew for a little bit, but soon we are sailing smoothly toward the other side of Catalina Island. As the sun continues to rise, we sail around the island together. The crew does most of the work, but we help too. I breathe in the salty air that has been a comfort since I was a child. It's beautiful out here, I say, noting only a few other boats and yachts on the water in front of us. I couldn't agree more, he says, his voice so low that it causes something in me to reverberate. As we come up to cliffs, he points out various things on the island, telling me about what he used to think certain hills and mountains looked like when he was little. I laugh when he points out the one that used to look like an upside-down dinosaur with its mouth sideways. You have quite the imagination, I say. The day quickly grows warm, so I use one of the rooms downstairs to change. The room feels like a hotel suite, complete with its own private bathroom and shower. My duffel is already on the bed. I pull on my suit. The top is a mermaid green peplum tank I style. It's a flattering cut on me and goes well with the striped high-waisted bottoms. I grab my black wrap and tie it loosely around my waist. I'm not gone long, but I hear my name. Grabbing my bottle of sunscreen, I hurry back to the top deck. Is everything okay? I ask when I reach Alex. He smiles, puts his arm around my shoulder and turns me toward the starboard side of the sailboat. A pod of thirty dolphins are swimming, jumping out of the water, and making the sound of a toddler's squeak toy. Wow, I say, holding on to the railing. The dolphins jump out of the water. It's one of my favorite things about being on a sailboat, he says. You're closer to the water than you are on a yacht. It feels like I could almost touch them, I say. I wasn't planning an encounter that close, unless you want to go scuba diving, he says, his eyes studying my face. I didn't bring my gear, I say, my heart pounding. It's been a long time since I've gone diving. Would I be ready for it? I told you I packed everything we need. Just in case. He winks at me, and we go back to watching the pod. But no pressure. He doesn't push for an answer about diving, and I'm glad, because I'm not sure yet either. I don't know if I can muster up the courage to dive today. But I'm keeping the possibility open. We sit down on the deck, taking in the view. I uncap my sunscreen and slather my legs and arms. I've already put on sunscreen on my face, as it's always easier to do that with a mirror. I squirt more sunscreen into my hand and rub my shoulders. I attempt applying the sunscreen on my back by twisting my arms behind me. I feel like the human version of a pretzel, and it's clearly not effective in my battle against the sun. A low chuckle rumbles into existence next to me. I turn. What's so funny? You missed a spot, Alex says. I arch an eyebrow. Oh, I did? Where? Oh just the small spot between your shoulders, and also your whole back. Ha! <laughs> ha! I say, turning my back to him. Can you help me? 
he holds out his hand, and I squirt a generous amount of the coconut sunscreen on his palm. He covers my back evenly, with the protective lotion, but everywhere his fingers touch sends fire through all of my nerves. I remind myself to breathe. Tingles explode all over my back. I let my eyes drift closed while he puts the lotion on my skin in a circular motion. He puts his hands on my shoulders, rubbing my arms. All done. Thanks, I say. Will you return the favor? He grins at me. Of course. He pulls off his shirt in one swift motion. My heart rate speeds up, and I swallow hard. I try not to stare at his toned muscles. Instead, I expertly squeeze out a handful of sunscreen and put the entire amount on his back with both my hands. He jumps. That's cold. I laugh. It's sunscreen. It's supposed to be cold. I'm trying to hold it together, since it appears he's only affected by the temperature of the sunscreen. I, on the other hand, have a mental picture of finger painting to lighten the mood between us. I work the lotion into his back and his shoulders. Finally, I cover his neck and ears. Goosebumps appear on his shoulders and arms. So maybe he isn't as unaffected as I thought. I let my hands trail down his back again. I don't want any of his gorgeous skin to burn, so I add a little more sunscreen on for good measure. All done, I say, my fingers wishing I hadn't finished so quickly. We sit at the front of the minnow for a while before she gets close to the shore. A small cove surrounded by light sand and shallow water welcomes us forward. The crew drop the anchor. We have a couple of options to get to shore, Alex says. On the water or under the water. Snorkeling? Alex nods. I have the wetsuits ready if you're game. I nod, though part of me is a little sad that his glorious, completely sunscreened body is going to be hidden under a wetsuit. Snorkeling sounds great. Chapter 13 Alex After getting our wetsuits and snorkels on, Cindy and I jump in the ocean. The water temperature is frigid, but the wetsuits help. Snorkeling at Catalina is not the same as the Great Barrier Reef, not by a long shot. But the kelp forests are cool, and always hold a surprise. The kelp moves and sways with the waves like they're perpetually dancing, and though it's not the exotic underwater adventure that other places hold, this small cove is one of my favorite local places to go. The orange Garibaldi fish pop in and out of the kelp. I point a large one out to Cindy with underwater hand signals, and she shakes both of her hands, it almost likes like she's giving an underwater jazz hand routine. As we head closer toward the shore, we head into a shallower area. A few half-moon perch swim close by. Their silvery bodies seem to shimmer as they move through the ocean. The Garibaldi swim close to us, their orange bodies a contrast in the blue-green water. Cindy gestures that she's going down. I watch as she takes a breath and holds it before diving deeper. There's only maybe seven or eight feet to the bottom. She stays down for a few seconds and then heads back to the surface, blowing out her snorkel so she can breathe again. She does the same thing again, and this time I follow her, though I would prefer to be in my scuba gear. She points out a beautiful yellow senorita wrasse fish, hiding in the kelp forest. We repeat this process a couple times, returning to the surface to blow out the water. Then we hold our breath and dive again, getting closer to the shore each time. A large current comes, moving the kelp back and forth. Suddenly, Cindy screams underwater. At least that's kind of what it sounds like. She immediately heads for the surface, and I follow her. She comes up choking and gagging. I hold on to her arm and tread water, trying to keep her steady as she sputters. She's shaking and coughs a few more times. I help her readjust her mask. I thought you'd done this before, I say, putting my arm around her. Are you okay? Her eyes widen before she swats me on the arm. I know she's going to be okay. Did you see that huge lobster down there? Uh, no. It was under the kelp. I thought I saw a starfish, so I wanted to get a closer look. 
One minute the kelp was below me and the next, the kelp moved and the lobster was there. It was huge. It's a bottom dweller, Cindy. You're completely safe. She rolls her eyes, her voice sounding less frightened with her snorkel mask on. I know that. But it just scared me. That's all. The lobster is not going to get you. She shudders then coughs. I feel like I inhaled the whole ocean. If that were true, you'd be down at the bottom right now with the lobster. She laughs but it turns into a cough. You're seriously not helping this situation. Sorry. You have to admit, it's kind of funny. I mean it is. Minus the salt water down my throat. And I didn't see the starfish. Let's maybe take this way over here, I say. The reef is shallower over there, and it's unlikely we'll run into a lobster again where there's less kelp. I'm going to hold you to it. Let's enter the lobster-free zone. I put my mask and snorkel back on, and I lead the way to the far left. It's a little out from the cove, but I know exactly what I want to show Cindy. It only takes us a few minutes to reach the north side of this section of reef. On cue, Cindy tugs on my arm and gives me her jazz hand sign. I know she's smiling, even with the snorkel in her mouth. She's pointing below us at the dozen starfish that are clearly visible from this depth. I nod my understanding, but we're not quite where I want to show her yet. I point in the direction we need to go, and after a few more glances down at the starfish, she follows me. The hidden reef is a favorite spot of mine. It tucks against the island, and this time when we swim above the reef we aren't disappointed. There are easily seven or eight dozen starfish below us, all different sizes. Cindy gives the jazz hand sign again, but then she surfaces. I join her. She pulls off her mask, excitement bursting from her. Did you see all of those starfish? I nod. They are easier to spot than a lobster under the kelp. She pushes on my shoulder. I'm serious, this is the coolest spot ever. How have I never known about it? I shrug. It's a very well-kept secret. This is one of my favorite spots. It's fast becoming mine too, she says. She looks down in the water. I just can't believe it. Dad would have loved this. She smiles. There are too many to count. I'm over 50 right now, but I know I didn't count them all. 50 wishes. Wow. 50 wishes. What does that mean? She blushes. She's so cute when she does that. It's this thing I do with starfish. When I was younger, I asked my dad about starfish. It's such a strange thing, I mean, they don't even look like fish. Just like stars. My dad told me that shooting stars landed in the ocean and became starfish, so wishing on them was very good luck. Anytime we saw them in the ocean, we'd make a wish. It was kind of a tradition of sorts, to look for one each time we were out. And what do you wish for? I ask, curious about what she'll say. She shakes her head. With 50 wishes, it's basically all of my dreams coming true at the same time. I have this desire to make all of her dreams come true. But saying that aloud feels a little premature. Instead, I keep things light. I know the first thing you should wish for. What? A lobster-free rest of the day. I keep a straight face, pretending I'm completely serious. She laughs. Yeah, that's a total waste of a wish. You literally have more than 50. You probably have 80. You can't just wish on them without knowing how many there are. Looks like I better count some myself so I can make some wishes too. I stick my head back in the water, and when Cindy joins me I point to each starfish I'm counting. She minds that she's laughing at me. I get to 37 before she starts swimming back toward the cove. She's counting more starfish along the way. There are more fish swimming around now. 
We swim around the small point that separates the reef from the cove. The water becomes shallower, and we stand when we can no longer keep swimming. The white sand beach cove is surrounded by palm trees. The easiest way to get to this cove is from the water. No direct roads come to it on Catalina, so the cove is always devoid of other tourists. Ahead of us on the beach, two chairs are set up with a table in between. Towels are folded neatly on the chairs. It's all shaded by a large umbrella. Behind the presentation I know there's a cooler with the food, and a large bag to put our gear into. What's all this? She says when she notices that I'm not surprised by the sight in front of us. Lunch, I say. I figured we'd be hungry after snorkeling. She laughs. This is very swanky. Are you trying to impress me? I lift a shoulder. Maybe. Is it working? Yeah. It's definitely working. Even without the yacht? I like sailing. She says without missing a beat. I already knew that about her. And somehow that fit. I like that she hasn't been obsessed about the other boats I own. My yachts are impressive, but somehow the sailing felt more personal for our first excursion. We have to help each other out of our tight wet suits, and as I unzip the back of her suit, I can't help but notice the way the sunlight glistens off her wet, creamy skin. Her modest, yet form-fitting bathing suit becomes visible as she removes her wetsuit, and my heart starts to beat so loudly that I am concerned she may hear it on this secluded beach. She unzips my suit, and I peel the neoprene layer off me. We grab our towels and gently brush off the salty moisture that has gathered on our skin. I hang the wetsuits to dry on the raft, and we settle into our chairs. Our day bags are conveniently tucked under the table, out of the sun so we pull out sunglasses and Cindy takes out her hat. The small raft is on the sand, so I know that my crew is around here somewhere, but they're probably eating a little way away from us. I'm grateful for the privacy. I open the cooler and pull out the prepared lunches for us. I set them on the table and grab the drinks. Cindy suddenly shivers. There's another towel in the bag, if you need it, I say thinking that the slight breeze is making her cold. I'm good, I just had a vision of that lobster again. She shudders. Ugh. I may have nightmares about that one. Stay away from night dives. Sometimes those can bring out scary creatures too. Scarier than lobsters? She raises an eyebrow. Definitely not scarier. You were basically up against a water dragon with that thing below you. She laughs. You're totally mocking me. I hold up my hand with my index and thumb almost touching each other. Just a little bit. Okay, what did you see on your night dive that gave you nightmares? Now you have to tell me since you know my irrational fear of lobsters. It's not irrational. They have huge claws. Super big. I once saw an electric eel at night. Another time we were next to a barracuda. Those things are scary all the time but especially at night. Those both sound terrifying. I close my eyes, trying to dismiss the mental pictures. Yeah, they were definitely that. But probably the scariest one was when I was 15. I was with a bunch of my family for a night dive. I was looking at the reef and all of a sudden, a moray eel came out between two of the rocks. Its eyes caught the light from my hand flashlight and they glowed this eerie color. The blackness in the ocean at night is disconcerting. You always know that there are things swimming below you when you're diving, but with the blackness below it felt like there were all sorts of dangerous creatures in the shadows and below me waiting to eat me. You definitely win on the scary story. Believe me. It's not a contest. We eat our sandwiches and cut fruit. I bury my toes in sand as we watch the waves wash gently up on the beach. The sun is beating down on us, but it's bearable under the umbrella. We talk about all sorts of things while the waves create the background playlist for our conversation. 
It's a mesmerizing scene, especially being here with Cindy. This food is really good. Thank you, Cindy says, then finishes her last bite of her sandwich. She takes a long drink of the refreshing bottled water. I'm glad you like it. I wish I could take all of the credit for it, but I just had an idea about it. My crew helped with the rest. Well I couldn't wish for anything more. She puts her empty water bottle into the bag next to the table, and stretches out her long legs, letting her painted toes poke in and out of the white sand. It's really beautiful here. I divert my eyes from her gorgeous legs and stretch my feet toward the water's edge too. That's a big statement, especially when you have so many wishes stored up. 73. Yeah. That's a lot. What are you wishing for? She breathes in and out and spreads her hands wide. This is pretty much it. It's a perfect day. There has to be more. She moves her chair so she's in the sun instead of under the umbrella. I'm stuffed with good food and the view is breathtaking. The snorkeling was amazing, minus the lobster, and the company, she pauses. Her cheeks redden. The company is better than all of it. I scoot closer to her. I think you just gave me a compliment. Don't let it go to your head, she says. Don't worry, I won't. I grab her hand, pulling her up from her chair. Come on, I want to show you something. We grab our sandals from the bag, and I put our food containers back in the cooler to discourage unwanted birds from picking at the leftovers. We hike up to a lookout spot just above the beach. This part of the island is still deserted from tourists and from the point the view of the ocean is unobstructed to the horizon. Whoa, Cindy says, as she scrambles over some of the uneven rocks. I hold out my hand to her, not letting go when we reach more even ground. There is something about the feel of her hand in mine that just, fits. Thanks for your help, she says. You're welcome, I say, squeezing her fingers threaded through mine. We make it to the point, and I stop on the familiar spot of ground between the huge rocks. When I was younger, I used to come up here for hours at a time. I pretended I was guarding the island. This was the easiest place to keep a lookout. What were you protecting the island from? All sorts of invaders. Mostly pirates. They travel by sea, of course. She laughs. Of course. I can just see a mini version of you running around up here with your binoculars and toy sword. I laugh. That's not too far off. I point to the water next to some sharp cliffs. That's where I pretended the pirates made their camp. Their ship would be right about there. And how did they climb to their camp from there? Simple. There were secret passages in the cliffs, only accessible by walking the plank to them. Your pirates must have had very fancy footwork. I smile, soaking into the memories. They were the most skilled I could imagine as an eight-year-old. And where did the mermaids swim? She scans the horizon as if she's trying to guess. I assume if there are pirates, there also has to be mermaids. You've already seen both places. One was where we had lunch in the cove, but the other is the reef just down there, where all the starfish were. I should have known. I should have wished to see a mermaid. You'll know for next time, I say. She moves closer to me, leaning her head into my shoulder. Yes, I will. She puts her arms around my waist, and I breathe in the smell of her coconut pineapple sunscreen and feel the warmth of her skin against my shirtless torso. I tilt her chin toward me, my eyes seeking permission before I press my lips to hers. The kiss is slow at first, an exploration and a dance. It's testing out the waters, though I feel like I could stay here forever, I pull back and rest my forehead against hers. She catches her breath, then says, I guess that's one more wish that has come true today. I wrap my arms tighter around her. You were wishing for this? This? The hug? Don't get me wrong, I like that too. 
She lifts up on her toes and plants a very light kiss on the corner of my mouth that basically leaves me speechless. But it was the kiss that I was wishing for. Maybe we should go find a few more starfish, I say. She laughs then kisses the other side of my mouth, just at the corner. I don't think you need any more starfish. After hiking around the cliff for a little while longer we make our way back to the cove. The picnic has been cleaned up, along with our wetsuits. Looks like we're taking the raft back. You okay with that? Absolutely. It will be an adventure. She picks up the lone bag containing the rest of our stuff on the beach, and we load the raft left for us. It doesn't take us too long to paddle to the minnow. The crew has already packed everything up and is waiting for my signal to get ready to sail back to the mainland. Cindy turns to me. Thanks for an incredible day, she says. It's not over yet, I say. It's not. There's a hopeful gleam in her eyes that makes me smile. I was thinking I would take you to my favorite Italian restaurant tonight. It's a little bit far, but it's worth it. I'm game. I love Italian. I make the call and put in our reservation. With the hour drive from the marina to the restaurant, I know time is going to be tight, so I show Cindy to the guest room aboard the minnow, so she can shower and change. Then I head to my personal quarters on the ship. I shower off the salt from my hair and my body and change into a polo shirt and some dress pants. I meet Cindy on the top deck. She's wearing a red and orange sundress that looks like she's wearing a sunset. Her wavy hair is down, instead of pulled back in a ponytail, and I find I like it that way. You look beautiful, I say. My heart races. It almost feels like an understatement. She's the most beautiful woman I've ever met. She smiles and those lips are practically begging me to kiss them again. Thanks, she says. You clean up nicely too. I shrug. I try. She laughs. You don't have to try that hard. The wind whips around us, blowing Cindy's hair in front of her face. And this is why I keep my hair in a ponytail, she says. I think it looks great like this. I tuck her hair behind one of her ears. Thanks, she says, her voice a little breathless. I take her hand, and we settle into the bench on the front of the minnow. My arm is around her, and she lays her head on my shoulder for the rest of the ride back to the marina. Chapter 14 Cindy I'm sorry, sir, but the reservation we have you down for is next week, not today, the man at the restaurant says. There has to be an opening somewhere. I specifically asked for a reservation for today, Alex says to the third person he's explained the mix-up to. The best I can do for you is an inside table available in 180 minutes. It's the same story that the other two people have told us, and they're not budging from this stance, though Alex has tried to get them to make an exception for us. I tug on Alex's arm. I can tell he isn't happy, and I'm trying to defuse the situation. It's not a big deal. We'll come back another time. I have my heart set on Italian, he says. And I made the reservation for today. He's not getting mad, but he's definitely firm in his annoyance. So, let's go have Italian at my place. We'll stop at the market, grab some fresh ingredients. It will be fine. Alex nods, seeming to understand that pestering the guy in charge of reservations isn't getting us anywhere. Okay, let's do that. We pick up all of the ingredients at a local market. I pull out my credit card, but Alex insists on covering it. Are you ready to be wowed by my culinary prowess? He gives me that smile that melts me. I laugh. So prepared. I will absolutely be astonished by your ability to boil water. I can do much more than that, he says. Alex drives us back to my place. I'm not sure what possessed me to invite him over to my house for dinner, except that I didn't want the night to end yet either. I know there were other places we could have gone to eat, but Alex had had his mind on Italian. And I can whip up a delicious spaghetti sauce with a solid kick. We arrive at my house, and as always Alex opens the door for me. 
we carry in the few fresh groceries I didn't have stocked into the kitchen. Alex is already washing his hands, and as he dries them, he asks, what can I do to help? Those six little words have my insides doing cartwheels and front flips. Still I want to cook for him. I'm okay with doing it all. You can sit and enjoy. I quickly fill the pot with water and turn on the stove. He pulls me into a hug, his arms wrapping around my waist. He leans his forehead against mine. Cindy, he says my name so softly that I'm in definite danger of swooning. My knees are weak, but thankfully he's got his arms wrapped around me. I know you're used to doing everything on your own. But you don't have to. I'm willing to help. Let me. His words on their own were enough for me to give in, but as if he feared that it wouldn't do the trick, he leans in and kisses me. Fireworks shoot through my kitchen, and I melt into him, wrapping my arms around his neck. He's not going to take no for an answer and his kiss makes it clear that he wants to help me. He breaks off the kiss before I'm ready to be done, but only long enough to place a few kisses on my jaw before our lips have connected again. I run my fingers through his hair, not wanting this moment to end. In his arms I feel protected and safe. Like everything is right in the world. He pulls me in closer, and I savor the taste of his lips on mine. I lean away only long enough to say, I don't want to burn dinner. You're only boiling water right now, he says with a smirk. And that's all dinner will be if I don't start making it. I'm okay, with that. He leans toward me, covering my lips with his again, and I'm ready to throw out the idea of making food and just order a pizza. We're still kissing when I register that the water is boiling. We both turned to the stove, and I raise my eyebrows at him, wondering if he'll make the decision to turn off the stove and forget dinner. Want me to order pizza instead? He groans. You've been raving about this pasta, he pulls me in one more time, cupping my face and kissing me. This kiss is different than the one on the beach. That one was patient and slow. This one is more heat and pull. More shirty. He pulls away and then kisses me gently on the nose. Let's make dinner, but only if I can help. I hand him the box of farfalle pasta. So far all you've done in the kitchen is distract me. He laughs. I can't promise it will get less distracting. You're impossible, I say, joining in the laughter. I pull out the rest of the ingredients, and despite what Alex says about being a distraction, we're able to chop and dice and make dinner in between the kissing. Each time I pass him in the kitchen he stops me and gives me a kiss first. He sets the table, and soon we're sitting down to dinner at my table. Alex takes a bite of his food, and I wait for his reaction. He closes his eyes. This is seriously the best pasta I've ever had. Ever? Because you went to Italy, so I'm thinking that can't be accurate. He shakes his head. Best pasta I've had in this country then. It was definitely the most fun I've had making this pasta, I say. He takes my hand and brings it to his lips and the skittering feeling is running through me again. I'm always happy to help make dinner if you make it that fun every time, he says, warmth in his gaze as our eyes lock. I laugh. You're hired. You did a great job slicing and dicing. Our conversation ranges from chatting about our day on Catalina to our favorite things. We're past the get-to-know-you questions, and we're solidly in the comfortable stage. Dinner has gone great. Though I'm not sure I expected it to go bad, I am smiling with the giddy smile as I think about our day together. Would you like some cookies? I ask him. I don't think anything can compete with your pasta, he says. I can respect that, but you haven't tasted these cookies, I say. I won't turn down cookies, especially if they are anywhere close to your pasta, he says. He starts to help me clear the table and bring the dishes into the kitchen. I've got this, I say. I know you do, but I'm still helping. I fill the sink and start doing the dishes. Alex grabs a towel and starts drying them as soon as I put them in the drainer. Let's make some cookies, Alex says, giving me a kiss. I put a hand on my hip. Oh no. If you stay in the kitchen while I'm making cookies, we'll be in here all night. He gives me a wolfish grin. That could be fun too. I laugh. 
sometimes he's impossible, and I like that. You go pick a movie. I promise I'll be fast. These cookies aren't difficult to make. Don't cook all the dough. I like some of my cookies raw. Chapter 15 Alex I just had the most amazing day with the most amazing woman. Cindy is smart, fun, and her pasta is second to none. She thinks I had better pasta in Italy but she's mistaken. I've never enjoyed a meal so much. She was so insistent on making the cookies herself, but I'd really rather be in the kitchen again with her. I didn't want to intrude if it was a family recipe or a secret or something, but my mouth is watering at the idea of cookies that could rival her pasta. I wander out into her living room. She sent me to choose a movie, but I'll defer to her. I'm easy with movies or documentaries, and choosing a movie isn't as interesting as looking at all her decor. Like me, she has an affinity for the ocean, and that is reflected in all her photographs. There is a whole bookcase dedicated to books on the ocean, seashells in all shapes and sizes, and several framed photographs of her and her dad. A large conch shell is prominently displayed on her mantle. I look over each piece wondering what the significance of each one of them is to her. Though I know she loves the ocean, seeing it in her decorations really brings it to life. I crouch down to a bottom shelf and smile at the picture of Cindy as a young girl. Her hair is in braids and she is wearing a wetsuit, grinning at the camera with a few of her front teeth missing. This must have been after one of her very first dives. A large starfish leans up against the frame. As I look around there are more starfish than any other shell. There are several glass jars of sand each of them filled with a varying amount of different colored sand. Each are labeled with a small tag. I flip one over and see the words Maluaka Beach, Maui, Hawaii written on the tag. I look at a few more of the tags noting different beaches from all around the world. One of them even says a beach in Australia by the Great Barrier Reef. There's a picture of Cindy with her dad as he's receiving an award. I pick up the picture frame to get a closer look. Her dad is holding up the paper with his name, Patrick Ellison, but the rest of the award is blurry and hard to read. The name sounds familiar, but I can't place it. I hope this is enough raw dough for you, Cindy says, as she brings me an oversized spoon with a huge scoop of cookie dough on it. That's more than enough. Well I wasn't sure, Cindy says. I left you a few more spoonfuls in the bowl, just in case. I see you're hard at work picking a movie. She raises an eyebrow. I was just admiring your decorations, I say, replacing the picture on the shelf. I never knew you were such a fan of the ocean. Oh, you missed that part about me before, did you? She plays along. It's true that I completely hide that part of myself from others. I laugh. Well. I guess I'm one of the lucky ones that gets to know that about you. She points to the picture I'd been holding. That was a great day. Dad was always getting awards, but after that award he was gifted a trip to Maui, without having to do any work while he was there. He still did work, of course, it was like he couldn't help himself, but it was one of my favorite trips with him. You never did tell me how he died. Can I ask what happened? Was it, expected? Cindy shakes her head. She swallows and I can see that the words are hard for her to get out. She glances to the shelf, probably looking at one of the pictures of her dad. Finally, she takes a deep breath. I still find it hard to talk about. It was definitely not expected. He wasn't sick or anything like that. He actually died at sea. There was an oil spill north of the Solomon Islands. Dad was out on the water when the explosion happened. She shudders, her eyebrows drawn together, marking her pain visibly across her face. I'm so sorry. That's awful. I'm not sure what I expected to hear, but such a tragic loss was not at all what I had pictured. She swallows. It was awful. It still is. And royal waves couldn't care less. 
They just go their happy way without any thought about how their actions affected my life and my dad's life. She takes a shallow breath, her voice cracking. I lost everything that day. I feel the shock settle into me at the revelation she's just made about her past. I open and close my mouth several times trying to form the words, but I can't. I finally push out the only two words I can. Royal waves. Cindy sighs. The hand at her side balling up into a fist. They're the negligent company responsible for what happened. She shakes her head. And their business goes on like there was nothing wrong. They didn't just take my dad away from me, they ruined my life and took everything else from me too. I lost everything. We were forced to sell everything because of their actions. Their lack of caring and compassion and the entire situation made it even worse. I can't drive down the street where their building is because the anger that comes automatically from seeing their name is hard to get over. That's heavy. I'm so sorry. I want to take away the pain that Cindy is feeling right now, but her pain is causing me pain as well, and I don't know what to do. I do not know the entirety of the circumstances, and I have to do some digging before I say anything. She waves a hand in the air and plasters on a smile. Wow. Sorry for dumping all of that on you. What a mood killer after such an amazing day. From the other room the kitchen timer goes off. Oh, the cookies. Choose that movie. I'll be right back. She hurries out of the room. I pace the floor. Emotions and thoughts and confusion are running through my mind. I run a hand through my hair, scratching my head hard. I have to think. I have to figure this out. But I can't do that from here. How am I going to tell her? I mutter the words to myself. Cindy comes back in carrying two plates with hot cookies. She stops. Tell me what? Is everything okay? You don't like the cookie dough? I give her a smile and take a bite of the cookie dough. It's really good. Like really, really good. Cindy eyes me warily. It's good to see that your taste buds are still working. But you really should try them cooked too. She hands me a plate. I take a moment to savor one of the cookies. These are quite possibly better than your pasta, which I had my doubts that they could be. She grins. Told you I make good cookies. I absolutely believe you. Now, what was it you wanted to tell me? I cringe. I'd been talking out loud. It's a nervous habit of mine, but sometimes it's the best way for me to process a problem. I panic just a little bit, looking for something that's accurate to cover the truth for the moment. I shake my head trying to get my wits about me before answer. I take a deep breath. Maybe things aren't as bad as they seem right now. Cindy, I'm so sorry. I just remembered that I have something urgent I need to do. I can't believe I forgot about it. I'm so sorry but I think I'm going to have to cut our night short. She tilts her head at me studying me for a moment, then she nods, understanding in her eyes though I want to believe that she is as disappointed as I am by my leaving right now. Rain check on a movie night. The great thing about this dough is that it freezes. I'll save the rest for later, and you can take these cookies to go. It's not a problem. She sets down the plates on the coffee table and wraps the cookies into a napkin before handing them to me. I give her a kiss on the cheek. I will definitely take you up on a rain check for more cookies and a movie night, I say. But as I leave, I wonder whether she will be up for cookies, or anything for that matter. But right now, I can't think about that. I have some digging to do. Chapter 16 Alex I've spent the last five hours at my computer screen and each moment sucks worse than the last. After leaving Cindy's house I knew I had to get to the bottom of everything that happened in the past. I've read over 100 articles about Patrick Ellison, the world-famous marine biologist, who was tragically killed in an oil explosion in the Pacific. 
Then I read specific articles about the event. The oil spill from the cargo ship caused a huge amount of damage. I scroll through pictures of the polluted water, but it's nothing compared to the damage surrounding Patrick's death. I read an article that gives a detailed description on the tragic accident, similar to the previous articles I've read. Ice fills me as I read Cindy's quotes in this article though. Her words in this article are condemning. I feel the same ire coming from the printed quotes as I felt from when she told me the abbreviated version of the story. The lines blur together on the screen as I try unsuccessfully to finish the article. I can't catch my breath. It feels like I've ascended from scuba diving too quickly, and the nitrogen has not been fully expelled from my body. I'm dizzy and so disoriented. This is a rough blow. I have to know what the truth is. I get up and pace my office, needing a break from the blinding screen and the truth in front of me. She's going to hate me. I'm guilty by association, though I had nothing to do with this accident. I feel the weight and the responsibility to make things right. The accusations and the venom that she threw out earlier this evening haunt me. I feel horrible. And it's nothing compared to how she's felt for years. I want to punch something. I pull out my phone and call Jack. When I left the family business to make my own way in the world, I inadvertently ruffled quite a few feathers on my way out. Not everybody understood why. To say it made for awkward family reunions is an understatement. Except for Jack. He and I have stayed close over the years. I can always rely on him when I need something. Dude, it's two in the morning. You better be in jail. Jack's sarcasm comes through his groggy voice loud and clear. No, it's nothing like that. You know I'm no good at fixing a blown tire. So, I seriously hope this has nothing to do with your car. I've learned my lesson on that one. Don't you worry. It's not about my car. But I do need your help. I scrub my hand across my face. I should have waited until morning to call Jack, but I can't shake the stress from all the articles. I have to make progress somehow. Calling Jack seemed like a natural solution. After all, he still works in the family business. He'd be able to get the information I need without arousing too much suspicion. If you're calling at 2 in the morning, I assume you really need something. And I owe you. What do you need? Should I keep guessing? You out of money. I roll my eyes at his last comment. When I left the royal waves, I didn't even take my dividends that I could have cashed out. It rocked a lot of boats, both figuratively and literally, when I left the family business to start my own luxury yacht line. One of the jokes about my leaving was that I would not be able to be on my own for more than a few years without calling to ask for money. But I proved everyone wrong on that point. I won't take a dime from the family business to start my own. I won't owe them anything that they could come back and take from me. I just need information about royal waves, not money. You know I can't give you any of our proprietary information. Besides you signed a non-disclosure agreement when you left anyway. I stare unfocused at my bright laptop screen. Jack. I'm not trying to do anything illegal. I don't even need information about the business. I just have a question about a case from a couple of years back. What information are you looking for? I will see what I can do. He yawns. Thanks, Jack. A marine biologist was killed in the oil spill. That is a rough one. Yeah. I remember it. You were still working here when it happened. I was, but it wasn't my department. I can't recall any of the specifics. I just want the details. I think it's too late for me to try and piece together why you're up this late at night worrying about something in the past. It's just not computing for me. I'm sorry for the late hour I really should have thought about that before I called. There were some accusations thrown around that we did nothing and I want to know if that's the case. 
And I'm not blaming anyone I just want the information. Can you help me get the information that I need? I want to know what the Royal Waves did during that case. Jack sighs. The case you're talking about was a tragic one. But I don't know the specifics off the top of my head. I'll do some digging and see what I can find out. I release a breath, grateful that Jack is on board. Jack will find the answers I need, and I can go from there. It's progress, a step in the right direction. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Even though I don't work for with you guys anymore, I still take a vested interest in what you guys do. And how the company is perceived. I don't want Cindy's accusations to be true, but I have to face the fact that they might have merit to them. I don't hold anything against you, except for interrupting my sleep tonight. I know I give you a hard time for leaving, but I'm really proud of you. I think you've done an exceptional job with your yachts. I ran into a few people just the other day who were raving about your lines and how well thought out they are. They were practically giving me a sales pitch on how much they enjoy sailing because of your company. You've really made an impressive name for yourself. Jack and I are only a couple years apart, and we spent most of our childhood together. Thanks, I say. That means a lot coming from you. You know you're always welcome to take out any of my yachts. I know. It's a generous offer. One of these days I will take one out again. Now go get some sleep. I will. And thanks for being willing to bail me out of jail. Jack laughs. Who says I would have come and bailed you out? I only assumed you needed it, and that I was your one phone call. We both chuckle at the joke that seemed to be at the forefront of our minds when we were teenagers and in college. Jack, if it's possible I'd really like this information as soon you can get it. I'm on a little bit of a tight deadline to get this information. I assumed that was the case based on the fact that you called me so early in the morning. I'll get on it first thing and let you know what I find. Thanks, Jack. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. The next morning, I wake to a familiar ringtone. I quickly pull my phone off the nightstand, knowing that I've slept in but not caring after I was up more than half the night. As I see Cindy's name on my illuminated screen my heart aches a little. I answer the phone trying my best to sound as if I've been awake for longer than 10 seconds. Good morning, Cindy, I say. How are you? I'm good. But I guess a better question is how are you doing? You were upset when you left last night. I was racking my brain trying to figure out if maybe you were offended that I gave you raw eggs in the cookie dough or something. She laughs lightly, but I can hear the nervousness in her voice. I can't explain anything to her yet. I have nothing to go off of and I don't have the information from Jack. I do my best to smile as I say, are you kidding me? Who could be offended by your amazing cookie dough? She laughs lightly, and the sound is a little less heavy than before. That's a relief. You had me worried there for a moment. Are you sure everything is okay between us? We're good. At least I want everything to be good between us, but only time will tell. I try not to dwell on that. I have to get to the bottom of things before we can move forward. I do have a pressing project on my plate today. I'm hoping I will be able to get it done today, but it's a lot of work. I suppose I have been monopolizing your time more than usual lately. Hopefully your boss will forgive me for that. Probably not. He's a real slave driver. She laughs, the tension seeming to wash away from her. Do you need to be rescued? No, not today, unfortunately. I've got some big things that I have to solve. Well, you are a good problem solver so I'm sure you'll have it done in no time. I hope you're right, I say. Though I would normally spend more time talking with her on the phone, I know that it won't work right now. I better get back to work. It's going to be a long day. I'll talk to you later then, she asks. Absolutely. We say goodbye. 
After fixing myself some breakfast, I open my laptop and stare at the screen. The news articles I was reading last night fill every inch of my display. The waves of emotion at seeing the headlines again feel like a tsunami as I dive into more articles about how amazing Patrick Ellison was and how his life was cut short by the Royal Waves, a heartless company. Reading is all I can focus on while I wait for Jack to return my call and give me the information I've been looking for. Chapter 17 Cindy I'm trying not to make a big deal about the way we left things after Alex ate at my house. But something is still off. It's been three days, and I haven't seen him at all. I've barely heard from him. I'm trying not to freak out about that. And I definitely don't want to scare him away. I really, really like Alex. Not seeing him when I was working at his building felt strange. I know he doesn't always work late, but we've gotten into a pattern. And, on nights I work late, he's been there. He also didn't come see me during the Tide Pools tour. Although Dora brushed it off with a simple, sometimes things come up and people get busy, it didn't make me feel better. Life the last three days has been, empty. It sounds a little dramatic, but that's how I feel right now. You're making that face again, Hannah says, as she looks at me across the table. Sorry, I say. We are out to lunch on the pier, and I can't help thinking about the times when I've gone to lunch with Alex at the same spot. Then a host of other memories come unbidden to my mind, walks along the beach, riding bikes, having espresso in his break room, our day on Catalina, and kissing in the kitchen. You didn't break up with him, did you? I shake my head. I don't think so. Hannah laughs at me. I'm pretty sure a girl should know if she's broken up with a guy or not. I shrug. Things are just off between us. And I thought things were going really well. Hannah looks at my half-eaten banana split that's been in front of me for the last 10 minutes and laughs. Things must be going extremely well with an appetite like that. Hannah was the one who had suggested us splitting ice cream because she said she wasn't in the mood for gelato today. I thought that was strange, but I didn't have the energy to think too much about it. Hannah said we were going to split the ice cream, but so far, she has yet to lift her spoon from the table. I swirl my spoon in the melting ice cream, letting the now cold hot fudge drizzle down one of the sides. Maybe he didn't like my pasta after all. Hannah raises both eyebrows. Are you kidding me? Men have proposed to you for your pasta. I give a half smile. He did rave about it. But it's not like he proposed after one bite. You said that he had some things he needed to catch up on. He has a busy job, and he has spent most of his time with you over the last couple of weeks. I'm guessing you have nothing to worry about. I sigh. Maybe you're right, I say before swallowing my cold bite of dessert. Maybe I will just go see him at his office during the day. Do you think that's a good idea? Hannah looks at me skeptically, and I know she wants to say something that I don't want to hear. But she finally nods at me and says, I think that if you have a reason to visit him during the middle of the day that would be fine. Cindy nodded. That's good advice. Hannah is right. I need a really good reason to go in the middle of the day and disturb his workday, especially when he has already made it clear he is busy. Showing up just because I miss him and want to see him is probably not a good enough reason. And the small amount of texting we've done over the last couple of days has felt like an oasis filled with salt water. It doesn't come anywhere close to quenching my desire to see him. I eat a few more bites of ice cream then push the dish away. Enough about me, I say. Tell me about you and Blake. Hannah's eyes widen. Then she shakes her head. There's nothing to tell right now. Let's focus on you and making sure that everything is ready for the gala this weekend. You still need your dress, right? I haven't gone shopping for a new dress yet, but I have a few in my closet that will work just fine. Hannah shakes her head vehemently. Absolutely not. Your dad is being honored, and you are going to look your best. You will be radiant, and we need to go dress shopping. What if things between me and Alex are still strained? I really want him to come with me, but the way we left things makes me think that perhaps he is avoiding me. You need to go talk to him and make sure he's coming, Hannah says. 
but either way you are still going to get a new dress. You are going to look amazing, whether or not he comes with you as your date. I nod. I don't want to be needy, and I don't want to come on too strong. I will go and ask him if he still wants to come with me to the gala, and I will ask him in person so that I can read his body language to know for sure. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. I walk into Alex's building earlier than my normal time to clean. I haven't seen him on the last couple of nights when I've been here, but I'm on a different floor tonight so I came just a little early in hopes of seeing him. I get off the elevator and note that he has somebody in his office with him. My heart pounds as I realize that I shouldn't have arrived unannounced. The small bag of cookies just feels a little bit, awkward now. Why didn't I just send a text message asking if he was still planning on the gala? And for that matter why am I even questioning if he's coming? He hasn't told me that he won't come. I do an about face and head back toward the elevator determined not to ask him after all. If he wants to cancel, he will let me know. But before I get to the elevator, I hear my name. Cindy, Alex says. What are you doing here? He looks happy to see me and my heart takes courage. I am working on another floor tonight, but I, I hold up the bag of cookies. I just thought you might need these, seeing how your boss has been making you work so much. He accepts the offering. You know, I've rarely found cookies that are better than just eating the dough, but with yours, I can't decide which one I like more. Thanks. You're welcome. I lean forward, feeling like I should at least give him a kiss on the cheek, but I pull back at the last minute. I'm at his work. Initiating any kind of affection feels out of place. I chew on my lip for a moment, weighing the words I want to speak. I take the plunge. It's better to know. Also, I just wanted to check and make sure that we are still good for the gala this weekend. I'm still planning on it, that is if you want me to come. His eyes look unsure, as if there is something holding him back. Relief at the fact that he is still coming floods my body. Of course I still want you to come. He nods. I will be there. He looks like he's about to say more, but he doesn't. I better head to the floor I'm working tonight. I'm looking forward to this weekend. Chapter 18 Alex I watch Cindy's retreating back as she heads toward the elevator. I don't have all the information from Jack yet, so saying anything right now feels a little premature. But I know I have to say something soon. I head back to my office and finish the meeting that I'm having with Cade. After he leaves, I call Jack back. I need answers and I can't wait any longer. Hey Jack, I say when he picks up the phone. Have you found anything out yet? I have. I had to do some digging, because it was such an old case. But I think I found what you wanted, a whole file, in fact. What does it say? I hold my breath in anticipation for Jack's next words. I'm not sure where you got your information, but Royal Waves did a lot for the family at the time. Jack doesn't give me specifics over the phone only assures me that everything was taken care of to the best of the company's ability. Clearly there's a disconnect between Jack's information and Cindy's side of the story. Jack's assurances don't satisfy me the way I'd hoped. I think there is an opportunity for us to do more, I say. Before Jack even mentioned that something was done at the beginning, I knew I wanted to offer something else now. A peace offering. Something. If you want any more information you'll need to come in and speak with George. The pit forms in my stomach. I still talk to my grandpa every now and then, but I know that he was really disappointed when I chose not to take the promotion at the Royal Waves, and instead went out on my own. I had hoped that by asking Jack for the information about what the company did that I could avoid detection from my grandpa. Apparently not. I was hoping to keep this under the radar, I say to Jack. A muffled voice comes through the phone. It's a little late for that, my grandpa says from the other end of the line. The only way to get these archived files is to come through me. I wasn't trying to go behind your back, grandpa, I say weakly. Of course you were. Not many people go looking through old files without a specific reason. 
I want to know what people are looking for when they dig into the past. I just wanted some answers. I heard some things and wanted to verify if they were true. Why don't you come into the office, and we can discuss what you want. Grandpa's words feel intimidating. But I muster up courage I don't feel I have. I can meet you anytime. Come tonight. We'll discuss things over dinner. Okay, I'll be there, I say. Jack comes back on the line. George just left. I scrub my hand over my face. Thanks a lot, Jack. I could have used the warning. Sorry. I had to go through him to get the information. I tried to find another way. That's why it took me so long. I sigh out my frustration. It's not Jack's fault I'm in this situation. It's fine. I figured a day of reckoning was on the horizon with him at some point. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Two hours later, I'm ushered into my grandpa's office. The stately and imposing room looks exactly the same as I remember it. The furniture is all done in matching dark mahogany. The executive desk is set up to be intimidating, and it still is. The bookcases are lined with collector's editions of sets that have never been opened. Take a seat, he says, but instead of gesturing to the purposefully uncomfortable chair opposite his desk, he holds out his hand to direct me to the large round table in the corner of the room. The brainstorming table, as Grandpa calls it, can seat ten, but today there are only two place settings on one end of the table. I take a seat and Grandpa joins me. Food is brought into the table in my grandpa's office. This is the latest catch from our last excursion in Alaska. The halibut was hard to reel in, but it was worth it. Next time we go, I'd love for you to be in the party with us. His dark blue eyes look at me with hope. I'd like that. And I mean it. It has been too long since I've seen my grandpa, and if I'm honest with myself, I've missed him. We eat the fish dinner and our conversation is lighter than it's been in a long time. We talk about memories, and he has me laughing at some of the things he remembers about our earlier fishing excursions. Then he asks a lot of questions about my business. He smiles approvingly when I tell him about the successes that I've had. It almost feels out of place, but I don't dwell on it. When we finish dinner, Grandpa pushes his plate away from him. Now on to the real reason why you've come to see me today. He looks directly at me, his eyes never leaving my face. I start with the bare facts. I know I won't be able to lie to my grandpa, and I have no intention to. But I don't want to give him more information than I have to either. You already know I did some digging into the accident that happened. I didn't remember the particulars as it happened just before I left and it wasn't in my department. Jack told me as much. Why the sudden interest? I was told by one of the members of the family that we did nothing as a company, and that didn't seem right. But I had nothing to refute it with. I keep my gaze on my grandpa, not letting my focus wander. Our business will always gain negative press and naysayers. It's one of the casualties of doing business sometimes. But that shouldn't affect you, especially since you no longer work here. Don't let negativity about this company bother you. My grandpa pats my arm in a reassuring, but dismissive, gesture. We have a great PR department that takes care of matters on a regular basis. I'm not worried about something from so many years ago. It doesn't affect your bottom line today. If it was just somebody random or a negative news article, I wouldn't give it much credence. But the information came from Patrick Ellison's daughter. She has first-hand knowledge that we did nothing, as she was the one affected by it. Grandpa takes a steadying breath and closes his eyes for a moment. I have a folder full of information about what we did for that family. They are ungrateful. His tone is icy and dismissive. I blink. I don't know everything, but I know that Cindy is not ungrateful. Something isn't adding up. I don't think that's the case. Grandpa. From what I've heard, they sound like they're really hurting. 
Grandpa shakes his head, then rubs the side of his temples. Nothing we do will ever be good enough. I don't know what's been done in the past and asking for the specifics almost feels like I'm accusing my grandpa of neglect, which I'm not. But Cindy's words about the royal waves ruining her life echoes in my memory. Her face had been sincere, not overly dramatic. But I'm not here to argue with my grandpa about the past. I am only trying to make the future better. It's all I can focus on. But there must be something else we can do to help. We've already helped, and it hasn't made a difference. Grandpa's tone is sharp like a knife. He looks at me and shakes his head. It doesn't matter what I think of this, clearly you have it in your head to do something for his daughter. This must mean a great deal to you. It does. She is someone who is very, special to me, and I want to make sure that she has a positive opinion of the royal waves. And that she still has a positive opinion of me, when she learns about my connection. My advice would be to not get involved with that family at all. That's not possible, I say. Grandpa nods, his mouth a straight line. Very well. Jack said you had an idea for what to do. I will hear your suggestion before I make a decision. I want to sell my stock and give the proceeds to her. There is a gala coming up at the end of this week to honor her father. There is a foundation that is created in his name, and I think it would do a lot for the goodwill and for a positive appearance if the royal waves contributed to the foundation. Grandpa steeples his fingers, his attention on his hands as each digit moves back and forth. Finally, he speaks. If you sell your stock, the gift is from you not from the company. But I still want the Royal Waves to have the credit of it. If it was found out that the Royal Waves took credit for something you gave as a personal gift, the PR from that would be more negative and you'd put us into a very precarious situation. If you want the Royal Waves to take the credit, it will come from the Royal Waves, and not from any stock that you cash out. Don't sell your stocks right now. It might be selfish of me to say so and to tell you what to do with your own stocks, but I like that you are at least connected a little bit with the family business by owning stock in our company. Will the Royal Waves make the donation then? The gala would be the perfect time to present it, and you could come personally to give it to her. She is giving a speech that evening. The Royal Waves will match the donation you have suggested of the value of your stock. You know that that is well over $1 million right now? I know. And that with the money the family has already received for loss and damage and every other grievance that they have asked for, that their total amount from the Royal Waves amounts to a significant portion of money, more than we have ever paid out for any other accident or problem. I don't know all of the details, but obviously $1 million represents a huge sum, and it's not surprising to me that that is the most that has been paid out to an individual before. I understand that, and I'm really grateful for your generosity in this matter. Grandpa leans back in his chair and nods. A small smile appeared on his lips. The royal waves will contribute as you have suggested. Not because I feel that the family deserves it, but because it means so much to you. My grandpa is giving me a peace offering in this deal, and somehow, I sense that this will go toward healing something between us too. I understand that and I am grateful for that. There is one more condition, Grandpa says, watching me closely. I don't hesitate. This is for Cindy. Name it. You will be the one to present the check on behalf of the Royal Waves Company. That was not at all what I expected for my grandpa. But I wanted to come from the Royal Waves. And it will. But this was your idea and your specific request. I assume that you will be going to this gala anyway already, is that right? Yes, I am going. Then it's settled. If you want the money, you will deliver it on behalf of the company. I want to argue a dozen reasons why I am not the person to do this job, but I know it will do no good. Grandpa is being generous, but he will stick to his guns on this one, I can feel it. I will explain all of it to Cindy. You have yourself a deal. Grandpa holds out his hand, and we shake on it. But instead of letting my hand go, 
Grandpa continues to hold it. I may not have liked your decision to leave the company and start your own, but I can respect it. Emotions rises in my throat. That's about as close to an I love you statement as I've received from my grandpa in years. Thanks, grandpa. He nods, then lets my hand go. Don't be a stranger. Chapter 19 Cindy I walk out of the dressing room and twirl around as I model the bright yellow dress that comes to my knees. What do you think about this one? I say to Hannah. I've already asked this question seven other times in the last 30 minutes. Hannah scrutinizes every inch of the dress and then shakes her head. It just doesn't look fancy enough for a gala. Your black cocktail dress is fancier than this. I sigh. Shopping is hard, but dress shopping is even worse. Then maybe I should just wear that dress. I already own it. Hannah rolls her eyes. No. You have worn that to every single fancy function you've gone to in the last 10 years. It's a classic. It can last that long. We are not leaving here until you find a new dress, Hannah says, in her commanding voice. She hands me three other dresses and all but pushes me back toward the dressing room. Try these ones on. I found them while you were changing. I feel like I've tried on every dress in the store, I whine. Hannah smiles. Don't worry. This entire street is full of dress stores. I'm sure one of them is bound to have something that will work. We aren't giving up until you find the perfect dress. Back in the changing room I try on the first dress that Hannah handed me, but it's not very flattering on me. This is one time when it definitely looks better on the hanger. Thankfully Hannah also agrees, and I try on the next dress. This one is only moderately better. Hannah shakes her head. It's not the best in the group. I agree. It still can't rival my black dress. Hannah rolls her eyes. You know I'm putting my foot down on this one. You're going to have a new dress, even if it takes a dozen more stores. I take her words as a threat. Hannah is my girl, but shopping is way more her thing than mine. I go back to the dressing room to try on the last dress. I'm feeling exhausted, and I head out of the dressing room without bothering to look at my reflection in the mirror before I come out to show Hannah. Hannah squeals. We have a winner. This is the dress. It is. I look down at the shimmery blue fabric that turns to an almost iridescent green under the spotlights. Hannah takes my hand and drags me over to the full-length mirror, the one that I've avoided for the last few dresses. Yes. This is definitely the dress. Look at the way it hugs your curves and the way it shimmers when you walk. Don't you think that it's a little much? I mean it's not like I'm going to prom. This is not a prom dress. This is a statement dress to be worn at a gala. And you will look amazing in it when you give your speech. It is really sparkly, I say. Spin around. I do, and the dress flows elegantly around my ankles. Hannah jumps and claps. You will definitely need to snag a few dances with your date. She wiggles her eyebrows at me. I smile at that. Even though things have been a little strange between me and Alex over the last few days, I'm excited that he is my date. And I'm also glad that my stepmom decided that this was not the event for her. I turn over the price tag and almost choke at the price. Please tell me that this price is an April Fool's joke. Can you really put a price on a magical night? I hold out the tag for her to see. Yeah, apparently there is a price. Hannah sighs. Some things are worth the price. I give myself another once over in the mirror. I do look beautiful. This really is the perfect dress, isn't it? Hannah puts her hands on my shoulders. It was made for you. I take a breath, then drop the price tag. Then I do one more little spin in the dress. I feel amazing wearing this dress. It will be okay if I splurge. Okay. This is the dress. Hannah fist pumps the air. Yes. Though we found the dress, Hannah makes sure that I have the perfect jewelry, shoes, and hair accessories to complete the ensemble. 
The earrings are sparkly and in the shape of starfish. And the necklace matches. I get a little emotional as I think about my dad and wearing the starfish jewelry while I give my speech. I hope that I can make it through the speech without becoming a blubbering mess that no one will understand. Hannah gives me a quick hug, as if sensing all of my emotions. I'm sure your dad is proud of you, she says. I want to say something, but the words get stuck in my throat. So I only nod and blink a little more rapidly as I put my selection on the counter and wait for the cashier to ring me up. I try not to gape at the total, and I bravely put my credit card forward to pay for the purchase, when Hannah puts a hand on my shoulder. It's on me, Hannah says. No. It's too much, I protest. But Hannah only shakes her head and hands her card to the cashier. It's my gift to you. Think of it as me playing the role of your fairy godmother. You are going to have the best evening at the gala. Emotion fills my eyes and spills onto my face without my permission. I swallow, and then give Hannah another hug. Thank you. After dress shopping, Hannah and I go out for gelato. She talks to Blake for a few minutes, and things seem to be flirtatious between the two of them again. Hannah is due back at her shop, so I say, goodbye, and finish my gelato on the way to my car. I feel on top of the world with the new purchases, and though I'm a little nervous for my speech, I know this gala is going to be unforgettable. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. The day of the gala has arrived, and I feel like a princess in my new dress. Hannah steps back from me, scrutinizing every inch of my hair and makeup. Well if I didn't know before now, this absolutely settles it. I am a genius. She puts her hands on my shoulders and turns me around toward the mirror so I can inspect the transformation she has created, for the first time. Wow. You really are a genius, I say as I inspect the flawless job she did on my makeup. My hair is curled and partially pulled up. Thank you so much for your help. What would I have done without you? What you would have done is wear your old black dress and put your hair up in a very tight bun. I've saved you from so much already this evening. Now all you have to do is go enjoy like Cinderella at a ball. I would have been happy in my black dress. Until this very moment I didn't think it made a difference. But I can't get over how beautiful this dress is. It's not the dress that's beautiful, it's you, Hannah says with a smile. You are going to have the best time with Alex tonight, and you're going to go and honor your dad at the same time. I wish I could be there to see you give the speech. It kills me that I couldn't find someone to watch the shop tonight. Don't worry about it. I totally know that you would be there if you could. I'd even pay full price for the ticket, she says. You wouldn't need to do that. If I wasn't giving the speech and given free tickets to come tonight, I don't think I would be able to come. The tickets were over $10,000 each. It's great that they are able to raise more money for your dad's foundation that way. But know that I'm cheering for you even if I'm not there. And I expect all of the details when it's over. She smirks and gives me a knowing look. You can read a copy of my speech before I go. You've seen me give speeches before, and you know how nervous I get about them. It'll go about the same as every other speech I've given. Thank goodness antiperspirant is a thing. I give her a wry smile. I am excited to hear about your speech as well, but you know that has nothing to do with the details that I really want. I smile, knowing that she means details about Alex. Though he has been busy this week we have connected a little bit more over texting, and yesterday we even talked on the phone for a little bit. What about you? Any news I should be aware of? I ask Hannah. Hannah's face breaks into a huge grin. Blake is taking me on a late date tonight after we both get off work. It won't be very long since we both work late. But, it's something, right? Sounds like that will be fun, I say. But you need to get back to the store. She nods. I know, but I wanted to help you. I just took a late lunch today. I make a shooing motion with my hands and direct her out of the bathroom. I'm going to be just fine. You've helped a ton. Now get on your way. Are you sure? I can still paint your nails or do any last fixes. There is nothing to fix. Everything looks great. 
Hannah nods and practically skips out of my house. Chapter 20 Cindy I pace back and forth in my living room as I wait for Alex to pick me up for the gala. It will be the first time I've really spent time with him since we ate pasta at my house. A jittery feeling runs to my stomach, and I can't tell if it's because I'm going to be giving a speech or if it's because Alex will be here any moment. I run through my speech, trying to keep my voice from showing my nerves, hoping that my delivery will be smooth enough for the audience to understand. I don't want them to regret choosing me to give the speech, but the jittery feeling doesn't go away. My phone rings, pulling me out of the middle of my run-through. Hoping that it's Alex, I fish through my purse to find my phone and answer it immediately before looking at the screen. Hello? Hello, Cindy. This is Chloe from the gala. I'm calling because I wanted to fill you in on a few last-minute things. Hi Chloe. What's going on? I peer out the window to see if I can see Alex yet, but he's not here. I wanted to let you know that we were given an extra donation to your father's foundation, and we felt that you should know about it ahead of time, to make sure that this is something that you want to receive. An extra donation? That's great. I wonder why she called me, as it sounds like great news. Yes, it is wonderful. The donation is for $1.4 million. I readjust my phone next to my ear, sure that I heard wrong. I'm sorry, I think my reception is bad where I'm at right now. Could you say the number again? It sounded like you said $1.4 million. Chloe laughs lightly on the other end of the line. You heard right. That is the number. I try to process what this means, but my mind is coming up blank. That is amazing. Why wouldn't we want to take it? Chloe clears her throat. I wonder if there are some strings attached or if perhaps someone wants to buy their way onto the board of trustees. But wouldn't $1.4 million be worth that? I'm a little out of the loop for the business side of things, and I wait for Chloe's response. Personally, I believe that the money would do good, and it should be received. But some of the board members have concerns about your reaction to it. Are there strings attached? Something that we wouldn't want to do? I'm going to get straight to the point, because I feel that's important, Chloe says, though it feels like she's still beating around the bush. There are no strings attached to the money, only to how the money is received. The donor has asked specifically that you receive one of those overly large checks at the gala. They'd like to make the donation after you give your speech. Those are the only stipulations? I'm not opposed to oversized checks, even though I mostly associate them with game shows on TV and not in real life. Yes, those are the only stipulations. A lightness fills me. It seems reasonable, doesn't it? We all think so, Chloe says, with a little too much nonchalance in her voice. I'm happy to accept the money. I think it will be an amazing boost to the foundation. And how great to have it so public where everyone will see that donations matter. It could even boost donations made during the gala tonight. That's exactly the conclusion we all came to as well, Chloe says. Oh, I'm so glad you're on board. We were all very nervous that you might not be willing to take the money, but I will call the donor and let them know that we will be delighted to accept the gift as instructed. Truthfully, I'm not very comfortable in front of others, especially when it comes to speaking, but I can handle being on stage and receiving a cardboard check like I've won a game show. This weekend is getting better and better. I feel like I'm floating between my new dress and now this piece of good news. And soon I'll be seeing Alex. How can today get any better? We will see you shortly, Chloe says. She's about to hang up. Chloe, out of curiosity, who is the donor? I will send you a copy of the email that was sent. It will give all the details about the specifics. The Royal Waves will be so happy to hear of your acceptance of this gift. Can't wait to see you at the gala, Chloe says rapidly. Then she hangs up. I collapse into a chair, stunned. I've already agreed to take the money, to accept it personally. To go back now would seem petty, but maybe that's why Chloe called me and said the offer the way she did. She and the other board of trustees members were concerned about the way I would respond, and they weren't wrong. But they seemed to wait until the last possible second to tell me this. 
A bitterness like swallowing ocean water assaults my senses. I can't do this. A numbness takes over my body, wrapping all of the ache, and the pain, and the distress I feel into a welcome nothing. My phone beeps and I automatically reach for it. The notification shows the email from Chloe, likely already drafted before she even called me. I do not have time to collect my thoughts before Alex is at my door. Thankfully autopilot takes over and somehow, I find myself opening the door for him, though I don't remember getting out of my chair or walking toward the door. Alex puts his hand to his heart and smiles at me. Wow. I'm speechless. You look incredible. I swallow, doing my best to smile. Thank you. You look very handsome too. The black tuxedo he is wearing is a tailor-made fit and accentuates his strong physique in all the right ways. What's wrong? Alex's eyes are full of compassion and concern. Are you feeling okay? I nod and take his arm. The last time we were at my house, I told him about my dad. Since then, things have been weird between us. I don't want to spoil this moment now that things are finally feeling a little more normal again. He leads me to his car and opens the passenger door for me. We drive for a few moments in silence. Are you sure you're all right? Alex asks again. I started nod my head again, but then I shake it. Tonight was supposed to be a celebration for me. But it's not anymore. Alex's hands gripped the steering wheel a little bit harder. Is it the speech? I can help if you need. I'll be right by your side. I shake my head. I appreciate the offer. Seeing you in the audience will be great for that moment. I just received some upsetting news right before you showed up. One of the members of the board of trustees just called to let me know that we will be receiving a donation tonight. A donation that I have to personally accept. His profile is an unreadable mask. Isn't that a good thing? A bitter laugh escapes my lips. It sounded great to begin with, but it's not. It's from the company that is responsible for my father's death. After a moment of silence he asks, doesn't that show that they are trying? They can't buy my forgiveness. My dad is still gone. Tonight was supposed to be remembering the happy times. I sigh out a shaky breath, but it does nothing to loosen the growing tension inside of me. Now all I can think about is how this donation represents them being too late to do anything in the situation, when it really would have mattered. A line forms on Alex's forehead. Cindy, I'm so sorry. I'm sure the company doesn't mean to cause you distress. I hold up a hand to him and try to keep my voice steady. I know you're trying to help here, Alex, but please don't defend them right now or prescribe what they are trying to do or not do. You weren't there. They are really good at doing what they need to with their PR firm to show their best face. For them to come here tonight doesn't represent goodwill to me, only a public show to gain business and favor in other people's eyes. I shake my head. I can't think about this right now. I still have to get ready for my speech and feel good about that part of tonight. I can't think about anything else. Alex is silent on the rest of the drive, until we arrive at the venue. He parks on the rounded drive under an awning, where the valet takes his keys from him, and I'm helped out of the car by another valet. As he comes around the car toward me, he says, you're going to be great tonight. I know it. He squeezes my hand, almost as if he can transfer some confidence into me. I take a deep breath and nod. I never would have guessed that tonight I would dread something more than giving my speech. Kind of funny, isn't it? He squeezes my hand one more time, almost pulling me back to the present as we walk toward the double glass doors. Cindy, I'm here for you. No matter how things go today. I squeeze his hand gently. Thank you, Alex. That really means a lot. I can't think of anyone else I'd rather share this moment with. Two doormen stand at either door and open them simultaneously as we arrive. Cindy, there's something I need to tell you. I look into Alex's eyes. There is a mixture of emotions in them, and I can see that there is something bothering him. He seems distressed. Yeah, of course, I say. What's going on? The thing is. Whatever he is about to say is interrupted by two members of the board who rush up to us. 
Cindy, there you are. We've been looking all over for you. You're needed backstage. You're going on soon. I squeeze his hand before I let go. Talk later? He slowly nods his head. Yeah, I'd really like that. Save me a dance? I smile. All of my dances are for you. I am whisked away by the two board of trustees members. One lady gives me instructions backstage, while the other one straps a wireless mic underneath my dress. A platter of food is placed before me on a table. You may want to grab a few bites to eat, before you go on for your speech. There will be two fresh water bottles for you stored on the shelf in the podium. The woman who helped with my mic says, and don't forget that you're wearing a mic. It shouldn't be hot, except when you are speaking and you're on the stage. But just in case, here's how you adjust the volume level, if you don't want to be picked up. Both women chatter back and forth at me, not letting me get a word in edgewise. When one asks for questions the other one just fills in the space with more information. I know all of my blocking, where I enter, where I exit, and where I stand directly after the applause which will follow my speech, I will receive the check. This is so I will only have to be on the stage once. A knot starts to form in my stomach, but I put on a brave face. My hand goes to my throat, feeling for the starfish necklace. Can you make a wish on starfish jewelry? I doubt it works the same as wishing on starfish in the ocean, and right now the only thing I can think to wish for is that this day will be over. Chapter 21 Alex If I didn't know any better, I would think that Cindy is a natural in front of an audience. There are no outward signs that she's nervous or anxious about speaking in front of others. She's engaging, fun, and her love for her dad is evident in the tribute she gives him. I am captured by the way she talks about the foundation with such passion and devotion. Yes, she looks gorgeous up there under the spotlights. The light reflects off her dress in a way that makes her look almost like a mermaid. But it's more than that. She's captured me in a way that makes me want to forget about everything else when she's in the room. I'm definitely falling for her. I have been for a while now. As she concludes her speech, I stand up with the rest of the audience to clap for her. She is all smiles and her eyes find me in the crowd. I want to remember the feeling of this moment, no matter what comes after. She looks at me once more from the stage and mouths the words thank you. I nod in response. The audience takes their seats again as a man comes next to her at the podium. He starts talking about the origination of the foundation and how this entire plan was started. And that's my cue to make a swift exit. One of the members of the board of trustees meets me next to a door that leads backstage. She ushers me into my place, and hands me the large cardboard check that was delivered to the venue earlier today. I'm more nervous for this moment than Cindy was to give her speech. I want to take a moment to collect myself, but the lady behind me gives me a nudge, pushing me toward the stage. And now to present the very generous donation to the Patrick Ellison Marine Biologist Foundation is the Royal Waves founder's grandson representing the company. That's your cue. You're up, she says, as she gives me one final push out the wings and into the spotlight. The Royal Waves Company is dedicated to making a global difference in marine biology. They take a vested interest in keeping our oceans clean and safe so these beautiful natural resources can be enjoyed for generations to come. The Board of Trustees continues on with a bio about the Royal Waves Company, and I try not to cringe. I can see Cindy's body stiffen at the glowing bio about a company that she loathes, and I wish I would have been able to rewrite the bio myself but it was a PR bio that I hadn't seen or heard until this moment. Please give a warm welcome to Alexander Prince from the Royal Waves Company. There is a half-hearted round of applause, and it's only then that Cindy turns toward me on the stage, our eyes meeting for the first time. Cindy's mouth hangs open in shock, her eyes widening as she takes in my presence on the stage. Her shoulders sag as her eyes fall to the cardboard check I'm holding in my hands. When her eyes find mine again, I mouth the words, I'm sorry, just before the other man hands me the microphone. 
I keep my remarks very brief focusing all my energy into saying something that will be helpful for Cindy to hear. The other gentleman on the stage starts the clapping as I hold the check out for Cindy to receive. We both smile at the photographer that is in the audience directly in front of us, taking our picture and blinding us with the incessant flashes of light. The photographer asks for a few more pictures, including one of just Cindy holding the check by herself. They ask us to shake hands, and I feel all of the hesitancy pouring from Cindy as we shake hands in front of a room full of people, who are oblivious to the moment unfolding before their very eyes. I'm sorry, I say out of the corner of my mouth, while still trying to hold a smile. I didn't want to catch you off guard like this. She's smiling, but I know it's only for the benefit of the camera. Her eyes are throwing daggers at me with lightning speed. As we stand a little closer together, so that our shoulders are touching, and we are each holding one side of the check, she whispers, I never want to see you again. The words feel like a physical blow. All the wind has been knocked out of me. After the pictures, she is whisked toward a few of the board of trustees who have now come to join her on the stage, and I am escorted off the stage. I wait outside the door leading to the stage, waiting for Cindy to come out. I want to talk to her privately before we rejoin the gala. I need to explain everything to her. Waiting feels like an eternity, and I check my watch. It's only been three minutes. She'll be here any moment. I pace on the marbled floor, five squares one way, over three squares, back five squares. I repeat this process a few more times. And then the door opens. But Cindy does not come out, only the woman who helped me get on the stage is there. I look past the woman, trying to see back onto the stage, but it's impossible with the wings blocking my view. Is Cindy still back there? The woman goes back through the door, and returns by herself a few moments later. I'm sorry, Mr. Prince, but it looks like she used a different exit. I blink. Where is she? The woman gestures toward the large ballroom entrance. I imagine she's in there mingling right now. I'm sure you'll be able to find her. She's easy to spot. I nod. Thank you for your help. I return to the ballroom, where the dinner tables have already been cleared to the edges of the room. Dancing and mingling are the central activities, and I weave my way through the crowds to find Cindy. But there is no one on the dance floor in a shimmery blue dress. I pull out my phone and send her a quick text as I circle the floor again. I'd like to talk to you. Let me explain, please. I walk in circles around the perimeter of the room, alternating calling her and sending text messages, hoping that I'm explaining things coherently. Finally, I see one of the board of trustee members that I recognize in the sea of faces. Have you seen Cindy Ellison? I ask. He shakes his head. I haven't seen her. After asking a few more people, and not getting any definite answers about where she is, I look for her out in the hallways. On a hunch, I head outside and find a valet. He holds out his hand, ready to accept my ticket so he knows which car to bring me. I'm not sure if I need my car yet, I say. The valet tilts his head and blinks at me, as if unsure what he can help me with without my paper ticket. I'm looking for a woman with blonde hair who had a greenish-blue dress on. Has she come outside in the last little while? The valet nods. I ordered a taxi for her. Can you tell me where she was going? The valet narrows his eyes at me. I show him a picture of the selfie we took earlier in the night. She was my date. I want to make sure she gets home safely. Maybe she took the taxi home, the valet says. It is not my business to pry when people leave here. I only see that the appropriate transportation arrives. I nod, not wanting to continue this discussion, and instead hand the valet my ticket. I don't wait long for my car to pull up. I tip the valet and once I'm past the 10 miles per hour speed limit sign, I floor it. The engine roars to life, and I speed toward Cindy's house. I knock on her front door for five minutes straight. 
It's more than enough time to get someone's attention. If it were me, I'd answer just to stop the incessant knocking. But she doesn't answer, and the house is dark. I sit on the doorstep of her house, hoping she'll arrive soon, but she doesn't. It's like she's disappeared. Chapter 22 Cindy Hannah's door opens before I even knock. I just saw your text. What's going on? Without waiting for me to answer, she pulls me into a hug, then leads me to her couch. She hands me a kiwi lemonade spritzer, light on the ice, with extra fruit lining the glass. I'm sorry for crashing your date, I say, curling up in the blanket. The spritzer is calming. Hannah waves away my apology. Don't even worry about it. Besides, it wasn't much of a date. He only had an hour off of work. Weekends are his busy time, and there were a few employees who called in sick. It's been a problem for Blake the last few months. Every weekend his employees tend to get sick. Thankfully, they're always well enough to come to work on Monday morning. She rolls her eyes. I sniff. The idea of calling in sick right now sounding heavenly. I could use a sick day, or several of them. It sounds like a pattern, not an actual sickness. You've got it. But don't you worry about that. What's going on with you? I thought the gala went until the stroke of midnight. She winks at me. I blow out a breath with ragged force. It was. It does. I just couldn't stay there any longer. Tell me the whole story, she says, taking a seat on the other end of the couch. I sink against comforting pillows with the blanket still around me. I tell her everything that happened from the time she left my house after doing my hair and makeup until the moment I'm at her front door. I tell her about the upsetting phone call from Chloe and the conversation with Alex, the speech, and then receiving the check. It comes out in a bumbling mess of words and tears. I pull a pillow onto my lap and hug it like it's a shield. Hannah listens to everything without interrupting. That's a lot, she finally says, her voice full of empathy. Yeah, I take a tissue from the box that's strategically placed on the table next to me and blow my nose. And you just ran out of the gala? I nod. It was the only thing I could think to do. He doesn't know you left? I nod toward my purse on her table. My phone was blowing up with texts from him. He's probably figured it out. I told him I never wanted to see him again. Hannah's eyes widen. You said that? I thought you didn't talk to him. I whispered it to him while he was handing me the check. I see. She pauses, as if weighing her next words. Which part hurts the most? I blink. It all hurts. Hannah bites her lip. I get that, but can you narrow it down a little more than that? Is it the part about receiving money from the company you've sworn to hate, or? He is part of that company. He lied the whole time. I thought he has his own business, the yachts. He does. So he doesn't work for the Royal Waves then. It's his grandpa's company. His grandpa is different than him, she says lightly. He's guilty by association. Hannah doesn't protest, just nods with understanding. You want to crash here tonight? I nod, not wanting to go home and be alone. That would be great. My phone buzzes from inside my purse. Hannah retrieves it from the side table, holding it out to me. You should at least see what he says. I can't. Go ahead if you want to. But. I shake my head, covering my face with the pillow. I just can't deal with all of it right now. When the phone buzzes again, I say, go ahead and look. I'm not going to. I lift my head for a moment, watching as Hannah scrolls through the messages. He's just making sure that you're safe, since he assumes you left the gala early. You can respond that I am safe, but I still don't want to talk to him. And I don't want him knowing where I am. You've got it. She types on my phone, then hands it to me. I press the send button, and then I promptly turn my phone off. It's definitely staying off for the rest of the night. Asterisk asterisk asterisk.
When I finally turn my phone on to get my messages the next morning, I mute his conversation. The pain from last night still stings. My headache pounds. I take the weekend off work and spend the time with Hannah. We order takeout, watch movies, and Blake brings over large containers of gelato that we demolish way too quickly. On Monday morning, I head to the MEWCS center, my red-rimmed eyes mostly concealed with makeup. I have some news for you, my boss says when I walk in. What is it? I'm hesitant to guess. Thanks to all the promotional work that you took the initiative on, the center is now busier than ever. That's great, I say, hoping that it wasn't because of the donation from Alex. But when I ask about it, my boss just laughs. It has nothing to do with who was at the gala. Look at our social media feed. It's the most responsive posts we've ever had. I beam as I see Tiffany's post about the otters. The pictures are incredible and the engagement is high. People are really interested in making a difference. They are. We've received calls all weekend long and we need to have a few more people handle the volume. I'm so glad that the center is busy. My boss nods. I'm stepping into a meeting right now with some new investors. Could you stop by my office later? I want to talk about your career path and moving up in the company. I will, I say. This is what I've worked for, for a long time. I should be more elated than I am. It's probably the post-weekend gelato withdrawal and sugar crash. I brush it off and give my boss my biggest smile. Thank you so much, that is very kind of you. No, thank you, Cindy. You've definitely made a difference here, she says, before walking off. Chapter 23 Alex I drive by Cindy's house again on Tuesday morning, but the flowers I left on her doorstep are still there and wilting. If they're still there tonight, I'll remove them. I don't need to alert the whole neighborhood that she's not home. I focus on work as best I can, which is hardly at all. I'm counting down the minutes until the workday is over, and not so that I can leave. Tonight is cleaning night, and I need to talk with Cindy. This is not the sort of thing that I want to discuss over a text or a phone call, but all of my messages are being ignored. And if this doesn't work, I may hire a skywriter. The silence is killing me. Not that I blame her but I can't fix it if she won't talk to me. I look toward my briefcase, where I've had my defense prepared since Saturday morning when I made an emergency visit to my grandpa's office. A full day of meetings blur together, and when Cade leaves my office at 6 p.m., he says, you should take a day off and go sailing. You look like you could use a break. I could use, something like that, I say. But the idea of sailing brings me back to time spent with Cindy. I doubt being out on my sailboat will have the effect that Cade wants it to, but I keep that to myself. Cade studies me. I know he wants to ask what is going on but instead he just says, but don't go scuba diving. That's never a good activity when you're distracted. I nod. You're right. I'm sure tomorrow will be better. You want to go grab some food? On any other night, I would have gone, but tonight I really don't want to miss Cindy. I've got some work to finish up here before I leave. Okay. Seriously consider taking tomorrow off. It might do you some good. Kate leaves my office, and I settle into nothing that resembles any kind of productive work. When the low rumble of the vacuum hits my ears, my pulse explodes. I jump from my chair and grab my briefcase. I'm not going to chance Cindy running from me, so I head toward the familiar sound of the vacuum. I turn the corner, and my heart pounds at the sight of the vacuum. Cindy, I'm so sorry. That's all I get out. The brunette woman vacuuming turns toward me, pops out her earbuds, and says, I'm sorry, what did you say? I take a step back. You're not Cindy. She smiles at me. I'm Maria. I blink. It never occurred to me that someone else would be using the vacuum on my floor. Where's Cindy? The woman shrugs. I'm filling in for her. 
I'm not sure for how long. I want to ask more questions, but it's clear Maria isn't going to know the answers. I swallow down my frustration. It's nice to meet you, Maria. I'm Alex. Nice to meet you. If you don't need anything, I'm going to finish vacuuming this area. I'm not sure how Cindy got all of her work done in such a short amount of time, but she holds a record I want to beat. She pops her earbuds back in and turns the vacuum back on again. I'm stuck. Literally stuck. I was planning on Cindy being here tonight. My whole evening was arranged around us working things out. And she's a no-show. I process the small amount of information Maria has given me, but it doesn't seem to give me any good answers. The fact that she doesn't know how long she's filling in for Cindy doesn't give me hope. I head back to my office and pack up. There's no point in me staying late at the office if Cindy isn't going to be here. I call her again, but it immediately goes to voicemail. I know I'm pushing, but I'm not going to let her go, just because she says that she never wants to see me again. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. The next morning I'm not closer to finding Cindy. And I'm running out of ideas. But then, I remember the Tide Pools tour. I head to the beach, hoping that Cindy still leads the tours, since I haven't been able to find her anywhere else. Like clockwork, she's there with her group. I know approaching her right now will make my case worse, so I wait next to the car, folder clutched in my hand. The unforgiving sun beats down on me, making me question why I'd stay in the parking lot on a day like today, rather than join her on the beach. But I can't ruin the space where she gives tours. Chapter 24 Cindy How come your boyfriend didn't come on the tour today? Dora asks. I paced on a smile. I want to protest to Dora that I don't have a boyfriend, but I just don't have the energy to dive deep into the conversation about why things didn't work out between us. I swallow. He has a very busy work schedule, so he couldn't make it today. It's only partially a lie. After all he does have a busy work schedule. Isn't that him over there in the parking lot, leaning against your car? Dora points in the direction of the parking lot. My gaze follows Dora's fingers, and my heart stops. Like a sea lion sunning himself on a rock, Alex is leaning against my car, just as Dora noticed. My mouth is suddenly dry, but I push past my embarrassment and shrug. Maybe he was able to get away early. I try to sound as nonchalant as possible, but inside my head is reeling. Why in the world is he here? Clearly, he has not taken the hint that I don't want to see him ever again. But my eyes betrayed my resolve. Looking at him right now, I take back my words. I do, in fact, want to see him. And I'm taking in the moment and the way he confidently leans up against my driver's side car door, as if he knows I will not be able to leave this time without speaking to him. He's facing away from me, but I can still see most of his profile. You should go talk to him, Dora prods, making a shooing motion toward the parking lot. Why when I was a young person, I didn't wait around to talk to the man that I loved. I took the opportunity. In love. I spit out the words like I've swallowed a mouthful of brackish water. Oh, I wouldn't say it's that. She squints at me and then finally shrugs. Call it whatever you want these days. It's clear that he's waiting for you. Don't keep him waiting too long. She nudges me with her elbow, her voice full of amusement. Great catches don't stay available forever. Someone is bound to drop a net and beat you to it. I want to protest, but I know Dora will continue to say things I don't want to hear if I try to reason with her. So instead, I square my shoulders and walk toward the parking lot. I feel Dora's gaze on me as I make my way toward my car. I know she's expecting something, and I'm not going to create a scene or anything like that. But I'm not sure how to get out of this one without a conversation, and it scares me. That's why I said I didn't want to see him again. It's easier to avoid. It's easier to move on. But he hasn't taken the hint. And though I haven't gotten up the nerve to block his phone number over the past week, I've also ignored all of his messages and sent every phone call to voicemail. What are you doing here? 
I ask, trying to keep my voice from shaking. Dora's gaze is practically burning into my back, and that alone seems to be enough motivation to keep me from blowing up at him, pushing him away from my driver's side door, and driving away. He seems surprised by my cool response, as if he was expecting the fight or the blow up. He blinks and then swallows, the only visible signs that he's nervous to be here. I want to talk to you. You have a lot of nerve, I say, gritting my teeth hard. He holds his hands up in the air in a show of surrender. I have something for you. I know it doesn't change the deception and doesn't undo the past. But I think you should have a look at these. I wasn't trying to catch you off guard at the gala. He gives me a small, sad smile. Believe it or not, I thought I was helping. You thought you were helping? You actually thought that what you did was helping? I shake my head. You had plenty of opportunities to tell me the truth. And you said nothing. I can only say I'm sorry. I found out the night that we ate at your house. Before that I hadn't put the dots together. He holds up his hands again, but this time it's to give me a manila folder. I want you to have this. I know it doesn't make up for the wrongs that you've experienced. And I know I will never be able to solve that. But hopefully you will take a different look at what happened, even if things between us don't work out. Even if? I snatch the folder from him with more force than I realize. That ship has sailed. There is nothing between us, Alex, and nothing in this folder will change that. Please just promise me you'll read it. His hands reach out to touch my arm or hold my hand. I'm not sure which. I move away from him and feel all the raw and painful moments from last weekend rush toward me again. I will not cry in front of him. I'm late for an appointment. I need to go. I don't respond to his plea. I won't promise him anything. I can't. He moves away from the car, and I open my door and get in. He stares at me as I drive away, but I don't look him in the eyes. It's too painful. I should have stuck to my resolve to never see him again. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. I burst into Hannah's shop and wave the folder in the air. I need to talk right now. Several customers look my way, but I ignore their surprised faces. Hannah looks up from her cash register, alarm on her face. What's the matter? He found me by the tide pools, I say, barely holding back the tears. Did you talk to him? Did you work things out? Her voice is both hopeful and annoying. I told you that that ship has already sailed. But maybe you guys can make it work. You're so cute together, and if he is looking for you, he must have something to say to you. She's repeated that sentiment for the multiple days in a row that I was at her house, avoiding seeing Alex. I shake my head. But he handed me all this. What is it? I shake my head again. I have no idea. He just handed it to me and asked that I read it. She glances to the folder and then back to me. Why don't you do that then? Because I have no idea what I'll find, I say. And I don't want it to change my mind. She rolls her eyes at me. And that's why you read it instead of speculating about it. It's awfully thin to be carrying something truly harmful, like rattlesnake eggs or something. Rattlesnake eggs? She shrugs. I mean, I guess there's none, but I could be wrong. Still, it's not very thick, and I would have imagined you might have smashed them with all the waving around you're doing. I just can't do this. I sink into a stool behind the counter at her store and melt onto the countertop. I bury my head in my arms. I'm completely unhinged. What should I do? I have a solution to all of your problems. She eyes me for a moment and when I don't protest, she says, read what's in the folder. I peek at her from under my elbow. What if it's bad news? She blows out a breath. Then I guess you can write Alex off forever. But I have a feeling that he's really not stupid. I doubt whatever is in the folder is bad news. Will you just take a look and let me know? I ask, holding out the folder to her like it's a pile of dirty laundry. She shakes her head. He didn't give the folder to me, Cindy. He gave it to you. 
I know you've had a hard week. And I don't blame you for that. But it's time for you to face the music and start being a big girl again. Open up the folder, read what's in it, and move forward. That's all. I swallow hard. I don't know what I'm afraid of. I think I need to go for a walk. Hannah nods. You do that. And when you're done reading the contents of the folder, come back and we'll go for ice cream. Again. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. I walk along the beach until I find a rock that's tucked into some of the cliffs. The sound of the ocean is both calming and agitating at the same time. I look around but no one is paying any attention to me. I kick my shoes off and dig my feet into the sand until I hit the cool sand layer that is damp. I take a deep breath of the salty ocean air and watch the surf roll in and out with a melodic cacophony. With the waves roaring as my soundtrack to this tumultuous moment, I open the folder and begin reading. From the first words on the page, my heartstrings are pulled, and my emotions refuse to stay in check. There is detailed information about my father's death, information that I did not know about before. I have all the dates, all of the checks, and even copies of the Coast Guard warnings that my dad was given to not go out that day. I also see his reply to those warnings, saying that he will be fine, and he knows what he's doing. I shake my head, and my tears create new pathways from my eyes down my cheeks. I continue reading, and see multiple invoices and receipts of payment from the Royal Waves Company to the family of Patrick Ellison. I also see several photocopies of handwritten cards with genuine condolences and heartfelt messages from people who obviously knew my dad more than just a casual acquaintance. I read a few more of the photocopied cards, and then just flipped through the rest, letting the sentiments blur together. If I was under the impression that the notes were what Alex had wanted me to see, I change my mind entirely when I get to the next section of the folder. It's statements that look like payments. It takes me a while to discern what I'm looking at but when I figure it out, I almost drop the entire folder onto the sand. I flip through a dozen sheets of paper and with each one I come to the same conclusion. What I've known all along is wrong. I glance through a few more sheets at the back, but nothing sinks in. I storm up the beach, carrying my sandals in one hand, and the manila folder in the other. I need more answers than this folder will supply. And maybe that was Alex's whole point. There's a fire under me, and I know exactly where I need to go next. Chapter 25 Cindy I stomp hard on each step as I make my way to the door. There is no need to knock. I know the door is unlocked. I turn the handle and walk in. I refrain from slamming the door behind me. I'm not taking my anger out on the house. I'm saving that anger for the owner. Sergey comes around the corner, eyes wide. Cindy? I didn't know we were expecting you today. I can make lunch up right away for you. Don't bother, I say, hardness punctuating my voice. I just need five minutes with Vicky. Of course. Did she know you were coming? She's getting her massage right now. Sergey looks confused, and I don't blame him. I know my way to her spa room. Sergey runs to get in front of me. You know she doesn't appreciate being disturbed. I'm happy to let her know you are here and then. I give Sergey a tight smile. I won't be here long. I move toward the door and open the room to her private spa before Sergey can stop me. You lied to me, I blurt out the moment I get into the room. Hot anger boils in my veins, and I could punch something. You're interrupting my relaxation day. Come back next month. Vicky keeps her head down in the headrest on the massage table, not bothering to look up. Something inside me snaps. No. I'm not leaving until you confess to what you've done. Vicky looks up at that, her neck craning so she can see me. The dark look she gives me is anything but motherly. Finally, she says, Franz, leave us. I'll ring the bell when I'm ready for you. Don't go far. This won't take long. Her look is one of bored unconcern as she moves off the table into her plush massage chair. For a moment, with her bathrobe on, she looks like she's sitting in a throne. Now what is this about? You lied to me. She looks at her nails. You already said that. 
Repeating oneself is such a bad habit. You told me that the royal waves never did anything when dad died. You said that they turned us out and that we had to sell everything to cover the litigation costs. You said that they pressed charges, and that's why my entire inheritance was used to solve that. But you lied. Vicky's eyes widen before she squirms in her chair, then she leans her head back, a slow smile curling her lips. What is this tirade really about? You have no proof of this. These accusations in addition to entering my residence without permission is enough for me to open a case about you. Her threat rolls away from me. Like trying to splash someone who's underwater, her words have no effect on me. And ironically, I gain confidence from her threat. She wouldn't threaten if she wasn't scared. Which means I'm on the right track. I have a whole folder full of proof, directly from the Royal Waves Company. I wave the folder in the air. Her eyes dart around the room. They're liars. They always have been. They're trying to sabotage us again. I open the folder. According to them, I've received more than half a million dollars personally. And my signature appears on the receipt. If my eyes had laser power, they'd be melting my target right now. Here's the funny thing about this. I somehow don't remember signing this document or cashing a check for this amount. But this is proof that I did. I narrow my eyes. Clearly they forged paperwork to make you think a particular way. Her hand goes to her throat, and I can see the fear in her eyes. I take a step closer to her. Oh, it's clear someone forged paperwork. But I highly doubt it was the royal waves. After all, the signature can convincingly pass as mine. So, unless they knew me, I doubt they'd be able to forge my signature so well. And then there are several other copies of emails attached to lesser payments afterward. Payments that also went to me when I was studying at college. I demand an explanation. She straightens and shrugs. I don't know what you want to know. You've guessed something in your head. Yes, but I want to hear you fill in the pieces. Why did you forge my name? Why did you take my money? And why did you let me think that all this time the royal waves didn't care at all about me? About us. We sold everything. I parted with my mom's wedding dress. And my dad's underwater camera. All because I thought we were destitute. I hold up the folder again, raising my voice for emphasis. And all this time, it was a lie. Vicky stands. It was time that we got rid of all the junk that was lying around my house, taking up space. Your dad's death was the perfect time to do that. I blink. Excuse me? You heard me. It was boxes of junk, and it needed to go. They were my keepsakes. It was something of theirs that I wanted to keep. Well we clearly don't always get what we want, do we? I was done playing second fiddle to you. You always had your dad's attention and affection. And what did I get? The leftovers. She shakes her head. No. I was done with that. I open my mouth to say something, but no words come out. And I'm officially done with you, Vicky says, filling in the silence that I didn't break. She presses a button on the wall. Sergey, please come and escort Cindy Ellison from the property. She is no longer welcome here. Franz, come back. I have some extra knots that need working out. She turns to me. You're excused. What happened to the money? I ask. Her laugh is unnaturally high. Why I spent it, of course. It was only fair that I get some compensation for having put up with you for so many years. Her dagger hits me hard. I want to ignore it. But the twelve-year-old me that had been so excited to have a mother again in my life cracks. I've wanted her approval, her love, and her acceptance for over a decade and a half, but now it's clear that my dreams and wishes on that front are irreplaceably broken. All I've ever wanted was to make you happy. My voice feels small. Being compensated with money was as much happiness as I could ever get from a brat like you. Your father couldn't provide very well when he was alive, but I was certainly better off without him thanks to the payout I received. It's the final blow. 
don't talk about my dad that way. I slap her, leaving a red mark on her cheek and leave the room. She'll be hearing from my lawyer to recover everything she's stolen from me, but unlike her, I won't be making those threats aloud. Sergei seems reluctant to show me out of the house. I will miss you, Miss Ellison. You are always a bright spot. I will never come back here, Sergei. But if you ever get tired of working for that woman, look me up. I'm sure I could help you find another position. Thank you, Miss Ellison. That is most kind of you to say. I fish out a business card with my phone number on it. I mean it. I know that there are better places to work. Your choice, but I'm happy to help. He pockets the card and gives me a swift hug. Take care of yourself. I'm no longer weighed down by the weight Vicky has caused in my life, and though I'm not sure what that looks like in the future, I'm unafraid. You know, Sergey. I think for the first time, I am going to take care of myself, and focus on that, instead of trying to make sure that everyone else around me is happy. That's the spirit, miss, he says. I drive back to the beach and have a long conversation with the ocean about my dad. I stay close to the pier until the sun sets. Somehow the ocean seems to understand, washing up on the shore, and smoothing out all of my problems with it as the waves crash back and forth on the lonely sand. As the cool breeze continues to come in from the ocean, I shiver. I've had enough time by the water. I head up the beach toward my car. The illuminated gelato shop sign catches my eye in the darkness. Hannah is sitting alone at a table, eyeing the very cute gelato guy from the corner of her eye. Something awakens inside of me, and I know exactly what I need to do next. Chapter 26 Alex the sound of the vacuum fills the silent office space, and my heart hurts with a longing that I can't control. Crap, I say. I was going to leave work earlier so I could avoid the sound. I will never be able to use a vacuum again. Next week, I'm going to set an alarm on my phone and follow through with leaving at the end of the workday. If I have to bring work home, so be it. It would be less distracting than the gentle hum that used to be the perfect bass to Cindy's Broadway musical dance hour during her office cleaning. I scrape my hands over my face. I can't keep doing this. I can't keep going over things. I need to leave, and I'll take the back stairs. I'm not trying to avoid Maria, but seeing the vacuum held by anyone beside Cindy. I can't do it. It's like swimming in the ocean with a cut. The salt is unforgiving, and if you're not careful, open wounds attract the sharks. And these mental sharks are making everything painful. I can't fix the past. I can't fix the present. I can't even think about the future. I'm stuck. I put my laptop in my bag, and pop in my earbuds. I turn on some music hoping it will drown out the incessant sound of the vacuum. It just hurts too much. I see the cord down a different hallway, blocking my use of the stairs, so I head around the other side to use the elevator. I turn the corner and stop dead in my tracks when I see the vacuum, and the beautiful woman who's operating it. Cindy turns off the vacuum, and I pop out my earbuds. My heart is racing like I've run a marathon. Cindy. Hi. I was. I thought Maria was cleaning. I told Maria I needed the hours tonight. I was hoping I would run into you. I lift my eyebrows. You didn't quite run into me this time. Her features smooth, softening at the joke I made. I'm sorry, Alex. I'm so sorry for a lot of things, she begins. I'm sorry I took my grief and anger out on you. That wasn't fair, and it wasn't your fault. She bites her lip. And deep down, I know it wasn't your family's fault either. But it was a shock at the gala. I was caught completely off guard. I feel like I can finally breathe for the first time in a week. When she takes a small step forward, that is all the encouragement I need to pull her toward me. I wrap my arms around her, giving her a slow and tender kiss. Holding her in my arms again erases the time and the pain of being apart. 
I loosen my hold on her just enough to lock eyes with her. You read the paperwork. She nods. I had no idea about the way your family, the way your family's company took care of things. I didn't know, and I just assumed I knew everything about the circumstance. I'm sorry. I didn't know. She rests her head against my forehead. I pull her in a little closer. I'm sorry I couldn't explain it in person. I wanted to, but I couldn't. She shakes her head, wrapping her arms around my neck. I didn't let you explain it in person, and I'm sorry for that too. I wish I would have. About what I said about never seeing you again. My heart pounds. This is the moment of truth. The moment that will make or break all other future moments on this subject. Yes. I take it back. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? She asks, her lips crush against the side of my neck as she speaks. I forgive you, I say. I pull back from her far enough that I can look into her eyes before I kiss her. She wraps her arms around my neck, holding me tighter. I tried to tell you. I didn't know how. It was. She shakes her head. It doesn't matter anymore. I finally feel like I have the pieces to the past that I can move on and focus on the future. I like the sound of the future, I say. Especially if you're in mine. She lifts up on her toes and kisses me, holding me with a fierceness that seems to make up for the last week of turmoil. I can't imagine anything better. And I don't need a starfish to wish for it, after all. Epilogue, six months later. Cindy. Alex and I surface from our second dive of the day. Wow. Just wow. That was amazing. I don't have all the words I want. Alex grins at me, love shining in his eyes as he pulls off his mask. You took the words right out of my mouth. He pulls me close to him and kisses me gently. The Great Barrier Reef has exceeded every expectation I've ever had. It's better than all the documentaries I've seen on it, and better than all the stories that my dad told about it. Of course, it might have something to do with the fact that I'm with Alex, and we're on our honeymoon. We just saw a row of starfish all together. It felt like a sign that all of those starfish wishes are coming true, that the future is lining up exactly how it needs to. We climb back into the boat, and Alex wraps a towel around me. After we dry off, I grab two bottles of water for us from the cooler, then sit next to Alex on the bench. Our chartered vessel takes us to a new spot, and I enjoy the view of the land and the ocean in one beautiful panorama with Alex's strong arms wrapped around me. I rest my head against his broad shoulder, perfectly content with the wind whipping past us as we enjoy this time together. I saw a few more starfish down there, Alex whispers in my ear. What did you wish for? I tilt my chin so I can see his gorgeous blue eyes. Tingles spread through me as I see the love he has for me when he looks at me like that. I give him a quick, salty kiss before looking him straight in the eyes. You know, it's funny. I just enjoyed seeing the starfish. You didn't wish for anything, he asks. I shrug. What else do I wish for when all my dreams have already come true? He pulls me in closer and kisses me. It's a sweet, tender kiss, and I melt at his touch. My thoughts exactly. The end. Thank you for listening. This has been Just the Maid. A Just Me in Love Romance. By Chelsea Hale. Copyright 2023 by Chelsea Hale. Production Copyright 2023 by Chelsea Hale. All rights reserved. Please consider leaving a review for Just the Maid on Goodreads, BookBub, and Amazon. For more information on Chelsea's books and to receive a free book, please join her newsletter.